And um, we're really looking forward to two excellent conference days here at the Langenbeck Virchow House, but also at the Museum für Naturkunde. Um, so we are really, really happy that some of you made it here. We know it's really early. It's <laughs> before breakfast time, basically. Um, so we hope you all had some coffee and are now um, loaded with coffee and uh, open to listen to many excellent sessions and presentations uh, over the next few hours. So I would like to guide you through the program and um, give you some hints as to where to move, how to move, and who to ask if you have lost your way. So as you have, might have noticed, the Langenbeck Virchow House looks small from the outside, but it is rather large inside. So in this conference venue, there are plenty, plenty, plenty of workshop rooms and um, smaller rooms that are used also by different organizations as their offices. So we tried to make use of as many opportunities to guide you through the building here. If you are lost at any time, please come and approach the people that have on their name tag the conference, uh, or conference team, I think it says, or it says XR at MFN. So please come and talk to us if you are lost in the building. So this building here has four different rooms that will host sessions. So we have the Audi Max here, which is the largest room. Obviously, it fits 500 people. And this room here has microphones on every second place. The microphones can be used by you later on to ask questions and make yourself heard. To do so, please raise your arm and then people or the chair, the moderator can um, take your question and then you may use the microphone but by, and I look at the technical stuff again, by pushing twice. Once. Once. Okay. Switch on and switch off. It's, I think it says it in German. Um, you might try it now, <laughs> see if it's uh, um, on red. Yes, there you go. So if it's red, um, the microphone is working and uh, you can be heard. So, only on the down floor here, there are microphones to be used. On the balcony, which you can approach via the third floor, there are no microphones and we decided to leave this for you as a kind of sitting area or, you know, working area because there are no really, let's say, chill out areas at the Langenbeck Virchow House for you available. So you may sit upstairs there, but you are not able to ask any questions or to actively participate in the discussion. So whoever's sitting up there, we think you're just working calmly or listening, um, but uh, you're not interested in asking questions. So anybody down here, uh, you're welcome to participate. So this is the largest room, the Audi Max, and um, it's on the first floor. On the second floor, we have the Virchow um, room, which can be approached via a glass door. It's also a bit hidden, so look out for the signs. And um, on this room also, we have the Langenbeck uh, room that should be easy to see because you just need to go through a glass door. In the Langenbeck room, there will be other oral sessions. In the Virchow room, there will be interactive sessions. And then we also have another room, the beer room, that actually is beer in German, so I wonder why it's called that name. It is actually the most spectacular room in this building because you have a clear view over the whole city, actually seeing um, the Bundestag, so the parliamentary building, and um, a whole clear view over the whole city, and it has a really nice balcony for you to enjoy the view. However, the beer room, room is on the fifth floor, so it's rather tricky to get there uh, by using the stairs. So we recommend everybody, and actually the venue also ask us to give this recommendation to you, to use the elevator to do so. So there's an elevator in, uh, well, right up there. It's, uh, I think it's easy to find. So anybody who wants to um, go to an interactive session or enjoy the view uh, in a coffee break or at lunchtime, please use the elevator to get to the fifth floor. One other small note regarding the beer room is um, that it is on the premise of the um, Axclesius Academy, and there's another conference room that is currently used. We try to um, put up signs so you can find the beer room, but there's also a buffet up there and catering that you have to pass because it's not our catering. <laughs> so this might be tricky. So please, anybody who wants something to drink or food, 
our catering is to be found downstairs where you now also had, uh, or I hope you had some coffee. So catering for us is only on the uh, ground floor um, and uh, for you available at any time, not the catering on the fifth floor. So peeking on my little notes. Okay, toilets are to be found on every room. Um, I think the signs uh, are, uh, are available uh, everywhere, but if you don't find the toilets, please don't hesitate uh, to approach us and ask us. Um, yeah, I think so far from Logistic for the langbeck Virchow House, as you might have noticed on the program, but also in the information emails that we wrote out, we have one more room which is to be found at the MFN, so we had the welcome reception yesterday. It's um, our very nice event room or event hall. However, it is also hidden a bit in the MFN and you also have to pass our security at the um, entrance uh, for employees. So the security, some of you might have noticed yesterday, they are really typical Berliners, so they might not always be too friendly. Please don't take it personal, that's the way Bol Berliners communicate. So what we arranged for you is um, a walk and talk. So there will be always one person from EXA and one person from the MFN meeting you down at the foyer at the meeting point. It's like a big cloud and it says meeting point who will take you over um, to the MFN and guide you through the portal um, up to the um, event hall at the MFN. Um, we hope that some people take up this journey. It's just an eight minute walk. Um, it's really worth it because we also have excellent sessions and we hope that the people giving their talks at the museum won't be sitting there with just two people um, listening to them. So please also make use of this room. And I think that's most of it for logistics. Um, apart from that, I hope everybody um, arrived, uh, uh, had a good journey to Berlin um, and also at the registration indicated whether you are all planning to go on the excursions because the excursions were fully booked. And um, if there are still three places, uh, we would be really happy to distribute them among the people that are on the waiting list. And the same um, holds true for um, the social evening, whoever has a ticket, you know, a spare ticket to be sold, please come to the registration desk and indicate so. And my last note is tonight we're going to have a pub quiz organized uh, by Daniel Dörler um, from the Austrian Citizen Science Network and Julia Lorenz from the museum. And we invite everybody to join. The MFN team is all prepped. We practice for weeks. Uh, so we hope we know all the important things that are going to be asked. We don't know the questions yet. Um, we tried to bribe Julia, but she was really firm. Um, so please come and register the registrations and we, you will be told where to show up and uh, where to register your team. So I hope many of you are joining tonight. And with this, I'm going to check the time, how we're doing. So excellent. Um, so three minutes to nine, and at nine we're going to start our plenary lecture. So we're really happy, let's see, uh, to have, um, have been able to um, get a really, really nice plenary lecture by Sabine Garbisch, who is actually a professor here at Charité, but she also holds a professorship at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Research. Um, her professorship is actually uh, named Planetary Health, so all her research focuses around the theme of planetary health, which is also the theme of our conference. And we think there are many, many, many synergies citizen science and planetary health can find, and this conference is also one way um, that the museum and EXA is trying to get together these two different communities and work together for planetary health uh, on the only planet that we have, planet Earth. Unfortunately, uh, as you all know, we still uh, are in a pandemic and um, sickness-related absences are still prevalent also at the conference. This also holds true for some sessions, so some people were not able to come um, due to personal reasons and sent videos. So please be kind if you are just going to expect a video. And also here, Sabine was not able to come today uh, personally because she is on sick leave. We're really sorry about that and wish her all the best. Um, but she provided us with a really nice video uh, that we're going to um, play for you in a minute. And she will be joining us um, for the Q&A, so she, we will be able to ask her questions uh, in a short five-minute Q&A that she uh, kindly took the time, although she's on sick leave. 
So with this, I'm really, really happy to open the conference with an excellent uh, talk on planetary health with one um, of the very renowned specialists uh, on this topic, uh, Sabine Garbisch, and um, I kindly ask the video to be played now. Thank you. perspective on the climate crisis. We start with a cartoon. This is planet Earth seeing the doctor. Oh dear, this does not look good. You have sustained severe forest burns and are running a fever from an excess of greenhouse gases. This seems an advanced, uh, a case of advanced stage homo sapiens infection or infestation. And then the joke continues, but don't worry, that will pass. And we will take a medical history and examine the patient. We will make a diagnosis and discuss the prognosis. And then we'll talk about therapy options together. So broadly speaking, planetary health is about the health of humans and planet Earth. It builds on other similar concepts, including eco-health, one health and conservation medicine and wants to integrate these. The concept also builds on public health, international and global health, and goes beyond these by not only considering social, economic and political conditions and cross-border determinants needing global cooperation, but also explicitly the natural systems of the planet, a very broad concept of health. In 2014, a very clear and visionary manifesto was published in the medical journal The Lancet, titled From Public to Planetary Health. Well worth reading, it's just one page. It's a call to action, actually, for a new social movement. One year later, a comprehensive scientific report on planetary health was published by a joint commission of the Rockefeller Foundation and The Lancet. The Planetary Health Alliance was founded based at Harvard and the scientific journal The Lancet Planetary House was launched a little bit later. So phrased in a slightly anthropocentric way, planetary health deals with the foundations of human health and with the relationships between these. This includes political, economic and social factors that influence health, but also the natural systems of our planet on which the existence of human civilization depends. And the Methodological approach is transdisciplinary. What does that mean? Um, different disciplines, including health sciences, social sciences, natural sciences, but also humanities, as well as local communities, join their perspectives, because only then can we understand the big picture or the elephant. The Lancet Commission identified three key challenges of planetary health. Imagination challenge means rethinking the relationship between humans and nature or the planet. So what is progress really and questions like that. I get some sound from Story Catchers 2 in now. If you want to mute that, I'm not sure if that makes sense. Then the, after the imagination challenge, there's the knowledge challenge. Thank you. There was a lot of echo. Thanks. Okay, so um, the knowledge challenge, including the health consequences of global environmental changes. So how, how do these sort of backfire on human health? And then the implementation challenge, developing, implementing, and evaluating solutions, strategies for a more sustainable way of living. So how do we get from knowledge to action? I'll get back to these. Um, actually, the Gaia theory from the 1970s is also very rela related to planetary health. It says that the Earth as a whole is like a living organism, a superorganism with self-regulatory features and so-called emerging properties. Like similar to a beehive, which can keep temperature constant within a certain range, although the individual bees as insects cannot regulate their body temperature. This means we humans are one part of a bigger entity, our living planet Earth. Now on to the medical history. What symptoms does the patient have? So one is climate change. The Earth has a fever. It is getting warmer and the weather is more variable and less predictable with more extreme events. For example, more heat and drought leading to fires, 
but also more heavy rains and floods. And with rising temperatures, polar ice glaciers and permafrost are melting. Here, the fever curve with colored stripes. Blue is colder and red is warmer than average since 1850. No statistical knowledge is required to see the clear increase in temperature, especially in recent years. So far, globally, about 1.1 degrees. And this graph shows the most important greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, or CO2, over the last 300 years. Before industrialization, the concentration was about 280 ppm, and now it's above 410. This is over the last 10,000 years, the Holocene, a very stable period, and here we can see a spike. And this is the last 800,000 years over ice ages and interglacials, and here's the current rise, which is a difference similar to an ice age. Temp like CO2 concentrations that humans have never experienced before. Moving to the second symptom, pollution of air, water and soils with waste products and toxic chemicals. The air is polluted from burning fossil fuels and from forest fires. A huge number of new chemicals have been released into ecosystems, including pesticides and fertilizer from agriculture and ever more plastic waste. Here's some impressions. This is a photo from the film Midway. Even on this remote Pacific island, the albatross chicks die because their stomachs are full of plastic. Third symptom is a massive loss of biodiversity. Natural ecosystems are degraded and lost to agriculture and urbanization. Populations of wild animals are shrinking and species go extinct at an alarming rate. Here are some pictures from the Earth's surface, natural landscapes being replaced. And species extinction affects big mammals such as rhinos and apes, but also amphibians and insects as well as plants. Biodiversity is also lost underwater. The warming leads to bleaching and dying of corals, and the species-rich coral reefs disappear. By now, 90% of the biomass of mammals on this planet now are humans and their domesticated animals. The human ecological footprint increased because firstly, human population increased, and secondly, per capita consumption increased. And this multiplies, shown here as an area, from 1900 to 1950, and then a huge increase to 2010. This is called the Great Acceleration. The human influence on the planet is now so large, so global, that geologists have suggested we are in a new geological era following the Holocene, the Anthropocene, the age of humans. Some have suggested to rather call it capitalocene, as it's not humans in itself, but our economic system. So how are humans themselves doing? With rising prosperity, we saw huge health improvements for billions of people over the last decades. Child mortality dropped dramatically and life expectancy increased. Fertility halved over the last 50 years to two and a half children per woman globally, which means population growth is slowing down. However, 1 billion people still live in extreme poverty. Over 800 million people do not have enough food. Over 5 million children die every year from diseases that are preventable or curable, such as birth complications, undernutrition, and infections. At the same time, obesity increased tremendously, with now 2 billion people overweight or obese. And as a consequence, chronic diseases like diabetes and cardiovascular diseases are on the rise worldwide. In addition, pandemics are a major threat to human health, including influenza, HIV, AIDS, and now COVID. So now moving to diagnosis and prognosis. The concept of the planetary boundaries can be useful here. Scientists have defined measurable indicators and thresholds for different subsystems of the planet. 
but similar to diagnostic parameters in medicine, which show in how far body functions are within the normal range. Of these planetary boundaries, we've already transgressed some, such as biodiversity, and we're close for others. It is important to realize that many things are not linear, not in the body and not in nature. First, the system buffers for a while until reaching a limit when it suddenly changes or collapses. And sometimes, like in a domino, the next system also collapses. For biodiversity and for the climate system, several tipping elements and positive feedback loops exist. One example, the Greenland ice sheet melts as it gets warmer, and then the thinner it gets, the warmer the air around it at the lower altitude, and then it melts even more, and from some point it will melt down completely, which leads to 7 meter sea level rise. Which brings us to the prognosis, what are the likely consequences? So at 1.5 degree of global warming, impacts are severe, but with some effort and a bit of good luck, we may be able to still handle them. At 2 degrees, the chances are already much worse. 3 degrees, 4 degrees and more would just be a nightmare. Which is why the global community has agreed in Paris to stay well below 2 degrees of global warming, ideally 1.5 degrees. Now, if all the concrete action commitments of all countries so far would be fulfilled, including the new ones that were made at the recent meeting in Glasgow, where would we end up? People have calculated that it's still about 2.4 degrees. So while the Paris Agreement is there, commitments are still insufficient to meet its goals. So what does that mean? The Earth has seen mass extinctions before, the last one with the dinosaurs, the planet will survive. It's about the animals that live now, the corals and bees and chimps and the plants and fungi. And it's about us humans, our survival and well-being, our civilization, peace and freedom with now 7.9 billion people, many in coastal areas who all want to eat and drink every day. We basically harm ourselves and our children and all generations to come. If we destabilize the Earth system, how does this backfire on our own health, on direct and more indirect pathways? Here it's important to realize that the consequences of global environmental changes on health are filtered by social dynamics, these mediating factors. Ideally, to the better, for example, through successful adaptation measures, but could also be to the worse, for example, through conflicts over scarce resources. Direct health effects can be caused by extreme events such as floods, storms, heat and fire. Heat waves are killing people here in Europe every year, and for already hot regions like South Asia, it's even worse. Indirect health effects can be mediated through changes in ecosystems. This includes increased transmission of infectious diseases. When, for example, mosquitoes move to new areas such as malaria into African highlands. It also includes undernutrition and famines when harvests fail due to droughts or floods. But also increases in allergies as there are more pollen in the air during longer periods with the warming. Um, then the health effects that are mediated by social dynamics are more difficult to quantify, but potentially enormous. This includes increases in poverty, political destabilization, and violent conflicts over scarce resources. Migration and displacement because of that, or due to sea level rise, with many negative health impacts, including on mental health. Here you see the around, actually I should now make it eight, the around 7 billion people globally, 1 billion very poor and 1 billion very rich and the rest somewhere in the middle. The increase on human well-being and health along this development path has been at the expense of hugely increasing our ecological footprint on the planet. Um, the use of our natural resources is now exhausting the planet's buffer capacities. Oh. And with some delay, 
this is now backfiring via global environmental changes, climate change, biodiversity loss, etc., threatening our own livelihoods and our health. And the largest burden is among vulnerable groups as they have little margin to buffer any shocks, which is highly unfair as they hardly contributed to the problem. And eventually all will suffer. The, the floods this summer in Germany and Belgium are a first taste of that fact. So the situation is serious. If we don't act, it is life-threatening, a planetary emergency. How does a good doctor communicate a serious diagnosis? Well, by telling the full truth, explaining, listening, accepting the emotions, denial, desperation, that priorities in life completely change and help the patient accept this and jointly discuss the way forward. Because if there is no shared diagnosis and sense of urgency, it's very hard to discuss the treatment in a meaningful way. And in the planetary crisis, this situation often resembles the one in this cartoon. Many people, society and politicians and so on, have not fully understood the diagnosis yet. So now moving to therapy. And as in medicine, there are immediate measures, um, medium and long-term measures to be taken. In an emergency, the first thing is to stabilize the condition of the patient and, for example, prevent further blood loss. So similarly, here we need to stop harming the planet further, stop harmful subsidies, more coal plants, deforestation, loss of swamps and soils, and stop further pollution. In the long run, we have a double challenge, stopping environmental destruction and at the same time reducing poverty. We have to get into this corner, achieving good health at a low ecological cost as envisioned in the SDGs. And although I focus on the climate, we need to consider all the planetary systems when we treat the patients. So not just treat the fever and forget about the liver or the kidney, but the following slides are going to be focusing on climate but to keep that in mind. So for therapy planning, we need to know what is our remaining carbon budget. That means how much CO2 and other greenhouse gases can we still emit into the atmosphere before we cross dangerous planetary boundaries. Um, according to the most recent IPCC report from this year, if we emit another 400 gigatons, we, sh we should still stay below the 1.5 degrees in two-thirds of the models. Annual global emissions are around 42 gigatons. So what does that mean? Well, we have to become clean as soon as possible. That means stop burning fossil fuels and emitting CO2 to the atmosphere, which means we need to quickly decarbonize our economy. We only have a quota of 400 gigatons globally. That was in January 2020, in fact, so now it's already less. During this withdrawal phase, which means we have to organize this intelligently. If we continue to be wasteful over the next few years, it will then become impossible to achieve the goal. And we have to distribute wisely. The 400 gigatons was global. So who is allowed how much? At the same time, we need to fight poverty. So which path do we choose to get to net zero emissions within the budget? So the later we start reducing, the more abrupt we need to reduce, which implies much higher social and economic costs if we switch off everything suddenly. And if we then don't manage to reduce so steeply, we will overdraw the budget. The earth will heat up more with even higher risks for livelihoods and health, which is why it's so important to start immediately. Now, these are 42 coffee beans, and they represent the 42 gigatons of CO2 equivalents of global annual emissions. And I'm showing you a distribution over the entire world population divided into 10 evenly sized groups according to their wealth. Here you can see that the poorer half of the world population emits a tenth of the total, four beans. The richest 10% of the world population 
um, emit half of everything, 21 beams. Quiz question, where should we start to reduce? Now, these are now calculations per person by countries. In Germany, we emit around nine tons per person in year, much above the global average. I guess Belgium is similar. Um, the climate crisis cannot be discussed without talking about justice. Who caused the problem? Who can invest in the transition? Who is struggling to survive and even more so in a changing climate? Who already has a high living standard and is consuming luxury? And where are millions of people striving towards a decent life? It is clear that the rich industrial countries have to reduce faster and help the others. And it also that sa it says that in the Paris Agreement. Now, to accomplish that in the little time left until natural systems will crumble, small stepwise improvements are not sufficient anymore. We need a radical reshaping of our whole way of living, our way of doing business, a great transformation or transition of society. An unprecedented challenge. Will we make it? Well, it will require some major shifts also in our way of thinking, as problems can never be solved with the same mindset that created them, as Einstein wisely realized. Which brings us to the core of the problem, the relationship between humans and the planet. Now, also in this previous graphs, I also showed the humans and the planet or nature separated. Through our technological advances, we imagine that we're kind of independent of nature. And we've also distanced ourselves emotionally regarding nature as a pile of resources just for us. In reality, we are, of course, part of nature. We breathe air, we drink water, we eat other living beings. Millions of microbes live in our guts, on our skin, are vital for our well-being. Exploitation of nature worked fine for a while, while there were relatively few humans and a lot of nature. This has changed. In the Anthropocene, the whole planet is influenced by humans. There's virtually no untouched nature anymore. So nature is part of us, and we are part of nature. We need to realize that we are one component of a highly complex web of life of our living planet and that we totally depend on it. Our health, our society, our economy, all depend on functioning ecosystems, on a stable climate. This also has an ethical dimension. What value do we assign nature? Is our relationship characterized by exploitation or by awe and connectedness? Albert Schweitzer's ethics of reverence for life is one attempt to overcome our restricted ethics that only contain humans. The encyclical letter Laudato Si by Pope Francis is called on care for our common home, which refers to planet Earth. He talks about awe and wonder towards nature versus the attitude of a master consumer and exploiter. And the Dalai Lama emphasizes that it is not enough to train our brains we need to develop our hearts towards more compassion if we want to survive. Of course, these insights are not really new and neither is the idea of planetary health. Many indigenous peoples have preserved this wisdom over generations and a spiritual relationship to nature or Mother Earth. Now let's talk about concrete solution strategies for a sustainable lifestyle. The ecological footprint is well known. Everybody can calculate his or her footprint with online tools. And it's important to make efforts to reduce it already for one's own credibility. But it is not sufficient. We need to jointly change the structures that are hurting people and nature. We need to influence politics and contribute to the great transformation of society. That is the handprint. One example, taking the train instead of flying is footprint and pushing politicians so that trains become the cheaper and easier choice would be handprint. This means we have to change the rules by which we play, the structures. 
And these are decided higher up. The leverage is highest there, which does not mean we should not also act on the middle and lower levels. We need all of that at the same time as they all interact. There are plenty of solutions already, and many are synergistic, win-win solutions, good for the planet and also good for our own health in the short term. For example, in the transport sector, which is responsible for a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions in Europe and the main source for particulate matter pollution. At the same time, physical inactivity, traffic noise and accidents and air pollution are major risk factors for a range of chronic diseases. A transport shift towards pedestrian and bicycle friendly mobility would be a huge gain for the climate and for health. When we stop burning fossil fuels to mitigate climate change, this would avoid an estimated 3.6 million deaths worldwide every year, just from outdoor air pollution. Many also in Europe, as one can see here. Agriculture is responsible for deforestation, land degradation and species loss, including through pesticide use. Altogether, the food system is responsible for around one quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. Growing food differently with approaches learning from nature, we can preserve biodiversity, mitigate climate change and improve human nutrition and health. Unhealthy diets are one of the biggest risk factors for diseases and premature death worldwide. The Eat Lancet Commission has published recommendations for a so-called planetary health diet, healthy and sustainable. Now in Germany, the average plate looks rather like this. A lot less meat and a lot more vegetables would be a huge win for climate, animals and humans alike. Adopting such a diet worldwide could avoid 11 million premature deaths every year and could feed humanity sustainably. In conclusion, two summary statements made by the Lancet Commissions on Climate Change and Health. The first one said, climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century because it destroys living conditions on the planet. Storms and floods, heat and drought, harvest failures and famines, infections, conflicts and migration. It hits poorest people most and first and enhances inequality. And it threatens the survival of our civilization. The second one is tackling climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. What we need to do for the climate is basically similar stuff that we need to do for our own health anyway. The win-win situation, making cities easy to walk and bike, to have more exercise, reducing air pollution, eating less meat and more vegetables. All these are good for the planet and good for our health. Earlier this year, this UNEP report was published that looks at the three crises, climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, and their solutions together, and connects them to human health. It demands a new relationship to nature and to each other. UN General Secretary Guterres made very clear in his speech that we are in an emergency and need to act accordingly. Many good solutions exist already, but they're still in a niche shown here in this graph. These are the pioneers and sudden events and these mega trends up here can open windows of opportunity, which allows these niche things to become the new mainstream. And such a window of opportunity has been opened with the Fridays for Future movement and other for future movements. And now also with the Corona crisis, which is really shaking the mainstream. More and more people are realizing that we are in a planetary emergency. The health professions are also increasingly active for healthy people on a healthy planet. The Health for Future movement in Germany has grown tremendously with groups now in over 60 cities. The fundamental societal change that we need will not happen by itself and come from above. Societal actors need to push for it. There are massive interests against it. It's not just about facts and knowledge, it's about power. We know this sort of from the fight against tobacco industry. The transformation towards sustainable societies is resisted by those who profit from the status quo. As Gandhi wisely said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. 
So we need to form alliances and create a positive vision for a better, healthier, sustainable world, which already exists in niches. There is no blueprint for such a transformation. It's an unprecedented challenge. We have to experiment to some degree, be creative and act into the open, learning while doing and evaluating. And the start to start to act will unleash a lot of energy. Enthusiasm is important, also having fun. And the first step is to realize that we are in an emergency, that our house is on fire and business as usual as on this golf course is no longer appropriate. Many thanks. So thanks a lot, Sabine, for this really, 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 really much needed talk and giving us a vision, um, a path to move forward and some good, good ideas uh, how to achieve planetary health uh, here on planet Earth. And we are really happy to have Sabine with us on Zoom and uh, she's open to your questions. Um, so I hope that we can see her in a minute on our screen. Is she coming? Not yet, um, so please prepare your questions. There she is. Hi, Sabine. Nice to have you here with us. Thanks so much, Sabine, for taking your time. We're really happy to have you here, and uh, we are in a very, very large room. Um, about 500 people fit here in total. Uh, it looks as if almost all 400 participants are here, and we're listening to your talks, and I think got a lot of inspiration um, from the vision you shared with us. So thanks so much for this already. You're welcome. Thank you for listening. So um, I'm very much hoping that there are some interested questions uh, in the audience now. So as described earlier, um, every second place here has a microphone that you might use by yourself by pressing once and pressing twice, you shut it off again, right? Pressing off, switching off. Yes. And then press again to switch it off and you're finished. Okay, so pressing on is uh, switching it off. So um, I kindly ask you to raise your hand if you have a question and then I can um, uh, hand you over and you might use your own microphone to ask a question. Yes, so up there. Hi, hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Petra. Um, I work in the National Research Council in Spain. And I really enjoyed your talks. I mean, I think it's, it was a great summary. Um, and one of the things I really liked although you just mentioned it br briefly, was the um, issue of thinking as the, uh, of this problem not in the sense of Anthropocene, but Capitalocene. And I, I know you just mentioned it briefly, maybe because you don't want to enter in this controversy, but for me this is a key point, no? Can we really build um, a, a sustainable future inside capitalism? And the logics of accumulation, that's for me and for many authors and, and other people here probably, the, the root cause of the problem. It's not really technological advances or industry, or techn, I don't know, like techno fixes that's going to make, make us get out of this uh, situation. And, and the example is clear, knowing that industrial green energy production is not the solution toward, for me towards an energy transition. For instance, these solar, huge solar farms or, or green power um, uh, projects. Um, so what's your take on that? <laughs> Do you want to, to expand a bit on that? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I, I had this other slides where I talked also about values and that the core of the problem is not necessarily a technical issue. And I, I share that view that, yes, we need all the technical solutions, obviously, but it's probably not enough. We also need to um, develop a different relationship to um, each other and as a community and also as a community with all other species on this planet and realize that we're one big, um, I don't know, symphony of life together and how can we behave as a meaningful component of all that. And how, how we organize our own economic system is, is one subsystem of the ecosystem. And at the moment it's not organized 
in a way that's helpful to the whole. So we definitely need to change that. And yeah, I, I think there's lots of work to do there. And there are a lot of creative solutions actually out there that exist and that are being tried out. And the problem is how we scale that up on a large level to really make a global impact. And that for that, we need so many people to push and to experiment and to show that it's possible to live a different, to, to, to do things differently and think differently. And, um, and that is actually more, more, I think more, um, like us, like, like we humans should be. We're not necessarily um, meant to be exploiting each other and the ecosystems, but we're also meant to have a meaningful relation and that makes us actually more happy if we do, I think. Yeah, thanks so much, Sabine. And I think this is exactly why citizen science and planetary health are such a good match, because citizen science is trying to do different, you know, has a different approach on how we do science. Um, so I think there really is this avenue opening up uh, the shared vision that we have. So, um, yeah, there's another question. So please go ahead. Yeah, Sabine, thank you so much for your, for your inspiring talk. Um, I'm Rick Hall from the United Kingdom. Um, I was very struck by your Venn diagram, which illustrated that human beings are part of nature. Uh, there is another one that which I'd like you to, to perhaps comment on, and that is the role of science and citizen science, as we are all here in this conference uh, gathered here in Berlin, um, the role of science within culture, because you mentioned culture, and I, I'm very struck by how important it is that we engage in a cultural transformation which involves the whole of society. You mentioned transdisciplinary, um, so that the role of the arts and creativity um, as part of the solution as well. I agree. I, what was the question exactly? Whether I share this view? Yes. <laughs> Yes, and I do yes, think I, I apologise, yeah. I mean, it's one of those, it's one of those conference <laughs> blights, isn't it, that somebody makes a point and then doesn't ask a question. But it's <laughs> fine, I think it's not like I have the wisdom and others asking questions, I think we all have a lot of wisdom to share and I think comments are equally well, welcome as questions. <laughs> Yeah, so um, thanks so much, Sabine. So we agreed that you have five minutes of question and um, we're really happy that you are here with us um, despite being uh, not in the conference, but you know we were uh, able to meet online. Thanks so much for taking your time and making this possible and for sharing um, this really, really inspiring film video with us. Um, wishing you all the best and, and hoping to meet you soon at some point in present here in Berlin or worldwide. And, together fighting for planetary health. Thanks so much, Sabine. Thank you, bye-bye, have a good conference. Yeah, and with this, uh, some more announcements. Um, so you all now have five minutes to switch rooms and uh, move around in the langbeck Virchow house or use the walk and talk to get to the museum. One small announcement again, all talks are supposed to be collected at the registration. The last chance for all speakers, shh, may I ask for some silence here? Yeah, uh, the last chance for speakers is go to your room support or your chair at your room. You will find all information of room support and chairs um, down at the poster in the foyer. There are two big posters where you can find information on the chairs and the room support of your rooms. Please make sure that your talks and your PDFs or um, PowerPoint presentations are with your chair and your room support. Um, one more announcement. Um, there might be some talks uh, that will be skipped um, because people are, were not available to come for several reasons. Please be kind uh, and, um, yeah, uh, and understanding. And now, for those people who were not here before, um, I am again going to give you some uh, little lecture on the infrastructure in the house. The only really important thing that you need to know is if you would like to go to the interactive session um, in a minute right now, that is going to be in the beer raum, 
in the fifth floor on the very top, and this is going to be the interactive session two, rethinking public services, provision citizen science to support public and environmental health services. Um, please use the elevator to do so, to go up on the fifth floor, and don't feed on the buffet that is going to be provided there, because your buffet is going to be only in the foyer downstairs. Um, yeah. <laughs> Apart from that, um, I now wish you a really, really inspiring, wonderful first morning at the EXA conference. If you have any request, always come to the registration. We are there for you to help you. Have a nice day.
Take this one. Sorry for that. Okay. Good morning. I think we had a really great introduction already, not very optimistic, but I think it ended with a positive note that we can at least try to do something starting from an individual level. Um, this session um, is the one on towards global sustainability for planetary health. I think a very exciting topic. My name is Sabine Wildevuur. I'm director of Design Lab of the University of Twente, one of the co-founders of the EXA workgroup Citizen Science for Health, and also involved in a lot of uh, projects uh, on Citizen Science for Health. And um, we have six presenters today, uh, really different topics as well, but all link, of course, to sustainability. The SDGs are mentioned in several presentations as well. And uh, we have a very strict um, uh, timing for today. Every presenter has 10 minutes and five minutes for Q&A. So uh, we have to cut you off uh, if it's uh, taking too long. So I would like to uh, introduce Martin Brockel. Hurst. Hurst. <laughs> it was like, is it Hurst or Hurst? Um, he is from Camplay Green Consultants and his title is Empowering Zero Emission Citizens and he will take us along in the Aurora project that is designed to illustrate how to empower citizens across the EU to make informed energy de decisions. So the 10 minutes will start now. Thank you very, <clears throat> thank you very much. And my, my first slide is just an indication of how traumatic climate change really is. If you're caught in one of the big extreme weather events now, it is utterly life-changing. Um, and this was Australia when they were still talking about building coal-fired power stations in Australia. Um, and I happened to be there when the fires were going, um, and it, it's very dramatic. So I'm going to talk to you about Aurora. It's an EU-funded project achieving a new European energy awareness. It's about doing something now. It's not about waiting to be told what to do by governments. It's a 4.6 million pound program. It's coordinated from uh, Madrid. And the list of partners are shown along the bottom and they're a mixture of universities, local government and private sector. So an interesting mix. The objectives of the project are very clear about upgrading local social communities into energy communities to turn into citizen science hubs for energy transition. And the project is committed to raise 1 million euros from local people through crowdsource funding to finance local renewable energy schemes of 1 mega, uh, sorry, 1,000 kilowatt solar power. We're aiming to get 7,000 committed people involved in the project who will personally track their own carbon uh, footprint to monitor their habits on energy behaviors, on their travel, on their heating, and on their energy and with targeted feedback on comparisons between individuals. It's about enabling people to act within their own community and at a domestic level through hands-on activities that will support a responsible energy transition using existing techniques and new ideas. And then creating ambassadors to go on and promote that behavioral change much more widely. And if you think about the partners that are involved in this program, four universities um, and one a municipality. And I would challenge everybody here to take the messages away from Aurora back to your own universities and ask the question, why aren't you tracking what Aurora are doing? Why aren't you copying what Aurora are doing? To go back into your municipality and do exactly the same thing. Why aren't you moving more rapidly on climate change? This is an emergency. Why aren't you treating it like one? Why are you so complacent? Why are we missing all our targets? Because you can drive this from below. You don't have to be a victim of the fossil fuel industry. You don't have to be a fossil fool. You can change and you can change from below. So this program is about mobilizing, mobilizing people and communities, raising awareness, tracking carbon with um, an app on your phone, putting money into crowdsource funding for solar photovoltaic community facilities, innovating with new ideas, and then lots of people acting as ambassadors at all sorts of different levels to exploit the results. It's creating public, private, local energy communities, and it's a real breakthrough in some countries to do this. This 
idea of being able to produce your own power and sell it to local people for their own use. So you're no longer reliant on centralized energy generation schemes. And it's not a footprint calculator that we're talking about for our app, it's a personal trainer. This is about you taking responsibilities for your carbon and driving those carbon levels down in line with the Paris Commission targets. It's about giving you a label as to where you are on that journey, as you would do with any electrical appliance. So that there is a labeling scheme being developed so that you can compare your performance against others in a very simple way. There's an example of the, the app starting to be formed. It will become available to, at the end of this year and will start to go out into use in the communities. The community photovoltaic schemes are already developing in each of the pilot areas, and boy are there problems in doing it. And the countries involved, Slovenia, Portugal, Spain, the UK and Denmark, all have different barriers, all trying to stop communities doing the very thing we want to do. And in your universities, the Aarhus University, for instance, um, when they started to have the discussions with the, the, the provost of the university, of course, the buildings are not owned by the university. They're owned by a third party company. So you have to convince the third party company. You have to have a contract with that company for the sale and purchase of the electricity. And you have to look at the legal framework within the country within, within which you're operating to see what you can do. And then you have to innovate and find ways around the barriers. I'm now just going to give you this, some of the examples of the areas where we're working. Uh, the Technical University of Madrid is interesting. They're the leaders of the project. And on that particular city, Madrid is committed to zero carbon by 2030. It realized it couldn't do it. So it's broken the city down into districts, one of which is around the university. So if the university can get to zero carbon through this program, it can have a knock-on effect immediately on its local community. And as I say, just imagine it's not four universities doing this, but all the universities in Europe, what a difference this would make. It's not just one municipality doing it, it's all the municipalities in the, in the EU. I'll take you through what it means for one of the partners. This is the example from the Forest of Dean, it's where I live. And it's a municipality that's now looking to put a community-funded solar voltaic facility on a local school that will then provide energy to the local leisure centre, reducing costs for the leisure centre, reducing costs for the school, reducing carbon. And the way you pay for it is through crowdsource funding, and the people who put money into the scheme can offset that against their carbon footprint. So there's a, 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 a loop working here. And then it starts to ask you questions about your community. And this is just a simple example of one community that's then picked up on the Aurora program and said, well, actually, what does this mean for me? What, what is my community doing in terms of carbon emissions? And this is just a, a, all the communities in the Forest of Dean showing where they sit in terms of their overall carbon emissions. And it's actually linked to socioeconomics. The, the, the left-hand side of the screen are the poorest areas, the right-hand side are the richest areas. Direct correlation. The one exception is Hartbury, where there's a university, which complicates the picture. The same community then said, well, where's the carbon coming from in our community, from the decisions that we all take? And this is just a simple breakdown of where those carbon emissions are coming from, from heating, from transport, from goods, from food. You've got to know where the problem areas are before you can tackle them in your community. And then what about the geographical area in which you're located? That has an effect on your carbon footprint as well. And in this community, agriculture is massive. So if you really want to make a difference, don't plant a tree, go and talk to your farmer. You know, don't be, if you like, a, a, a fool in terms of the way you use your energy to drive carbon down. Find out where you can make the biggest impact and hit that first. That's what really matters. And then we had another look in this particular community at the housing. How good or bad is the housing? And it turns out 70% of the houses have got an energy performance certificate. It's all available publicly online. And you can find out where the worst performers are. Hit the worst performers first. Go and talk to the people because they can do something about getting their carbon emissions down. You don't have to wait for governments to tell you what to do. And then interestingly, this particular project is part of a bigger whole now for the EU Green Deal cluster. And 
I think tremendously for the first time, the Commission are pulling projects together. They're looking to get maximum benefit from working together. So we've gone from the local, now we're looking through all these particular projects, bringing them together to see how we can get maximum impact from them and amazing things start to happen. You start to find now, we're now talking to the Global Citizen Science Partnership who are talking to UNEP about putting the information from what we're doing up onto the world, what they call the World Environment Situation Room, allowing our data to cascade straight up to the UN. What an amazing opportunity that comes from working together as a cluster. And just to finish, we need you. We need you to act on climate change. We need you to use less energy and emit less CO2. We need you to save on electricity costs. We need you to start thinking as communities. We need you to participate in this research project. You can actually take part if you live in one of the demo areas, but why wait until the end of the project? Track us on social media. Track us in terms of what we're delivering through the project on our website and mimic what we're doing in your community, in your university. Thank you very much. So thanks a lot. I think a very clear message and well within time, um, even before time, because my uh, timer didn't uh, stop yet. Um, are there any questions? Because I think that's a, it's a really urge to, to uh, work on this. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Martin. Uh, question, as you said, the roll-up is important. What role does uh, citizen science global partnership rolling into the citizen uh, uh, situation room at the UN? What, what type of impact is that going to help or, or help or hinder in, in these exercises? It, thank it's, you. it's actually very difficult to say at the moment because I think we're still at that point where the, the World Environment Situation Room is offering us the opportunity to have a citizen science portal. So the, the way we design that portal and what we put on that portal really matters. But my own view is, and it's a, it's a personal view at this point in time, that if we can get the very best of the best citizen science programs up there in an open science principle where you can share the software, share the hardware, share all the tools, share all the learning on the, the business planning that has gone into this particular program, it then becomes possible for somebody in Mumbai, somebody in Bangladesh, to pick up the same idea, take it across and use it. And so it's about disseminating and growing this belief that people can change this dynamic in terms of climate change. And it's something like, in, in the richer countries, 30% of our carbon emissions are under our control, the decisions that we make. So if we can get more people thinking like that, that's a step forward. If I go back into my own community, one of the things we did was go and talk to people. And what we found was actually we get climate change. We understand climate change. So don't lecture me about it anymore. But I don't think I can do anything about it. And then the conversation goes to what are you actually doing in your life? And then when you start drilling in, you find that they're doing lots of things to drop their carbon down, but they're normally dressed up in terms of cost savings. So you draw those out, you share those, you build confidence across communities. What they're not good at is community effort, bringing the whole thing into the community concept in a university scenario, not just the students, not just the staff, but all the people that make the university work need to be part of this package. The people who live around the university can be influenced by what you do. And it's the strength of the community and the number of people you get involved that drives the, the rate of change and also drives the politicians to take note. Because we've always worked on this principle of top-down in climate change. I think too much, for too long, waiting for governments to deliver. The one thing Stockholm Plus 50 showed us is that multilateral agreements are not working. They spend hours putting these agreements together, setting targets, and then the targets are not delivered. We need to drive this from the bottom up as well as the top down. And so I, I guess my answer to your question is, the World Environment Situation Room can be our shop window to share all this best practice with others. And then there should be no barrier to anybody else copying what we've already done. That's the open science principle. It's what UNESCO are looking to do with science. I hope that answers that one. Yeah.
Thanks a lot. Yeah, I would like to use the break for other questions to, to Martin. Sorry, I've been talking a bit long. Yo, no, thanks a lot. And I think there's space enough to, uh, you'll be around, I suppose, the coming yeah, days. Yeah, there, there are brochures outside on the project if you want okay. to see them. And on Friday, there is a poster session where you can come and ask me more questions um, and get involved. Because this is about getting involved. Yeah, I think take action. That's that's very clear from the bottom up as well. So yep. thanks a lot, Martin. Thank you. And I would like to introduce the next speaker. Okay, we have Alba de Agosto Camacho, um, environmental engineer. Uh, roots in Aruba, and you will uh, share the results of a scoping review. Yes. Did? Okay, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I... Oh, thank you so much. So I have this hands-on uh, microphone. I think you can hear me well. Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining my presentation. My name is Alba de Agustin, and today I'm going to be talking about citizen science for a sustainable development of small island developing states. This uh, work I have conducted as part of my PhD in collaboration with a co-author team and it's part of the system program. System stands for Sustainable Island Solutions through STEM and actually results of a collaboration between University of Aruba in the Caribbean and KU Leuven in Belgium. It's a project funded by the European Commission. So um, first I will briefly introduce what are small island developing states for those are not familiarized yet with uh, Concept. So there are actually 38 UN member states and 20 non-UN members. But what you see in the map, there are most of them islands, small, remote, isolated, distributed around the world, and very much impacted by climate change. So you might have seen on the news, for example, the government of Tuvalu already wondering uh, or planning what to do what the country sinks, or for those following the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, you might have heard the speech of the Prime Minister from Barbados, and if you didn't, I encourage you to do it because she explains very well how people on islands are already, or I include myself because I live on islands as well, how we are already suffering the impact of climate change. So there are several limitations for development, and some of them are lack of data, lack of human resources or limited resources, let's say, and the need for island research for local solutions. So this is actually how citizen science can help small island states with their own development. And in this diagram, I have represented two approaches of, of citizen science. So on your left side, I think, which is my right side, you see the productivity approach, which actually emphasizes the capacity of developing scientific research through citizen science to mobilize resources even more in this type of context in which human and economic resources are limited, and in that way also to collect the very much needed data. On the other side, we see the democratization approach, which actually facilitates contextualizing this specific research that we want to develop to actually recognize the local knowledge and in a way to create awareness and make social changes. So both pillars could actually be uh, very useful to support sustainable development on a small island state and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the potential for citizen science is clear, and now we have some more qu questions to answer. How are citizen science projects designed on the six context? Because most of the citizen science projects are uh, implemented in Europe, in North America. So we are also interested to know how are these being designed and implemented on the six context. And what is the potential contribution to the sustainable development goals? So the methods we follow, we did a systematic review. So for that, we extracted from Web of Science a total of 76 articles. So there were actually not that many articles that are about small island states. So we use a topic, which means abstract keywords or title in Web of Science to extract those papers that actually are being uh, implemented in one of the seats and are actually on the topic of citizen science. We use more terms, not only citizen science, because more terms are being used in different contexts. 
And at the end, we, after doing a Prisma scoping review, so we included those that uh, were implemented on islands, there were case studies, um, participants were actively involved in one or more of the phases. We have 28 to analyze. So how we analyze them, here you see a diagram we actually elaborated for a publication that is currently under review. And what you see here in the inner circle is the project. So all projects have a goal, have a method, have an outcome. And the other circle, which is darker yellow, um, is a context. So all projects are embedded in a context. And then we see the 17 SDGs and different arrows that link the different dimensions. So we first look into the context. What is the relation of the authors and co-authors? So what are the patterns in their affiliation? Whether they belong to a global north institution, global south, or seeds. Then we also look into the link between the sustainable development goals and the goals of the project. We look into the goal of the project and which methods were used. And we look into the goal of the project and what were the outcomes. So I will start showing you the results. Here we see how um, different projects could potentially contribute to the SDGs. And we actually see that most projects could potentially contribute to SDG 14, Life Below Water. But most of this, these projects are actually productivity projects, which means the goal was mainly to collect data. And what is also interesting is that there are three projects that merge or targeted both democratization and productivity goals. And this is very important also um, considering that people living on islands are very much linked with the sea, with the sea, so the well-being, the economy, um, the culture and history. So designing projects that target more than one goal might seem a more inclusive approach. And for many SDGs, we did not fund projects that could be linked to. Okay, when we look into the authors and co-authors team, out of 28 projects, 13, the first author was from the Global North. And there were actually three projects in which all the authors were from the Global North, which made us also think that the perspective of island authors is not very much involved in the design of those projects. There were three projects in which all authors were from the Global South, and actually one project in which a country from the Global uh, South in Africa was collaborating with one of the seats that is close to the continent. So actually, that's a very interesting point to better understand how South-South cooperation could support development on this context. And then when we look into the goals and the degree of participation, I already mentioned that most projects were productivity projects and these have a contributory approach. So people were mainly collecting data or only collecting data. And when we look into the democratization projects, uh, out of four, three have a co-creation uh, approach, which means that participants were involved in designing the research question, designing the methods, so they were involved beyond collecting data. And here we have a slide about the goals versus the methods. Okay, methods can be very broad, but I simplify into participant recruitment and profile, because in all contexts we have different profiles and how we approach them is important. So. What is interesting here is that for many projects, many, most of them productivity projects, it was not described how participants were recruited, meaning that maybe it was uh, not an important aspect of that publication. But actually, in order to better understand how projects are designed and implemented in different contexts, uh, I think it's very important to mention these characteristics on the article so we can better understand those projects. When we look into projects that have a democratization goal, they actually were approaching participants with deliberate democratization approach, which means targeting a specific community members or through NGOs already embedded in the community. And when we look into the profile of the participants, most were affected community members. Uh, but we also found committee members with particular profile or skill. And the project goals and the outcomes. What do we see here? We see that data is the most mentioned outcome. Once again, in blue you see the productivity project, in green you see those projects that 
combine productivity and democratization goals and in yellow, the democratization ones. So interesting is that a project that combines productivity and democratization goals also got data as an output. This can be quantitative or qualitative data, but that data was used for policy changes and in the process of doing this project, they were learning outcomes, people were empowered, and there was a network being created. So we see more than one outcome here. So as a conclusion, I would like to mention that citizen science creates possibilities for contextualized island research, that citizen science can contribute collecting that data that is actually lacking, and very much, sorry, <laughs> especially considering the limitations of uh, economic and human limitations. And the combination of democratization and productivity goals can actually lead to a more inclusive development the potential contribution of these case studies that we analyze are mainly for SDG 14, but then also to SDG 3 and SDG 11. And it's also interesting to look into those SDGs for which we did not found any case study to understand if we should also design citizen science projects that target those SDGs that are most in need. So one of the limitations is that we did not look into gray literature, and it might be that in this context, many projects are conducted by NGOs and are being published in gray literature instead of academic articles. So what we are doing for our next steps, we have interviewed NGOs and policymakers working on islands with citizen science and reporting on SDG agendas. And we want to evaluate or analyze if the outcomes of scientific articles also aligned with the realities that the stakeholders are facing in this field. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you, Alba. I think, um, yeah, it's really of added value to you to do this kind of systematic reviews, even though they're not that easy to do. Um, yeah, any questions? I see one hand raised. Thanks very much for your talk, it's excellent. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a bit about how you classified your projects as either being productivity um, projects or democratization projects. Okay, yeah, thank you, very interesting question. So if I understood correctly, it's like when did I decide if a project was productivity or if a project was democratic? Okay, yeah. So actually we designed an instrument that will also be published together with the diagram I was presenting in the uh, publication is under review. And the way we look at it is, okay, based on what the authors of the articles, how they, um, sorry, how they phrase their goals. So when you read a case study, and if the author phrases in a way, okay, we wanted to collect data about uh, starfish because they are in danger, and our goal was to actually know how many starfishes were there in that uh, site, then it's purely a productivity project because the author do not mention how they actually wanted to encourage or they wanted to educate the community. And therefore, we consider that a productivity project. It might be that in the way they are educating people, but if this is not measured, if this is not a tangible outcome or target, we cannot classify it as a, a project that combines both goals. But we did look into other projects, for example, that they want to involve diving schools and they want to involve the tourism sector uh, in collecting data about species in danger. So, okay, they are collecting data, so it's productivity, but they also want to see how there can be some uh, environmental and social benefits for that community. So if the schools can be involved, if different businesses can be involved, so then clearly the authors are stating that they have more than one goal. And there were some projects that were purely democratization as well. So the goal was to teach, to share knowledge, to empower, and therefore we classify them as democratization projects. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I have one quick question. Yes. How do you decide if it contributes to uh, the SDGs, if citizen science contributes? Okay, yeah, very good question as well, because none of the articles actually mention any potential link with the sustainable development goals. So it was also an interesting finding that uh, even though they could contribute, they did not mention it on the article. So what I did actually went through all the SDG targets 
and see if um, any of the outcomes that were mentioned in the article could contribute. So if um, one of the projects was, for example, developing a technology to involve women, so these women could be more empowered, then uh, looking into the SDGs of equity, uh, we see an SDG uh, in the SDG 5, we see about equity, about how technology can empower women and can make a more fair situation for um, people of this profile and therefore we make such a link. Okay, well we talk afterwards because I was also interested in how do you decide then what is citizen science, but I think that's a, a, a more difficult one to answer. Okay, I'm happy um, to answer later during yeah, the break. Let's do that, thanks a lot uh, Thank Alba for your uh, presentation. And I would like to invite the next speaker on the stage. Okay, thank you. Here you Microphone, it. thank you. Sorry. So we have uh, Ha, it doesn't explain where the Ha stands for, but Ha Ulrich Hoppe, um, with the title Between Exoplanets and Planetary Health, Viewing Citizen Science Through the SDG Lens. Uh, he's from the Rias Rayas Institute and uh, based on the insight of the CS tracks. You will update the relation between, uh, update us on the relation between uh, citizen science and uh, the SDG. Right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here to be able to expose in this community and in this very nice environment. Um, so I'm also thankful to the preceding speaker because uh, she has paved the way towards looking at citizen science activities in relation to planetary health and SDGs more analytically, and I will take an even more distant perspective, if you allow. So, um, and even that already the title says that I'm going to address a certain tension here. Uh, I'm going to say more about the origin. Oh, the color is a bit strange here. <laughs> so this is the overall, uh, say, topic of this conference. And I think we agree that uh, planetary health is related to SDGs. I thought I sh might have to say more about that, but I think this has already been paved. So um, we can look at planetary health uh, in a way as the background with, uh, through the foreground, the more operational formulations of uh, sustainable development goals. This has been discussed in the community. This is one recent paper, also originating from, from this place in part at least. Uh, it's about uh, uh, assessing uh, the contribution of citizen science activities to sustainable development goals. So viewing citizen science through the SDG lens is quite popular. On the other hand, if we think of planets, there's also such activities as exoplanet search. That's a genuine part of citizen science research. Some platforms, like Zooniverse, were, were created with such projects in the original set of, say, um, of, in the core of these platforms. And um, what does an orientation towards SDGs mean for such projects, like in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, just a question to the audience. Who here in the audience is working in the field of astronomy and astrophysics? Nobody here in this audience. It's not a, not a surprise because the topic of this, of this session is not really into that direction. So, um, we have this orientation towards SDGs and planetary health, um, and we should reflect now what this means for the whole landscape of citizen science. Because, as I said, astronomy, astrophysics is a genuine, it has been and is a genuine part of citizen science activities. Um, <clears throat> and we should look at the interactions um, as a basis, as a premise for further going policy discussions. How do we decide, how do we handle this possible tension? Um, I will not enter this policy discussion in first place. I would rather take a data-driven approach to give you some uh, background on the interactions that we find 
in, say, the manifestations of citizen science, in, particularly in the online world, on online platforms. This comes from a project called CS Track uh, that uh, started December 2019, a, Europea uh, a European project. Um, and uh, the specificity of this project is the combination of computational analytics techniques with other more standard social science techniques to analyze citizen science. So to look at citizen science a bit, let us say, from the outside also. Uh, oop. Can somebody switch maybe? Oh, uh, so I'll try again. Yeah, now it comes. So uh, we have built up a database um, harvesting information mainly from platforms. I mean, online citizen science activities are usually organized in platforms. We have started to harvest information from the platform, which is a bias. I mean, there are activities that are not originally a, on the platforms, oh, that was the wrong one, so. And if you want to learn more about this project, there is uh, on Saturday a half day uh, where, where you get detailed information uh, in several threads also with hands-on possibilities about what we are doing in this project. So in our approach to analyzing citizen science activities, we have been looking at three levels, micro, meso, macro. Um, the micro level would mean we look into projects in depth, in detail, like the talk pages, the forum pages. We analyze these interactions using discourse analysis techniques, network analysis techniques here. We have done that, um, for instance, with the Chimp and Z project on Zooniverse. The meso level, the middle level, is for collections of projects where we can apply certain techniques overall over the whole collection and just extract, for instance, here relations to research areas for a whole bundle of projects that are more or less homogeneously described. And then the macro level would be that we uh, open up towards, in a way, not only the projects that we have in the database, but also, for instance, harvesting from the blogosphere, the Twitter blogosphere, and looking at interactions of citizen science activities in this, this open space. Uh, I will concentrate here on the meso-level approach. So where we practically, and this goes a bit into the, into the te technicalities of what we are doing, we are mainly departing from project descriptions that we have in the database and we can compare using a method called ESA such project descriptions uh, with reference pages, uh, the Wikipedia pages that correspond to certain topics so that we can see uh, in how far uh, these project des descriptions resonate uh, with these topics. There are also other things like named entity recognition, etc. But the main thing is this. So you have, a, for instance, the Wikipedia page on biodiversity, and you have a project description, and then you can say, with, using this technique called ESA, you can say there's a certain similarity in this project description uh, with the general topic of biodiversity. Um, oops. Uh, this is an example where we have done that for a collection of 2,218 uh, uh, projects from the Zooniverse platform. Um, this is also the sample that I'm going to use here in the background. Additionally, we have also done the same thing using ESA here, that's uh, the, the violet bar uh, with SDGs. SDGs have reference pages in, on Wikipedia, so it's very easy to do the same thing with SDGs. For this, uh, SDG-related analysis, we also have manual coding, and we have also used uh, two other coding techniques, encoder, that comes from a specific field that, that, that we are related to, and OSDG is a suggestion that comes uh, from uh, the, the SDG world as such. So, now, once you have these associations of projects to topics, be it research areas or be it SDGs, you can calculate the similarity between topics viewed through the manifestations in the projects. It's practically the calculation, calculation of an overlap. Think of an overlap, as you see here. So, 
you have topic X, and it is, has been associated to a certain uh, to a certain number of projects. Topic Y has been uh, associated to another set of projects. And now you look at the overlap, and you look what share does this overlay overlay make uh, up for all the projects in the union of these two sets. That's what we call the Jacquard index, and you can now calculate these associations between research areas and SDGs. And I have extracted some more specific and probably, hopefully, interesting interactions here. Not surprisingly, environmental science and ecology projects associated with this label resonate to the highest degree with SDGs, 16.1%. So the average overlap is 16.1% with over all the SDGs. Um, you see now astronomy and astrophysics is at the at 3.9%. Interestingly, uh, interestingly, ornithology is even lower. Um, so, but and we also see that uh, if you look at the second column that uh, the resonance in this sense with the SDG4 quality education is typically higher with the exception of ornithology so that's uh, something special about these bird watching projects uh, that we still have to explore further how it came about but it is uh, what we found so, um, observations. There's no surprise regarding the research areas, usual uh, suspects that show high resonance with SDGs. Um, resonance with uh, quality education, or as it is spelled out more in more detail, ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all is usually even higher. Um, this is also true for astronomy and astrophysics at an overall very low level, and that there are even areas with lower level of resonance to SDGs. Uh, caveats, uh, we found that the values appear to be somewhat biased uh, by overall number of projects that, that fall into that area, although the formula that you have seen is clearly just relative. But this is something that we have to bear in mind. And if we talk about education, why that? Often people say, oh, yeah, um, we, by involving people in science, any type of science, we are promoting education. And this should- I'm moving clo closer yeah. and closer, sorry, to, because yeah. we really have to cut off. So maybe the last, last five sentence, words. Yeah. yeah, last sentence. And this education may be specifically true, but it's often not education for all. And we have to be clear about that. Thank you for your okay. attention. Thanks you, thank you for your message. Thanks a lot. Um, very interesting. And also this morning we heard about transdisciplinarity. I think to have astrophysics here is, uh, is, is wonderful as well. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Could we again switch? Um... Yeah, thank you. No, no. Yeah, I see one question here in the front. I thought that was very interesting. I'm curious whether is, is there, are you going to go beyond, like you're measuring resonance based on how these projects specifically talk about themselves and how they're talked about on, on Wikipedia, but could you go deeper than that looking at participants who are doing the interviews that you're doing also? Is there a way to measure resonance that may not be explicitly stated, but where there's actually overlap yeah, in terms in of- In the project, we are doing such things, and you will be able to see that on Saturday. Um, for this analysis, um, which was this meso-level type of analysis, we, we have just stayed on that level, that we could associate research areas, SDGs, to the projects, but we have gone into more details from the, for instance, the talk pages of the projects, etc. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your contribution and your presentation, and I would like to Ask the next speaker, coming down already, Athanasia Orvanu. 
The title is The Role of Sustainable Waste Management in the Carbon Footprint of Pilot Cities, presenting the CO2 calculator of COMPARE. So I'm really looking forward to the dashboard that you have been developing. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Athanasia Orfanou and I'm a PhD candidate in the University of the Aegean. And today I'm going to present to you the role of sustainable waste management in the carbon footprint of pilot cities and I will present to you the CO2 calculator of COMPARE. Uh, to begin with, I want to say a few words about the COMPARE project. COMPARE project is a three-year project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 and it's designed to help citizens monitor, understand and change their environmental impact. Also, it helps people with no scientific background to use new technologies such as sensors, dynamic dashboards and augmented reality app uh, so they can collect data that measures air qual local air quality. Uh, in this way, he, it can use a citizen science data to enrich public and private data on air quality matters and it ensures that citizen science is a trusted approach to addressing environmental problems. So, in the framework of the COMPARE project and in collaboration with the University of the Aegean in Samos, uh, we are developing a carbon footprint simulation dashboard, uh, as you can see on my uh, right. So, uh, in um, the carbon footprint simulation dashboard is designed to help citizens understand how their daily actions affect CO2 levels and also to compare how future CO2 emissions can be modified when daily habits are changing, such as uh, driving or cycling or um, washing during day or night. Uh, this would uh, lead uh, uh, citizens to uh, a more uh, behavior, uh, sorry, <laughs> to a more friendly behavior, uh, so to a more environmentally friendly behavior, uh, choices such as carpooling or limiting uh, waste or maximizing recycling. Uh, so, our carbon footprint simulation dashboard is uh, unique uh, from other carbon footprints because uh, it captures citizens' opinions on what actions they are willing to perform towards the achievement of a policy target. Uh, but what is a carbon footprint? I think uh, many of you here already know. Uh, it's the total amount of greenhouse gases, uh, either methane or carbon dioxide, that is produced by your daily activities. Uh, I, as it mentioned in the previous talk, uh, the average is 6.8 tons of CO2 uh, per capita per year. And some activities have a larger footprint than others. And the most common categories that affect uh, the carbon footprint are the transportation, consumption behavior, and the municipal solid waste management. In this study, we want to focus on how the waste management um, affects the carbon footprint of the citizen. So, uh, 11.2 billion tons of solid waste are produced worldwide. Uh, almost uh, half of ton uh, is, uh, per, per citizen is produced municipal solid waste in the EU. And 50% of them gets burned or ends up in landfills. And only 10 or 40% of them is recycled and composted. Uh, although it's uh, uh, five percent, the, so, um, the municipal solid waste it's uh, a five percent of the of the total carbon footprint of the global emissions, but although it's a low percentage, it's a significant one because it could alter with uh, behavior changes or the integration of circular economy practices. So, for uh, our methods of analysis, uh, we are collecting data from, raw data from pilot cities. Uh, for our analysis, we will use Athens and Berlin as a pilot city. And uh, after that, uh, we will uh, calculate uh, the emissions with, uh, by using Landsem tool, which is a calculating which is a tool that calculates landfill emission rates from total landfill gas, methane, carbon dioxide, non-methane organic compounds, and individual air pollutants from uh, landfills. I, after that, the total CO2 uh, footprint is going to be uh, calculated by our uh, by COMPARE's uh, calculator. And uh, today, uh, I will present to you Athens as a case study. So, Athens, uh, produce 
uh, almost uh, half a ton uh, per, uh, municipal solid weight per capita per year. And uh, the most of them, 80% of them, are getting landfilled and only 20% of them uh, are getting recycled. So Athens still has one of the highest uh, landfilling rates in Europe. Uh, so, as we can see, it's far away from meeting EU targets in uh, recycled and reused municipal solid waste uh, and also for landfilling. Uh, then, we used LandGem tool uh, to calculate uh, the greenhouse emissions for a 100-year projection and uh, we found that it will be more than 100 million tons of uh, CO2. So, at the same moment, uh, waste to energy produce almost half the amount of these uh, emissions. Uh, although Landsum is a very useful tool, it focuses on emission rates that comes from uh, landfill. So, we, uh, here is where the carbon footprint simulation dashboard comes to fill the gap, uh, so because it's um, uh, it uses proper integration of recycling, composting and energy recovery in the waste management footprint. As you can see in uh, the picture is uh, uh, the domain of the waste management that the user uh, will have to fill in and um, uh, it dep uh, depending his um, everyday daily actions on waste ma management. Uh, in this point, I want to uh, tell you uh, a little bit more about the carbon footprint simulation dashboard. In the beginning, the user will uh, have to fill in some uh, demographic data, uh, for example, which city, which country is he from, and uh, which city, and also the period time that he wants to calculate his carbon footprint. Uh, after that, uh, he will uh, need to fill in some uh, 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 some data about his daily habits on uh, transportation habits, traveling habits, how, you, how often he uses uh, flights, trains, and also the waste management habits that we mentioned before. Uh, from some preliminary results, uh, we have seen that uh, behavioral changes in waste management can alter noticeably the carbon footprint of citizens. Uh, recycled materials consume less energy than raw materials, and uh, that is very important because it emits fewer greenhouse gases. And waste to energy technologies produce approximately half of uh, the, the greenhouse gases emissions in comparison to landfilling. Uh, for our future work, uh, we will be able to compare different scenarios uh, for each pilot city. This will be um, very interesting because they will uh, be able to understand how their uh, daily actions affect their CO2 calcula calculation. And after that, we will be able to compare the overall CO2 footprint of citizens for different pilot cities. And this will highlight the difference uh, between um, in carbon footprint, depending on different waste management that every city uses. Also, recommendations from proper waste management will be available at the citizen level as well as in the government level, and we expect it to be fully functional till the end of the year. Uh, to sum up, uh, municipal solid waste is a relative low but significant percent of the total greenhouse gas emissions and uh, because, because it can improve through the citizen behaviour. Uh, Landsem is a modeling tool introduced by the APA uh, that calculates emission rates from landfilling and uh, by using COMPARE's carbon footprint simulation dashboard, we can achieve the proper integration of recycling, uh, composting and energy recovery into the carbon footprint derived from waste management. Uh, the most important thing is that it allows citizens to participate in policy making uh, because they can choose what actions they are willing to make as well as what actions they are willing to accept from the government. In this way, citizens are going to be motivated to a more environmentally friendly behaviour. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
and uh, we have many comments and because it's still on developing, uh, we, are go we are trying to um, uh, get uh, feedback okay, still. And adapt yeah. it accordingly. Yes, 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 okay. obviously. <laughs> ah, great. Okay, thanks. Any questions from the audience? I have one here in front. Yeah. Um, I mean, taking the same question one step further, and as a computer scientist, I would like to ask, uh, have you thought of involving citizens in the tool development also? I like a part, first of all, could be a participatory approach, but maybe even there are people engaged in coding clubs, etc., that could help in tool development. Have you thought of such things? That it's, uh, that it's very interesting, and I will uh, uh, discuss it with uh, the IT department of the university in Samos. That uh, it's, uh, yes, <laughs> because... Participatory is the first option, yes. Yes, yes, yes. But uh, we want to be open, and uh, we, ha we want uh, citizen science to participate as uh, much as they can. They can, yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and good suggestions. Any other? I think I saw a hand in the... No? Okay, here. Sorry, in the front. Yeah. Just very short question. Thank you very much for your presentation. How uh, can you describe how you kind of approach citizens to use a dashboard and really to be in the in your pilots? Maybe you can. Uh, give us we a short have done many workshops in each pilot city. And uh, in this workshop, they, we have presented the tools. It's not only the, the carbon footprint dashboard, but also the sensors that they, they, will, that we, they will use also to measure local air data. So we have many workshops is the main uh, thing so they can participate. Okay, thanks. Since you were very well in time, if there is another question, then um, yeah, okay. Hi, Anna Benavides from Natural History Museum in London. So talking about those workshops, what strategies in particular do you think that stimulate citizens' you know, encouragement to, to just use the dashboard? Thank you. In the workshops, because it's a more um, of the group of the pilot cities, uh, they, um, they are gathered there and uh, the, the people from the pilot cities are organizing the workshops. Uh, but uh, we have some uh, Mentimeter questions, for example, when we introduced the carbon footprint calculator and they can uh, s select uh, which things that they like and which things that they dislike, what other uh, domains that they want to add in the carbon footprint, for example. And uh, also if they use the sensors, they, if they find something difficult to understand or uh, to implement, so uh, in this way. Okay, and maybe there's a bit more time after the, the break to, uh, to discuss this as well. Thanks Thank you a lot. Very much. Um, yeah, and I would like to ask Claire Burnell. Ah, yeah, because we haven't uh, met yet. Uh, from the Museum National d'Histoire Naturelle, with the title of the presentation Tracing Citizen Science Based Biodiversity Indicators, Uses, influences and contributions to environmental public policy and your study is focusing on the actual use of these indicators by uh, poli policy makers if i'm correct is it working I, yes it is thank you uh, hello everyone uh, thank you for being here today my name is claire bernal and i would like to present the results from a sociological study that i conducted about the use of citizen science-based uh, biodiversity indicators for environment environmental policy so briefly my case study is constituted by um, a citizen science program a contributory citizen science program which is called vision nature and it has been managed for the, for the last 20 years by the um, National Natural History Museum in Paris. And now it is made up of about 15 biodiversity um, observatories. Some of them are targeted at the general public, but others are only for naturalists or for professionals. And in my study, I focus specifically on one observatory, which is the bird observatory, and it's called the stock. And what is special about this observatory is that 
thanks to the massive amount of data that's been collected in the last 20 years, um, the scientists at Vision Nature have been able to produce a biodiversity indicator from it, which is also called the stock. And you can see it right here, represented by a curve. And what we can see from this indicator is that we have lost about 24% of common specialist birds in the last 30 years. And I also included uh, that number for bats. It drops to minus 50% for bats uh, in France in the last, 20, uh, in the last uh, about 30 years. Um, so that's that for context. And then the interesting thing with this uh, bird observatory is that there have been several instances in the past 20 years where uh, this indicator has been massively relayed through the French media and hundreds and hundreds of articles were written about it. So you have an example here. In 2018, uh, after the press release, there were over 400 articles written on this matter. And that really brought biodiversity to the center of attention uh, in France. And the other interesting thing about this uh, indicator is that there is a demand uh, for it from the French administration because uh, the administration says that it is necessary for policy, for policy making because the, administ the administration has an obligation to rely on objective data. And that's because regulations and policies are based on objective data. And also, this indicator has a theoretically pretty clear path uh, ahead of it when it comes to its role within policymaking because it's appraised and published on an official website by a government agency which is called the National Observatory of Biodiversity. However, the whole reason why I even started this uh, study in the first place is because the scientists at Vision Nature had absolutely no idea what their indicators uh, became after they were published on that platform. And so my question uh, at the beginning of the study was then to what extent are they actually really used um, to guide or to inform policy making? And the goal of my study was to try and trace the trajectory of these indicators um, and to try and assess their exact role in environmental policy if they had any. And so to this aim, what I did was I conducted about 30 semi-structured interviews with different types of individuals. First, of course, I talked with the scientists at Vision Nature who produced the indicators. Then I went to see the French Office for Biodiversity who uh, appraises and publishes the indicators. And of course, I went to the Ministry of Ecology and I focused specifically on two um, departments which I thought would be most likely to use the indicators because of their missions, and that's the DEB, uh, which works on water resources and uh, biodiversity, and the SDES, which is a service that works on statistics and data, which includes biodiversity data. And I also interviewed uh, two um, environmental associations to see how they use the indicators and if that could potentially in the long run have an impact on public policy. And I completed that field work with an online survey um, uh, targeted at the local admi administration services to see uh, if the use of indicators were, was the same on the national and local scale. And this is when I tell you that this uh, field work was very, very challenging. It gave me a really hard time because um, very early on in the interviews, I realized that no one was really going to be able to give me any solid information on the use of the indicators. Every single person I talked to seemed to not really know what they were used for. And so I was getting very weak signals of their uses. And it seemed that that trajectory that I was talking about was not actually clear at all. It was very blurry and very confusing for everyone. And the main element that kept coming back in the interviews was that the people thought the indicators were too large and they were too general because they are on a national scale and they concern common species. And so everyone saw that as a reason why they didn't use them because according to them that made it difficult to link a specific cause to a decline in the indicator or to link a specific policy to a potential uh, positive impact on the indicators. And so the only clear use that I could actually uh, detect was in the annual performance report that the Ministry of Ecology sends to the Ministry of Budget. And here, the indicators are used as a way to um, request fundings by proving that the work that is done by the departments that work on biodiversity is efficient, that it is useful, and that it should keep being funded. And that's also true for the people who work at Vision Nature because they need funding in order to keep the observatories going, so they also use the indicators in that way. 
And that actually makes sense because in France, the administration is uh, more and more governed by um, performance logics and by ra rationalization. But so then my question became, if, um, if this is the only tangible use that I can find, then what's the use for these indicators? Especially because, like I said just now, this use by evaluating and monitoring public policies raises questions because the agent said, remember, that the causal link between a specific policy and an impact on the indicator is very difficult to make, actually. And when you go to the scientists who produce the indicators, they think that it's not a scientifically correct way of using, of using the indicator. So with that in mind, uh, what you have to consider when you're trying to understand the value of indicators is the influence that they can have when they're not directly used within the policy-making process. And so there, what I observed what, was that that mainly happens through communication and awareness raising about biodiversity loss um, to try and alert the general public. And that could very well have an influence in the long run on policy making because we know that public opinion can uh, impact in some way policy making. And that, that's especially true uh, with environmental policies. But unfortunately, that's not something that I had enough time to delve into during my study, but I think in the future it would be really worth looking into. So in conclusion, what I would really want to emphasize on here is that these uses and influence, influences, like I said, were not even remotely easy to pick up on during the interviews because the signals were very weak, because no one was able to tell me what they really were, and I had to really investigate to dig out this information. And that can be explained because these indicators um, take into account common species. So that means that if you want to use them to monitor your public policies, so if you, if you want to see if your policy has an impact on them, you need to be acting on a really large scale when it comes to your policies. You need to introduce some really significant changes. And that's really hard to do um, because in France, for example, we have a very fragmented way of seeing environmental issues and of making policies. Um, and a good example of that is that our uh, Ministry of Ecology and our Ministry of Agriculture are very separate entities and they struggle to work together even though their, their issues are indivisible from each other. So as long as we will lack this more transversal vision of environmental issues and of the way we make public policies, these indicators are sure to still be uh, underused. But we're in a context where biodiversity is declining. The indicators show us that anyone in this room can testify to that because we experience the fact that we've had really silent springs in the past few years. And so we need, it is vital that we take considerable steps towards using these indicators more. Because once we do, once they're actually and properly used within, within policy making, then that will mean that we're making real progress towards bending that indicator curve and towards protecting biodiversity. And finally, as an opening, and I will end on this, uh, I'd like to mention again the, the fact that I wasn't able to properly delve into the influence that the indicators have when they're uh, massively used in the media, uh, spread through the media. But I think it, it would really be uh, interesting to see how indicators, biodiversity indicators in general, uh, can, can influence policy making when they're massively spread through the media and they reach the public. Uh, so in the future, I think that could really be interesting and really complete the work that I've done here um, on policy making processes. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I guess I'll take any questions if you have any. Thanks a lot, uh, Claire. I think what you were stating uh, that uh, the, the French countryside will be very silent in 2018. Well, it will be more silent probably now as well. Yeah, and it has been for a while. And uh, yeah, yeah it, it will be more and more silent, I guess, every yeah. year until we act. Yeah, um, I see a question over there. Uh, hello, Thomas Kostet from uh, STU in Denmark. A very, very interesting presentation. Um, could you go a little bit into the awareness of the researchers towards these indicators? Are there a lack of awareness? Are there a skepticism? Could the research community do more to perhaps push the indicators? Uh, well, actually, I worked within the research lab that uh, manages the, uh, the citizen science program that makes the indicators. So they were the ones to ask me to conduct a study on this matter because they realized that they didn't know where the indicators went and what they were used for. So actually, yeah, they're, they're really interested in knowing how the indicators are helping um, policy making 
and to they're interested in how it, they could help more because now that they have the results because i presented the results to them um, the question now within the the research lab is really how we can uh, further push these indicators to really help and that's something that i also um, saw when i um, interviewed the um, environmental associations because they were saying that a way to make these indicators useful is to push them and to basically leave no choice to the government but to use these indicators because like i said if they use these indicators properly then if they want them to go back up they need to act on a really large scale so i think both the researchers the scientists and the environmental associations in the interviews told me the same thing that if we push these indicators then we can hold the government accountable for what they do and how they act to protect biodiversity Okay, we have one question there, one question over there, and I don't know if we have time for a question over here. But um. Hi, Linda Miderake from Ecologic Institute here in Berlin, and my question links to the one that was just asked. I was wondering if um, there are also discussions to change the indicators, because you mentioned that people thought they were a bit too general to, to actually use them, so are there discussions to maybe have more specific indicators that are e more easy to then, you know, lead to direct impacts maybe? Yes, that's a very good question. And I mentioned very briefly in the presentation and I couldn't go into detail into it, but I said that I looked also at a local level what was going on and how they used the indicators. And there we saw that they used the indicators way more at a local scale when they were very specific indicators that concern either a specific territory or a specific uh, species. The problem was that, and so that's very, there the, the indicators are very useful and they work because it's easy to make them go back up and so to check if your policies are useful. But the problem is that with that is that you're only acting on a very local scale. And so what we're thinking is, and that was said earlier in another presentation, but it needs to, to also come from the top. It needs to come from the bottom, but it also needs to come from the top, otherwise change will not happen, right? And so pushing bigger, um, indicators, even though the government tells us that they're too general, they're too large, that's what bothers them because it's difficult to make them go back up. And that's why actually they're maybe not perfect, but they're good tools because if we push them, then we hold the government uh, accountable and we say, well, they're here and you need to make the go back up. So act more and act on a larger scale. So yeah. Okay, thanks. There's another one over there. If you keep it short and answer short, we have also another question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, Poppy Lightman Fraser um, from Imperial College and Natural England in the UK. And it was very much linked to that question, actually. Really fascinating talk, and thank you. Um, and in, interestingly, in the early days of citizen science, I heard the question, what has policy got to do with it? So it's really fascinating to hear your take on that today. Um, and interesting to hear that from the Paris perspective, there is um, this challenge between a uh, disconnect between the indicators and that data journey to the end um, point of policies. Um, so I'm interested, is there willing from, from above um, for that process to be more streamlined and for um, the data to be collected to effectively roll into policies? And have you identified ways in which um, that could be done? Uh, really interesting questions. I think there is because everyone I talked to was saying that these indicators, especially because they come from citizen science data, um, all the people I met, uh, the agents from the, the Ministry of Ecology were saying that they were great tools and they should be used more, but the problem was that they weren't, um, they were too large or they were too general, like I was saying. So I think there, they are still, from, from what I understand and from the people I met, I think there are, there are still, um, divided between, yes, we want these indicators to be used more, but also the problem is, if we want to use them, we need to act on a larger scale, like I was saying, and that requires uh, means and budgets that these people don't necessarily have. Um, so I think they're really divided between we want to act, but also we don't, maybe we don't have the, the necessary means to do it. And also, as long as the administration will keep working the way it's working, which is very fragmented, the people in the Ministry of Ecology can't do much, I guess, if they don't work hand in hand with the Ministry of Agriculture, for example. Because for pesticides, it's not only the Ministry of Ecology that can act on pesticides. So I think for that to work, a good way would be for to have a more global way of doing policies in general and to understand that all of this is 
systemic and that we need to, if we act on pesticides, then several ministries are going to be involved and they need to work together. Okay, thanks. As a chair, I would not consider this as a short question and a short answer. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm sorry we parked the last question. So maybe but anyone in the can break. come and talk to me. So my name is Claire Bernal. So again, if we see each other and in the few next few days, we can talk. There's yeah. No thanks a lot, Claire. Thank you. And I would like, last but not least, introduce the last speaker. speaker. Ah, okay. Um, Stephanie Chow, and she has the shortest title of us all. Mapping sand mining, and, uh, and I think we heard a lot already uh, mentioning the name uh, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme. Very happy that you're here presenting UNEP as well, and I think on a very important topic that needs more attention. So Thank the floor so is yours. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the fact that I'm the last speaker of this morning's session after a series of very interesting um, presentations. So thanks for bearing with me. But before I jump right in with my presentation, I need to give you a heads up. Um, so with two things. One, um, I'm about to present to you the biggest sustainability challenge that you probably haven't heard of till now. And secondly, I am not here to present a citizen science project, but instead I'm here to present the opportunity to co-create with me, with us, this project as we uh, tackle the issue. And the issue here is sand, and more specifically, the extraction of sand. So when we think about sand, you think about a beach, perhaps you got to spend a week or two over the summer, sunny, nice beaches. But when we think about sand extraction, this is um, something that you're more likely to see. This is a sand quarry where a massive amount of sand is extracted uh, from the, the quarry, can be extracted from rivers, um, or you have laborers in certain regions of the world with a shovel, they load up a truck, and um, overnight a beach might disappear. So the question would be, why does this matter? So maybe this is a great opportunity for me to introduce myself. Well, my name is Stephanie and the organization that I represent, we are a GRID center in Geneva at the United Nations Environment Program. So GRID, the Global Resource Information Database, where our main role is to transform data, mainly geospatial data, into information and knowledge so that we could inform and support decision making for environmental issues. Now, why does this matter? It matters because sand is the foundation on which our uh, modern civilization is built. Um, think about the building we're sitting in right now, the roads you took to come to this conference, the airport you flew uh, out of and uh, from to get to Berlin. Land reclamation, um, as we look at rapid urbanization and the need to accommodate a growing urban population, this is the map of a Singapore and it shows here how Singapore has grew over 23% from 1973 to 2018. Singapore is not an exception. Um, a lot of places are actually um, dredging sand and needing sand for uh, coastal protection, for land reclamation, like I said, especially in the light of um, uh, sea level rise and climate change. So think about all the mega cities around the world, think about all the infrastructure we need, the, the dams, the tunnels, the roads, um, the the, even the, uh, the, think about how they lie in low-lying areas uh, along the coast. So we are extracting a lot of sand, and in fact the construction industry it makes up for the biggest demand of sand, um, because as it turns out, concrete is 25%, about 25% sand and 50% gravel. So together, aggregates, sand, gravels, and crushed rock, we dig up about 50 billion tons of sand. So to give you um, a context, since we're in Berlin, uh, if we were to compact all the material and build a wall, uh, we will have a wall 27 meter thick and uh, at a height of 27 meters that can go around the globe, uh, around the equ equator every year. That's a lot, of, a lot of information. And I haven't even got onto why you should care and what am I doing here at a citizen science conference. So you should care because sand is, sand in the, uh, in, 
generally aggregates is the most mined solid material from Earth. And if we're digging up so much stuff from, the, uh, from, from Earth, there must be environmental and social consequences. So this is a picture from Cambodia where a family disappeared overnight um, because their home and uh, was washed away due to erosion. Um, so we're looking at uh, land erosion, we're looking at uh, contamination of drink, fresh drinking water, loss of livelihoods. But we also have to think about the people um, that extract those sand. So as much as in many parts of Europe, it's a very regulated industry. In many parts of the world, uh, we depend on artisanal small-scale miners to actually get those sand, and they work in very dangerous environment and circumstances, and people have lost their lives um, in the process of mining sand. And I've talked about how sand uh, relates to us uh, people, but let's not forget that sand plays a very important role in the environment. Um, so we're looking at ecosystem services, such as uh, providing breeding grounds for the fish, um, water filtration, coastal resilience. Um, and you know, you see some solar panels, you see some um, wind turbine there because they are also very key to um, renewables. And last thing is, a lot of the infrastructure that we need, especially in light of a uh, population increase, has not been built. Now, I've given you the lowdown of the issue, so now I'm gonna go into what do we need to do and how can citizen science help, and specifically what you can do to help us. So, we have received a mandate from the United Nations um, Environment Assembly to expand on the scientific knowledge of sand extraction. So one of the things that we're doing, for example, is that we're monitoring sand being mined from the seas. We can do that because we can track uh, dredge, dredging vessels that can tell us with the help of an AI where they're doing it, how they're doing it, how much is being extracted. So that's all good. The tricky thing is terrestrial sand extraction. Um, and We've been working with a lot of local communities because this issue is pretty global. You see it happening at the very local context, but everywhere. Sand is extracted everywhere because it's such a strategic and key resource. And two things that we've been observing is that, as you can see, the picture on your right is a group of women who are organizing in Sri Lanka to push back because they realize that when they're out collecting water, drinking water, um, that it's becoming contaminated due to sand mining activities uh, on, the, on the river. And another thing is that we've seen many NGOs are giving out or actually organizing some sorts of citizen science projects by giving out, let's say, this GPS device to geolocate where the sand extraction is happening. So it's slowly happening, but we need more information. We need to know where we are, we are extracting sand and how much. And it's hard to keep track. In Europe, the industry works pretty hand in hand with the government, they, re they report, they produce statistics, but in many regions of the world, not so much. What do we have to consider, I, in my opinion, and I'm very keen to talk to you about this, uh, when we think about how do we possibly could monitor sand extraction using citizen science. One thing is that sand extraction happens above ground. With uh, satellite imagery, we can see a lot, actually, if we know where to look. The issue here is that it's happening um, in places that we, we, for example, at UNAP Grid wouldn't know where to look, uh, but perhaps local communities would know because they are right there in the action. Another thing to consider is that it's, like, as I've mentioned, governance, if any at all, for this sector is very weak. So it's very informal. Uh, we have people uh, whose livelihood is also dependent on the sand extraction itself. So perhaps that's a potential area of conflict. That's why I am here and I'm asking you to help us. This is a QR code. Uh, it will take you to a short, short Google form where I've provided some links if you're interested. But more importantly, I want to know um, if you have any ideas, if there are any important questions that we need to be asking as we design this uh, citizen science project, um, or if you have any examples that you think, hey, you need to talk to these people who are actually doing really cool things out there. So that's why I'm here. Uh, and if you see me today, please grab me and say, I need to talk to you about this great idea. Uh, I'm here the whole day, and it would be my pleasure to talk to you. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.
I think your plea is, is quite clear, uh, the help us. The QR code didn't work when I tried to take a picture of it, so that's oh. something to... Uh, okay. And I think, of course, you are here at the right moment yeah. in time and the right place, because there are so many people trying to look at how can we use citizen science in, in topics like this. So, from my personal point of view at the University of Twente, uh, we really like to start the discussion as well, uh, since we have a lot of expertise in the fields that you were mentioning, so that's that's one, but we can do it afterwards. We have in Switzerland, since you're based in Switzerland, there is a citizen science uh, group in, in Switzerland as well, based in Zurich, so yeah. I don't know if you're in contact already. So I think there are a lot of connections which can help you a bit further. But looking at the audience and also knowing that coffee is waiting for us and the break yes. is waiting for us, uh, are there urgent questions? Or not uh, urgent questions, also possible? Because we have time, yeah, we have one over there. I'll just quickly... Hi, I'm Lucy Robinson from the Natural History Museum in London. Hi, Lucy. Um, I'm just going to suggest some colleagues that you might like to talk to at UCL, University College London. Mm -hmm. um, they've developed an app called Sapelli, which um, they've used with local communities in Africa, I think, um, with non-literate communities reporting where they see deforestation or illegal hunting and things like that. Um, and so it's a, an app that might be good that you could adapt to a similar kind of thing if you're looking for local communities to report um, activities. Thank you. It's very helpful. It would be a pleasure. Maybe I could grab you before you leave. Any other there. suggestions or questions for Stephanie right now? No, I think then let's use this time to have the break and for people to uh, talk to you. Fantastic. So thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank um, you. Thanks a lot for all the speakers who were here and uh, contributed. <laughs> this was the first oral session, so there's still a lot to come. We have two days ahead of us. A bit of self-promotion. We are involved in the project incentive in which we're building four citizen science hubs throughout Europe. So we are presenting, and there's also uh, on top of it Citizen Lab, that is specifically on citizen science for health. Researchers are presenting as well. So um, I would like you to invite us to come and visit our researchers. Okay, have a good break, and thanks.
Hello everyone, a very big welcome to our session today, which is amazing. It's jam-packed full of amazing people who are going to be talking to you about citizen science and education. I am a punctual timekeeper. I, I really like to keep on top of things. So I'm going to start with our first speaker today, who is Zakarenia Dasalaki, and she's going to be talking about the pedagogical, well, pedagogical use of PlantNet with young researchers. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Easy. Yeah, that's fine. Good morning. I'm Zaharina Daskalaki, and I am here on behalf of the Environmental Education Lab, a research unit based at the Department of uh, Educational Studies of the National and Capodistrian University of Athens in Greece. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, to present part of uh, the work we are conducting under the European Cost for Cloud project. This is a three-year Horizon 2020 project coordinated by the Spanish Research Council with 15 partners, nine well-known European citizen observatories. Platforms are involved in the Cost for Cloud project. And our role is to promote, set up, implement, and evaluate citizen science activities that uh, make use of uh, citizens' observatories which participate in the project through integration into school-based uh, environmental education for sustainability practices. In this school-based citizen science project, we use one of the citizen observatories, which is PlantNet, for plant species identification and regarding. The total duration of um, the educational scenario was eight teaching hours. Three of them were dedicated to field research in the National uh, Garden of Athens. The scenario was designed by Environmental Education Lab in order to promote uh, community action and foster environmental and digital uh, literacy for 14 first grade students and their parents. Let's see now the structure and faces Okay, sorry. Let's see now the structure and phases of the scenario. The scenario started um, with an inter, 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 introduction to the concepts and principles of citizen science, to issues related to plant biodiversity biodiversity and how to use the planet application. The next phase involved the field uh, visit where participants were divided into four groups and they followed an environmental path to regard the plants with planted up. The phase was completed by sharing the collected data among the groups the students' research continued at the school as students seeked more information about the plants, um, the, the plants uh, they regarded, uh, and uh, thus uh, we were to lead to the creation of one um, phytology alphabet, which uh, presented to the school community. Here we can see the multiple roles of uh, the participants. I, as a teacher and researcher, by giving uh, the necessary information and uh, instructions, um, I was also a researcher by serving uh, the participants' experience. Students became uh, citizen scientists uh, collecting data and using PlantNet, but uh, they were also uh, intergenerational ambassadors as they motivated their parents 
to participate in this action. So pa their parents uh, were supporters of their children's efforts and they were co-learners with their parents at the same time. Now, um, let's listen, uh, let's listen to their words, their own words. As uh, far as the learning project is concerned, the collected data analysis point out the emotional uh, response and cognitive uh, development. I felt proud uh, during the action, says student Swan. I didn't expect that the plant net app could recognize flowers, says students too. I noticed the uh, plant net plants of National Garden, which I hadn't noticed before, says parent two. And uh, as says uh, students three, all participants learn more about the plant names. Um, the activity seems to have acted as um, a starting point for sub subsequent plant exploration activities as participants indicated uh, that they will continue to use PlantNet. Uh, students and parents characterized uh, their experience as unique, fun, in interesting and uh, educational. And uh, the tool itself as uh, easy to use. The difficulties uh, they inquired uh, were related to the Latin names of the plants uh, in the app and the weather conditions as uh, it was an outdoor action. The interaction between uh, the, part the participants uh, was intense and uh, this is uh, proved by their words they worked as a team by taking rules, working together, and having a common vision, a common goal. Uh, this is a, so this is a case study, shows the potential, uh, the potential of the synergies between uh, environmental educational, education uh, for sustainability and citizen science. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Zakarina. I, I have to say, I think your photographs are stunning. I, I loved them so much. Do we have thank any you. questions for Zakarina, please? I will start. I was wondering a little bit about um, your you talked about your phytology alphabet, and I wondered if you had any more feedback from how the other students perceived the phytology alphabet that the students made. You know, the, maybe the students who were not involved in the plant net process. Uh, yes, um, um, we could um, collect more information about this action, and. Um, uh, in the future, we could um, uh, do further research, um, and I think it's uh, worth it uh, because we can see that um, um, children and uh, generally participants um, like uh, to participate in this action, mm -hmm. uh, there are interaction, uh, they want to be active, uh, active members of our yeah. society. Of course. Yeah. Okay, cool. Do we have any other questions? I see a hand there. Can you please use the mic? Thank you. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I'm Ninka from Leiden University. I was wondering what was the specific goal of the children in the lesson? Did they, uh, was the goal to learn how the app worked or to find um, as many plans as possible? Yes, uh, the general goal of this action is um, to um, 
um, participate uh, the, uh, the, um, to empower uh, our students to participate uh, in this action. Um, we um, didn't uh, uh, want to uh, write, to, to write, to record uh, um, many plans, but we want uh, to take. Uh, we want our students take their own environmental path and record the plans that they want to record. Uh, that uh, the plans that uh, uh, were interesting for them. So it was an effort. It was uh, uh, for uh, children and by children. Okay, I think, yeah, we've got five more minutes, so we've got time for one more question, maybe, if anyone... Yes, sorry, I see your hand there. Hi, I've noticed that you work with underaged participants, so I have two, so under 18, and I have two questions. How do you collect their consent? for working with you, what kind of challenges do you have in that, what kind of solutions. And uh, second, secondly, um, as you work with, uh, with this group of participants, if you have any specific challenges in uh, legal and safety, for example, you go out in nature to protect them against possible accidents and how you solve the liability of your institution for such unfortunate and I hope not uh, the cases that are not happening. Uh, yes. Um, did you ask me about the age of participants? I... So yeah, parents, the parents give you permission to work with, your, with the, ah, the teenage, okay. the Oops. students. And yes. did you have any problems getting that permission? No, no. Uh, yes, yes. Um, yes. Um, we uh, we have the support uh, of uh, our children's uh, parents. Um, they support uh, all the process. Uh, they were co-learners. Uh, they were there to support uh, children's uh, effort. Uh, their children's efforts, and. Um, uh, they want uh, to see, uh, to watch uh, their uh, interact, their children's interaction with uh, their um, friends. But you don't formally collect their con consent, like a written consent that the parents agree in the name of their children to participate in your project. Yes, we do. Uh. Sorry. Yes, we did. We have written concern, concerned uh, uh, forms uh, assigned by the parents and, of course, by the school administrators and the deputy mm. of the school. And moreover, the parents were together with the children, with the students in the, in the actual action. They were there uh, also to guarantee their safety outside the school premises. So everything was a participative uh, action with the parents as well. Yes? Uh, I think that I didn't say something uh, important. Uh, children and parents uh, helped us uh, for data collections because children and parents um, participated uh, with uh, uh, their views. Uh, we were regarding, I was regarding, uh, by completing an open-ending uh, reflective uh, questionnaire. Um, and uh, I uh, take notes by, uh, by my role uh, as a teacher and researcher. Heidi, I see your hand. I think we're very close on time. So if it's a quick question, please use the mic. Uh, Press the button. Hello. I actually just wanted to, the, the question I was going to ask was about the parents because I was so impressed that you were working mm -hmm. with the parents as well as the children together and that you had interviews with the parents, not just the children. So I wondered if the fact that you involved the parents seemed to make a difference in, in sort of your success of your project. 
Uh, yes, it, it was um, a chance uh, to communicate more and uh, uh, more between uh, children and parents and uh, uh, they, I think that they enjoy uh, their day uh, because they had uh, many uh, things to do in this day, but they cancelled and they tried to be here to support them. That's and uh, uh, we, I think that the photos um, uh, was, uh, uh, were um, uh, helped uh, yeah. to I understand it. For sure. I, I'm unfortunately going to have to wrap up, but I, I think your point on getting the parents involved is really important yeah. and is one we should all be thinking and talking about more. Thank you very much, Sakharenia, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is going to be Dusan Misevich, and he's going to be talking about science literacy in evolution. Would you like this mic? Yes, I would. Perfect. Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, I'm really happy to be here. I didn't expect this big call and uh, a wonderful spot just after coffee but long if before lunch so no one's, no one's too hungry and everybody is well caffeinated. Uh, so, this is gonna be a bit different uh, because I'm not gonna tell you about a specific citizen science project. Uh, so we're not collecting anything, we're not uh, uh, tagging anything. It's more of a meta study, it's more of a um, opinion piece, if you will, that we put together that I wanted to share with you. And what's really important is to, to point out, I'm presenting this, but it's been a work of many, many people. Uh, the main actors are listed, uh, listed here, and two of them are actually also at this conference. Uh, so Tanya Jenkins and Claire Narway are also here. They're giving talks about their own work. Find them in the program, go check them out. Uh, they're doing great things. Um, so. Also, disclaimer, uh, this, or acknowledgement, I should say, this has been done in the co context of a cost action called EuroCitizen, um, which is building on scientific literacy and evolution. So you can check out uh, what's happening in that cost action, and you can still join. We're still going for, uh, for a few more months. Uh, I'm Dusan Mishevich, Dula Mishevich. I'm from a funny little place in Paris called the Learning Planet Institute. Um, we do a lot of things, but learning and, and collective intelligence is sort of the primary focus. Anyway, what I'm going to tell you about today is about promoting scientific literacy in evolution through citizen science. So if we go into it, the problem that we saw, or sort of the opportunity, if you will, is that uh, evolution is generally poorly understood. So. This is impairing our ability to solve societal problems. So when you, when you look at the plenary talk this morning and you think about how we deal with climate change, how we deal by, with biodiversity, you kind of need evolution in there. And maybe I'm biased, I'm an evolutionary biologist, so everything only makes uh, sense in the light of evolution and all, all those quotes that you've heard before. Uh, but I do really believe that, and I do really think that if we want to talk about biodiversity lo loss, if we want to talk about GMOs and what does it do to the environment, doing that outside of the context of evolution doesn't really make sense. So on one hand, we have the need of knowledge of evolution in the societal discourse. On the other hand, we have citizen science. Uh, so we believe that citizen science is a very good context in which we can talk about this. However, when we sort of looked around us, we saw that there are very few citizen science projects that actually deal directly, explicitly with evolution. So we're gonna do a little test. Um, if you have ever ran or participated in running a citizen science project, can you raise your hand? Okay, wonderful. Now, keep, 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 keep them up, keep them up. So if, uh, if your project had to do with ecology or environment, continue keeping your hand up, otherwise drop your hand. So, okay, so now we have all the ecology environment projects. Now, if your project referenced evolution somewhere in the description, keep holding your hand. All right, yes, my demonstration worked. So out of all the hands, there was, I believe, four of them that stayed up. You can put them down now, thank you. Um, so we did a similar type of metric uh, using SkySarter, you all know it as a meta platform for citizen science projects, and we kind of got the same, roughly the same ratio. 
there's a lot of projects. A lot of them are in ecology and evolution, actually. We, we love collecting photographs, classifying bees, nature, it's great. But very few of them relate to the subject of evolution directly, even though you know all the biodiversity ones actually do, but they just maybe don't say it. And then what's not on the slide, but very few of them talk about the learning opportunities. Uh, so I think we found sort of one or two that do it explicitly. So what we wanted to do is to figure out a way how to bridge this gap or take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, before going into that, uh, evolution is not easy to deal with. And those of you who are evolutionary biologists uh, know it very well. Uh, so there are a lot of barriers to learning evolution. And if you're constructing a citizen science project, you're gonna have to deal with that. So I can quickly go through sort of the main ones we identified. Uh, so there's a lot of misconceptions about evolution out there. You know, these kind of um, graphics that we love and that are very cute but are not actually true. Uh, we also have too many movies about mutants. That, so that's not how it really works. Um, we also have a lot of communication problems. And it starts with this sort of theory of evolution. And evolution is just a theory which you've all heard. There's a different one that I like, um, which is really simple. We, in evolution, one of the key concepts is fitness. How do you translate fitness uh, without imagining someone going to the gym? And uh, when, I, when I gave my first talk in Serbia, and I'm, I'm Serbian originally, but I studied elsewhere, I had to look up the word, and it turned out they're using adaptive value, uh, which is really weird and uh, not quite the same, it feels. So there is a communication between scientists, but also between the public and the scientist. And then there are all sorts of conflicting culture or values that, that the general public may have, from the religion side of things, which may or may not be a problem, uh, to how educated the public is, how educated are the scientists, what is their socioeconomic status. All this may affect how they perceive evolution and how, how are they gonna learn about it, and in turn, it's gonna affect how the citizen science project that's trying to teach them this needs to be constructed. So, um, okay, we want to teach them about evolution. What do we actually want to teach them about? And so this is where we had help from a number of great colleagues who are education scientists. So this is now a little bit outside of my expertise, but I learned a lot in the process. Uh, so there are sort of three types of knowledge that I intuitively probably would have come up on my own. Uh, so you can think about content knowledge, and this is fairly obvious. So you want them to know about natural selection, you want them to know about sort of key concepts in, in evolution. Cool, that's easy, that, that's obvious. Then you have something that we call procedural knowledge, which is really, you know, how do you collect the data? Uh, how do you do, a, how do you analyze that data? Uh, how do you actually do the research in evolution and how do we gain this knowledge in evolution? There's a lot of procedures, so if you will, this is what you learn in a practical course, for example, as your student. Then there is also an epistemic knowledge, and this is a bit more subtle. Uh, so it's more about understanding the nature of science in general and the nature of scientific process and in this case the nature of how do we study evolution so those three i, I think are reasonably obvious the last one that i think is also important that we added is about knowledge application so even when you know all this being able to apply these concepts on sort of real world examples is important so how do you go from I know how natural selection works to I understand something about COVID news that I'm reading every day. Uh, so we believe that all four are important and we believe that all four can be taught through the citizen science projects. And so I'm gonna go through a couple of examples of learning opportunities for evolution that could, could rise up in citizen science projects and also briefly mention sort of some considerations what, what may work, what may not work. Um, one way of approaching it is you can, you can have a co-design. Uh, you can have a co-design process. You can involve participants in developing your research questions. Uh, you can involve them in data collection, analysis, and nature of science uh, type discussions. You can, um, have, uh, you can do it through communication, which can be unidirectional, bidirectional. It's kind of sort of teaching. It can be a dialogue. And last but not the least, and there are many talks, I think, that, that deal, deal with this here, uh, 
your citizen science project can be gamified. Uh, in all cases, there are things to worry about and things to, uh, to be mindful. I like the gamification example because I really like this approach, but it's very easy to oversimplify. It's very easy to have a game that's simple to play, simple to understand, but then we end up with some weird tree of life that just showed up or some kind of a shortcut that doesn't really work. So, um, we're getting towards the end. This would be kind of the conclusion slide. Uh, and the idea of our work, uh, which got published in a paper, which I'll tell you about in a minute, is to kind of provide a compendium for people who may be citizen scientists but want to in include evolution, or who may be evolutionary biologists who want to include citizen science. Uh, so it should apply to many. Uh, and these are the steps that we believe are important. You should clearly define what are the learning goals and what are the opportunities to address them. Then you need to design these things, and we know this is not, uh, this is not trivial. Go find, uh, go find a buddy. Go find someone who is an education scientist, or if you are an education scientist, go find an evolutionary biologist. They'll be probably happy to, to work with you and work on such a project. And last but not the least, which I am not talking a lot in this presentation, but that's really crucial, and our learning science colleagues that worked on this project uh, were very, uh, very interested about, let's say, uh, is you need to assess the learning outcomes. It's great to say, oh, I'm going to teach you about evolution, and uh, by doing this evolution citizen science project, you actually learn something. What did you learn? Uh, did this actually work, or did it just make us feel better and it was fun for everybody? Um, so, to help people do this, because no one has time, no one has funding typically for these type of things. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll finish in one minute. Uh, we have some concrete guidelines in, in the paper that got published, so really trying to match people with resources. So examples of measurements and instruments that you can use, uh, tons of references. Uh, this is the paper. It was done between three different cost actions besides your citizen. We started in Berlin a little bit more than two years ago. And there's a QR code for the paper. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dusan. I'd like to open the floor to questions. I can see a couple. Uh, yes, the gentleman just up there in the middle, please. Yeah, you. Thank you for the presentation. I've seen in, in your slides that you dedicated some attention to cognitive outcomes and instrumental outcomes that I think you, you, you named them as a uh, uh, procedural knowledge. I haven't noticed an attention given to the affective outcomes of a learning process. So this is going to be a little bit about outside of my expertise. Can you tell me what affective outcomes are? Uh, affective like in affection. So when you are in an education process, you also mm -hmm. try to modify the affection of people towards or against a, a process. Okay, sure. Thank you. Sorry. Um, no, I. I haven't talked about it, and I'm not sure we talk about it in the paper directly. Uh, I, this is not to say it's not important. Uh, I think in, in different citizen science projects where, which are more playful, which are more gamified, uh, the affection or the attitude towards the subject and towards the, the class changes. So I think I can argue that that's one avenue to, to respond to, uh, to your question. Thank you. Have we got any other questions? We've got one more question. Time for one more question. I see a hand just over there, Luigi. Um, <clears throat> thanks. I, I found the, your presentation very interesting, and uh, I have a lot of respect for uh, uh, increasing um, literacy in evolution. And I was wondering, uh, when you talk about evolution, maybe I missed it, if you're talking about past evolution, like, natural evolution, also future evolution, which would be guided a lot by intelligent design, not the intelligent design. No, that not that intelligent no, design, Not that intelli <laughs> intelligent design of, of let's say, uh, our, our scientists. So it, it is also, all this is also about future evolution and how it can change with respect to past evolution? It's, it's a very good point. Thank you for the question. Um, I think we generally talked about evolution 
as a whole and didn't make a distinction between understanding the past versus dealing with the present, let's say COVID, versus predicting the future and talking about evolution of future diseases. But I think... I might uh, suggest that you continue this uh, conversation yes, afterwards course. just because we're trying to keep to time. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Please join me in thanking Dusan. Just leave it there. Uh, our next speaker is Heidi Ballard, who is going to be talking about mini scientists in environmental science. Thank you, Thank you very much. This is on. Um, uh, I will do this. Can you make it be like this? Is that good? Uh, just because I'm going to be clawing at the podium. So thank you very much for having me. Um, so far, I'm very excited about this compilation of talks because I think we're all quite related. Um, and so far, um, uh, I'm going to be talking about young people, children and, and young people all the way to the age of 18. And um, this is a sort of a culminating talk for a, a culminating paper for a large project we had across multiple natural history museums to look at informal learning. So this is the research on informal you know, learning settings, science learning settings by young people participating in community, what we call community and citizen science. So. Just as a brief uh, context, um, this is the center. I come from the Center for Community and Citizen Science in uh, California at UC Davis in the School of Education. And we have a whole bunch of folks now that are all working towards these big outcomes using research-based excellence um, to help design and evaluate and study community and citizen science. Um, so, the, the magical thing about this project is that we had the opportunity to look at uh, three different, you know, as we've said, there are many, many, many studies and evaluation projects that focus on particular settings or particular projects, but we were able to look at multiple projects across multiple settings, including strictly online, the, the Zooniverse uh, platform was our example of that, and um, short-term field-based projects, which basically were bio blitzes in our context uh, for that the museums put on, and uh, field-based ongoing. We worked on these terms very hard. They're longer-term monitoring projects where young people were participating over time, not just one event, but repeated uh, opportunities and sessions. And so um, we were at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, the Los Angeles Natural History Museum, um, Museum Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County uh, in LA, and the London Natural History Museum. And my colleagues are here. And I should have mentioned that back, back. Anna benavides Lanstein is here, who is the lead author on this paper. But I have the privilege of giving the talk because she has other fish to fry. Um, so there are many um, uh, co-authors in the audience right now, and I would be happy for them to help answer questions at the end. I'm representing a very large team. Uh, and so these were our research questions, and they were, um, in what ways do youth develop, I will explain environmental science agency in a minute, in what ways do youth develop environmental science agency through participation in field-based and online community and citizen science settings, and how did the design features of those programs uh, support that environmental science agency, both like kind of looking for universal features of community and citizen science that promote this learning and specific to the settings. And environmental science agency is the way we encapsulated basically <laughs> everything we care about that young people might learn through participation in environmental community and citizen science projects. So it's a big one. It covers a lot of constructs, but I've been seeing a lot of talks today, so far even, that cover a lot of constructs. So I do not get to unpack them today for you very much, but I'm happy to talk with you afterwards about it. So the, the big pieces of environmental science agency are the, the top bubble is um, sort of science content knowledge, science inquiry practices and skills, the understanding the norms of science, that's what we're hoping kids will learn by participating, right? Um, the second box in the, or sort of the purple circle is, um, Sorry, the blue uh, circle is identity and thinking about like this is one of these outcomes that often are very difficult to measure but that we care very much about. How do people identify with science? Do they see themselves in science? Um, do they see themselves as part of the scientific community and having a future using science? Um, and then the third bubble is agency with science, particularly with this 
community and citizen science practices that they're learning? Do they, do they see themselves, do they enact going out and using those skills elsewhere? I mean, traditionally some people call that transfer, but it's like when young people pursue something with these science practices that they've learned. That's what we're talking about with agency. So I will, that's, I just explained all that. And so um, we, uh, in this case, we have, you know, we have different papers, which you may have seen from many of my colleagues on the team that focused on one of the settings, just on Zooniverse, or just on iNaturalist, or just on BioBlitzes, or just on the ongoing programs. But this one, we took each of those and we made a case out of each of those settings, uh, short-term BioBlitzes, monitoring programs, and Zooniverse. And particularly for the uh, California Academy of Sciences, the ongoing program was an after school club, a science action club that where the kids used specifically a project called Bug Safari to find bugs, identify them, bugs, I said that, insects, to find insects, forgive me scientists of the world, um, uh, to find insects uh, and identify them and submit the data uh, on, using iNaturalist, um, but, in this, but it was facilitated in groups with tools and instruction and things like that. Um, big seaweed search at the Natural History Museum in London was uh, looking, uh, it was opportunistic citizen science across the UK on the coast side, coasts looking at seaweed and identifying, being able to identify classic types of seaweed and the research that the Natural History Museum scientist was doing on climate change and ocean acidification that, you know, using the seaweed as an indicator. And so in this case, it was um, a girl guides group that was implementing and doing that in a facilitated way over several visits. Um, and uh, the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles ongoing project was Super Project, which is totally not descriptive, um, but it's the, a project where families do um, use iNaturalist to investigate the organisms in their backyard, uh, document plants and insects and wildlife in their backyards and in their neighborhoods in a way that connects them to the curators at the museum. And sometimes they even come to their house and set up weather stations or you know pan traps in their backyards. So, um, oh, so just quickly, our methods were, I mean, this is super intensive. I'm going as fast as I can without being completely incoherent. But the, um, the first, let's see, yes. So the first, um, the data was a little different. We tried to use, you know, as much aligned, consistent data across all the programs and settings as we could. But with, we were able to do, um, the bio blitzes were super short. They were like only a couple of hours sometimes. So we couldn't do interviews. So for field-based ongoing programs, those projects I just described, we got to do post interviews as well as pre and post surveys and um, observations of the kids participating in the program every time, like for three to five sessions. And uh, so that was like our super deluxe data set. And we chose, we selected kids for this part of the study that had all that data. So we had lots of kids that ended up, we had attrition, didn't have all the things, but, in, but for this study we focused on sort of case study kids that had all that data. For the bio blitzes, we had just the observation of the event and the pre post surveys. And for the online settings, we had, um, again, the super deluxe uh, pre and post surveys interviews after the, they'd participated in the program for a year, and um, log files in that case to look at their participation in the programs. So that's a summary of those focal youth. FY is focal youth that we had as these magical kids that had um, all of those data for each of those cases. So we had a total of t uh, 32 kids that we were looking at with this in-depth data. And um, we coded all of the qualitative data um, using uh, qualitative coding with a priori, a priori codes, like things we drew from the literature about identity and agency and science con content, and things that also bubbled up, inductive codes that bubbled up from the data. Um, we coded for those three big aspects of ESA learning. Yeah yellow card, um, and uh, how they participated specifically, and the setting features that were present, particularly those facilitators. Sometimes it was parents, like that's why I highlighted the parent thing. Sometimes parents were right there, sometimes the kids were by themselves in an after school club wandering around with their facilitators there. 
So basically the upshot, not gonna give you all the big details, but the upshot is, um, of course, not all focal youth engaged in all types of science practices, but most of them, many of them participated in most of those science practices of observing and documenting and recording. Um, not all developed all components of ESA, but we found some key key design features of citizen science in general and in particular settings that I want to tell you about. Sadly, exactly the opposite of our first talk, I do not have photos of children participating in these awesome programs. I have quotes, which I'm going to run out of time to tell you. So those were some really beautiful, beautiful vignettes of children talking about in their post interviews or in their surveys about what they learned and how they learned it and how they had gained agency, sort of how they had pursued their interests by joining other programs on uh, projects on Zooniverse or how they had joined um, um, uh, other citizen science projects or were t uh, teaching their parents how to look for seaweed um, or teaching their s younger sibling about how to identify, um, I believe it was insects in the, uh, their younger siblings using um, iNaturalist. So, so much evidence, so much evidence. Um, but I'm gonna go jump to the point about how our findings lead us to think about these sort of maybe these universal features of community and citizen science projects bounded the way that we've talked about them um, for design uh, to promote that sense of kids pursuing their own interests using the science skills that they've gained, which is what we want in a lot of the, that's the point in a lot of these programs. I censored myself. Um, so in terms of the disciplinary focus and the sci having really close disciplinary focus and scientific practices, um, I'm going to say that uh, you have to instruct them on how to use the tools. Tools were key. Scientific tools made all the difference. The more that kids can touch and hang on to and become expert at and teach others about the tools that they're using for the scientific investigation, the better. Um, the CCS framing, making sure that students, making sure young people understand how their activities of the day, running around with a bug net catching in sex contributes to, to a scientific question that's being answered. That's, that gives them the agency and the ownership over the data and the responsibility that they're feeling to collect good data because someone's gonna really use it. Um, and you have to situate it in that whole scientific process. Uh, working with others really did seem to matter. Um, designing for opportunities for kids to create, to pursue different roles in projects. Even we found, saw that even in bio blitzes, the, the, those, key kids that had agency to move from one role to another and really saw themselves becoming expert even over the course of a few hours in being the finder of insects under logs or being the one who really takes good photographs to be able to send them on a naturalist. That those, those roles and opportunities to develop new roles is really the learning goal we're going for. And so the end. Um, no, so um, we found that uh, the, the, those particular affordances that citizen science allows for um, developing environmental science agency uh, can be a catalyst for significant changes in environmental actions as youth explore their relationship with environment and science. And the last thing is, I have stuff. Um, we have a knowledge sharing guide that is awesome and heavy and so, oh, but not that heavy when there's only one at a time. So that we have stacks of them in the back on the tables and anyone that's, like we really have been studying this for a long time. So if anybody has any interest in facilitating young people learning, yeah, time is up on the we've got Heidi. these for you. I think we probably don't even have time for questions. So join me in thanking oh, Heidi. Thank you. There is. I, I'm just going to give a side plug because Heidi actually mentioned identity um, and something that was created yesterday in the Empowerment, uh, Inclusiveness and Equity group was a zine and many of the questions there were exploring identity that should be available on the EXO website from tomorrow onwards. So I am really excited to introduce you to our next speaker, Maria Dascolia.
There you are, Maria. So if you join us, Maria is going to be telling us about integrating citizen science into school environmental education. Hi, I'm Maria Dascolia. I'm uh, an associate professor uh, of environmental and sustainability education at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, Greece. And I'm here with you today uh, to present you uh, the uh, strategy and the supporting actions for uh, integrating citizen science um, into school environmental education, uh, which is a task that uh, is part uh, of a larger project, a European project, uh, Cost for Cloud uh, European project. Um, I'm here with uh, uh, several members of our team, the NKUA team, um, who conceived and put into practice this uh, general strategy. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all people of our team uh, for their contribution, but I would also like to acknowledge uh, the, the role and support um, of uh, Mrs. Janice Ansign, who is uh, uh, the chief, the, uh, the, the person in charge of the networking, uh, training and capacity building uh, work package in Cost for Cloud project. And I would also like to uh, especially thank and acknowledge the role uh, of uh, Dr. Jauma Piera, who is um, uh, the coordinator of the project and uh, uh, represent, is uh, in charge of the uh, uh, Institute of Marine Science uh, in the Spanish uh, Research Council. Um, just a few words about uh, the Cost for Cloud project because um, uh, I know that uh, you will have, you already and you will have uh, more opportunities to uh, to hear about uh, this project uh, in several oral and uh, poster and uh, um, uh, other presentations uh, in this conference. Uh, this is a Horizon 2020 project to promote citizen science. How? By developing 20 uh, new technological services to improve citizen observatories in terms of the uh, quantity and quality of observations and in order to help and ensure their uh, long-term viability. Uh, and after this, uh, technological, these new technological services are ready, they will be open and available uh, in the European Open uh, Science uh, Cloud, uh, through the European Open Science Cloud, to more um, uh, observatories, to more citizen observatories. Uh, and by this way, um, an environment for hosting and processing uh, research, research data to support and uh, uh, further develop citizen science in Europe and uh, beyond Europe uh, will be um, uh, able and possible to, um, uh, to be built. Um, so this, uh, in this uh, project, uh, which is coordinated by SEEK, uh, 15 partners uh, uh, participate. Uh, citizen, uh, in terms of citizen observatories we have and platforms, we have nine well-known um, observatories uh, which are um, uh, active in uh, biodiversity monitoring and uh, environmental um, quality. Um, uh, uh, monitoring and um, this uh, project which is uh, about uh, it's almost uh, about to finish because uh, we are already uh, through our uh, three, third year uh, of uh, implementation um, uh, is uh, uh, is uh, has has and uh, it is still uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, innovative um, uh, things. Uh, among the partners um, uh, is also the NKUA uh, and especially uh, in particular Environmental Education Lab uh, um, uh, in which I have, um, I'm honored to, uh, to lead for the last uh, 15 years, which is um, a, a center, a research center based at the Department of Educational Studies and which is active in research and development on school environmental education and uh, lifelong environmental learning, which uh, aims and uh, 
uh, tries to operate as a hub for interdisciplinary collaborations among uh, and with different actors and uh, across uh, multiple uh, sectors, uh, and uh, which supports uh, synergies for the advancement of knowledge and the development uh, of innovative practice uh, to, um, that will uh, lead uh, to the uh, to fostering and promoting education and learning for environmental uh, citizenship and sustainability. So what's the NKUA uh, contribution to Cost for Cloud project? Uh, our role, I would say, is uh, well beyond um, uh, promoting and uh, testing the project uh, goals and the project uh, uh, new services uh, to another target audience, which is uh, uh, the educational communities. Uh, our uh, contribution is to um, uh, integrate, to, to actually to propose and to implement a methodology for integrating citizen science, making use of the project's technologies and new services into school environmental educational uh, standard practices. And to this end, a general design model or else a strategy was conceived and put into practice during this uh, three years old. Uh, this strategy comprises um, uh, several uh, interconnected uh, actions and, and is based and draws on, uh, on a series of tenets, I would say, and on a series of ideas and principles. Uh, first, uh, uh, that citizen science and environmental education uh, are very much compatible to each other and very much congruent and contributing to each other. Uh, they share a lot of uh, common uh, points and ideas. Uh, although their potential arising from their integration uh, remains largely uh, unexplored. But as we argue, um, if we invest on this uh, potential uh, through uh, coordinated action, uh, uh, research, uh, development, um, implementation uh, in schools, then uh, we uh, are optimistic that uh, a lot of opportunities, a lot of learning opportunities um, uh, for environmental and scientific literacy, uh, citizen empowerment and local sustainability uh, will um, uh, come out. Uh, so our strategy for integrating citizen science and the project technologies into school environmental education uh, was developed and applied uh, first in a Greek educational context because this is the context that we know uh, best since we are uh, from Greece, uh, but uh, with, uh, with a view to, uh, to apply, to, to, to get the uh, knowledge and the, and the uh, insights from our application and to uh, invest, it in, invest this into a new uh, and other um, uh, national context, um, educational context, and in, it comprises um, uh, several categories of actions, uh, including teacher training, uh, the development of training resources, uh, the establishment of an educational network, uh, the co-creation of uh, educational scenarios for school use, and uh, the uh, implementation and evaluation of a number of case studies uh, in both primary and secondary uh, schools in Greece. Uh, all these actions um, were designed to be interrelated and mutually contributing to each other uh, and they were based and um, uh, aimed to promote co-design and co-creation, the empowerment of practitioners, teachers and uh, learners and uh, the evaluation of uh, their processes at, and outcomes as an integral part of, their, um, of, of a quality um, uh, of quality procedures in, in this project. Uh, for example, uh, within this uh, strategy, an online training course uh, was uh, designed, set up, organized and run by the University of Athens. Um, a 100 hour online training course which lasted uh, six months and where 23 um, um, uh, Greek environmental educators and uh, educational stakeholders were invited to take part after careful selection uh, for their motivation and for uh, their uh, experience in uh, uh, doing uh, such uh, innovative practices in their schools. Um, and uh, it was within 
uh, the context of this online course that a set of training materials and resources uh, were uh, designed and uh, used uh, not only for uh, the needs of the training course in order to provide content for each of the five modules of this course but also they were designed to be um, uh, open enough uh, uh, for adaptation and reuse uh, for next um, uh, training uh, courses, training seminars and training uh, opportunities and this is uh, why uh, these uh, training materials are now being uh, translated into English and uh, become uploaded to the project Cost for Cloud uh, Toolbox and Evidence Hub. Six educational scenarios, the first uh, educational scenarios were also co-designed by the participants of this online course. Uh, they, uh, the participants acted as educational designers and they worked together to um, pedagogically design and produce plans uh, of how to implement citizen science projects and activities within their um, environmental education practice. Um, an educational network was uh, established after the community of learning and practice that was first initi initiated within uh, the online course um, uh, grew and expanded uh, also through our um, uh, consequent uh, efforts uh, into a nationwide, nationwide thematic educational network and we're about to launch uh, the network's uh, website uh, during the next few days and uh, of course all these actions, all these uh, various categories of actions uh, were meant to support and um, um, enable the implementation and evaluation of uh, school citizen science projects and activities. And despite uh, the really um, adversary, let's say, uh, conditions uh, during the last uh, two years uh, in schools so with all this uh, COVID-19 situation, uh, I would say that we are satisfied that we have uh, designed, uh, coordinated and evaluated uh, five case studies during the first phase and 18 new case studies during the second phase and we are in the course of evaluating all the rich material, the rich evidence that we uh, gathered through uh, these case studies. Um, the findings so far indicate that uh, there is a lot of uh, learning potential within these uh, um, uh, projects that uh, integrate citizen science with environmental education. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm, I'm open to questions. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. I think we have time for one very quick, quick question. Do we have any hands? Uh, I see gentlemen just here, please. Yeah, use the mic, um, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Ricardo. Uh, work in a non-profit, bioc.org. Um, thank you for your presentation, very interesting. Um, I was wondering, because we find often teachers uh, very busy and, um, and and not really willing to um, spend much time to um, implement citizen science and so on. Um, and I've been, you know, I've been thinking about a possibility like it's done with artists to bring to schools um, uh, artists that, you know, this is already been done um, to, to, to help children in creativity and artistic production and so on. Um, so, do you know of any, any case where uh, environmental scientists, biologists and so on, uh, or specialists in, in sustainability and so on, are being brought to schools um, to, to actually do that, uh, implement citizen science and so on, um, so, so to, to take that, that burden from, from teachers that are already really busy? Uh, from what I know, there are uh, a lot of cases uh, that uh, uh, citizen scientists or scientists, environmental scientists, uh, are invited to uh, come to school and um, either talk or present uh, um, their researches or uh, uh, knowledge coming out from their researches. And in this way, there is uh, a kind of uh, um, enrichment of the whole educational process uh, in schools. But 
we, we insist, we, we uh, strongly believe and we insist that uh, education is not part of outsiders. Education uh, is part and is in the hands of teachers themselves. So, so our uh, target audience, in order to get involved with uh, uh, this uh, highly potential uh, uh, that citizen science offers, uh, is uh, uh, our teachers themselves. And we are lucky enough uh, that in Greece uh, we have a very uh, active and very uh, motivated uh, educational community uh, of, uh, uh, comprised uh, um, of uh, environmental uh, teacher, envir teachers as environmental educators and who are, who are very open and very keen uh, in in uh, getting to know new and innovative practices and to bring these practices into their school with their children, with their students. So uh, I, I hope that our example, the Greek example, can um, uh, give a lot of uh, new insights to other educational systems too. Thank you much for the question. Thank you, Maria, for your great talk. Please, Thank you. everyone can join me. Thank you, Maria, again. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a costume change, but I feel like I should because that would be, you know, I now become Claire the Speaker. Uh, my name is Claire. I'm going to be talking to you today about seeds. Uh, at some point, the slides will come up. Uh, but in the meantime, I should say I have the tendency to get very excited about seeds and I talk very fast. So if you feel like it's a problem, just stick up your hand and do this and I will try to slow down. So seeds is something that I think is, is really, really exciting because we are doing co-creation events for adolescents in these Makeathon events and stakeholders to develop interventions. And I, just like many people before us, this is a huge team effort. I, I tried to get everyone's names on the slide, but we have like 20 people, so it would just be basically a slide of text. So I, but I'm very grateful. We have lots of partners um, based all over the place, and it's really, really exciting and interesting to work with them. Uh, we, there we go, next slide. So what is SEEDS? I think I always forget to define this, so I wanted to make sure I do this. I always say it's science by teenagers for teenagers. And this is something that's, it's really, really fun because basically we're empowering teenagers to live healthy lifestyles. This is particularly a problem in areas where you have low income families, for example, because they have less options, the family budget is more restricted, junk food is more available. And so the teenage scientists, we wanted to get them involved in actually creating new experiments to try and address these problems and also having in relevant stakeholders on board. So the experiments that we have run um, ran for six months in schools in Spain, the Netherlands, Greece and the UK. And I would like to also highlight that there are also control schools uh, involved because we don't talk about the control schools a lot because basically their job is to do nothing for six months. But they do a great job of doing nothing and we're very grateful to them for their work. <laughs> so. Just to, I just need to kind of give you the context of what a makeathon is because I, I mean, how many people have heard of a makeathon? Oh yeah, maybe, okay, we've got maybe 20 people in the room. Um, but I want to bring you with me on this. So a makeathon is something that's really interesting because makers, and they can be all sorts of people from different backgrounds, collaborate and they reflect on and tackle a single challenge together. So, and it's usually in a short amount of time. They have free reign to improvise and basically interpret the theme in their own way. Uh, I, I've adapted this definition, as I've said here. We are actually using an amended version of the Makeathon. I, the time limit is important here, so I don't have time to fully define all the stages, but our version is adapted from uh, this paper here, if you are interested. So why are we using Makeathons is a pretty important question, and I think it comes back to lots of these same threads that are weaving through all of our talks. We're thinking about agency. We want to directly empower the teenagers because it's a problem where actually a lot of people design health interventions and they say to the students, you must do this, you must do that. And then, oh, surprise, it doesn't work. It, it seems like we're kind of, you know, we as maybe researchers, as policymakers are failing because we're not listening to what our teenagers need. They need to be involved in making these decisions and they need to be involved in a way that's valid and in a way that actually listens to what they have to say. And 
building on this idea of agency, uh, our SEEDS logo was actually adapted and modified by two incredible teenage scientists, so Basma and ZQ. Um, if you wanted to check out the whole blog they wrote for us, please do. But it's an idea of how actually something that, you know, we create as scientists or researchers or whatever actually gets so much better when we get people on board, when we get these teenagers on board, we have like a logo that actually reflects the project rather than something conceptual that we designed even before the project started. So to just kind of pick up on a few things, um, one of the, the really important parts was the ideate phase where actually the teenagers shared their ideas. And there's lots of different things to think about here because actually when you think about getting a bunch of teenagers in the room, there's a bit of a problem in a sense, they might feel not very confident, they might feel a little bit intimidated by other people's ideas. So we actually built in silent brainstorming, which was really effective for teenagers to quickly generate these ideas. And after they did silent brainstorming, they then discussed them further. Here we have a couple of the silent brainstorming and the ideate um, sheets that are actually from Greece, the UK, and also in Spain but every single country did this. And these were their experiences, their ideas, their thoughts. This was what they wanted to explore further as a possible intervention. And actually thinking about the Megathons and also the SEEDS project generally, there were a couple of challenges that I think, I've already heard a lot about this already, but I wanted to push on a little bit further. Because consent for us was actually a big problem because we needed consent from both the teachers, um, both the, st the students, the teenage scientists and the parents. That can be quite tricky sometimes because especially during COVID, we can't go into schools as easily. We can't meet the parents as easily. Our team did get very resourceful and really did what they could. But it's a very good idea if you're planning a project with teenagers to really kind of consider how are you going to get consent from the start because it will be really problematic towards the end. Another issue, which I think is perfectly illustrated in this picture. Can anyone tell me what is wrong with this picture? Oh, I've got one hand, please. Is it that none of the teenagers are talking to each other? You're close. It's, it's that the adults are standing there looking at the teenagers they are basically exerting their power. They are like, we are here, we own this space. That doesn't work. You know, if you're talking about true co-creation, if you're talking about true engagement, having something like this is really dangerous. You know, I genuinely, when we did this event, and this was the first time we did it, so, you know, it's very much a baptism of fire. I went in and I just literally grabbed an adult and was like, let's go, we're going to leave now because you are actually wrecking everything. And that's hard. It's hard for us to hear as people who think we know what we're doing, but it's also hard for, you know, for the teenagers because it makes them feel a bit uncomfortable. So it's good to build that in. Um, sustaining, so in terms of the interventions, also very tricky. Something that we had a lot of problems with, with COVID because we couldn't go into schools very, very often. I mentioned here burnt bridges. I think this is something maybe more people need to think about. We all love our beautiful EU grants and other grants that we get, whatever they are, they're short term. And what we don't realize is that we are burning bridges by going into a school and immediately jumping out again. We are actually creating situations where schools don't trust us because we will come and we will walk away and we will leave them behind with maybe something, maybe nothing, who knows. Please think about that in your own work. And I know we talk about sustainability, it comes up an awful lot in EU projects now, but take a step back and actually think about how the school will sustain what you are building, because it's gonna make a big difference, or other communities as well. Um, I, I need to be quick, so I'll just kind of pick on the pitch here, because I think this was really interesting. One of the stages is the pitch stage, where basically the teenagers say, these are our ideas, this is what we think we should do. We actually worked out something, on the first time we did this, we worked out something very important. Teenagers don't know what's possible, right? So a lot of the, the we asked them to present pros and cons for you know, the collective ideas of the group. And actually, all of their cons were things we could solve. 
And so we very quickly realised that actually during their pros and cons stage, we had to intervene. And so we did. We said, OK, we are now going to have a solutions section where we are going to talk about the solutions that we can work with you for. So it's something to really bear in mind. Um, I've seen this two minutes, so I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, but hopefully not too fast. Um, one thing I would like to say, we did some, some, some evaluation and some voting. The reason I said real voting here is because we gave students tokens and we told them to go into a room by themselves and vote. Many of these are under 18, they've never voted properly before. What actually subsequently happened was they started having conversations about the voting process and how they would actually think about voting in future, which is a really positive thing because it's not something they've done. Um, I, I don't have time to do this, but we have evaluated the makeathons. Just to kind of say, what do the makeathons work towards? They work towards interventions. So this is actually the Spanish team's intervention that they created. Uh, when I say Spanish team, I directly include the teenage scientists in there. Please note this. So they decided they actually wanted to do an awful lot on their screen time. So they set up a whole screen time process where they were reporting their hours collectively to the teacher. They also did some active classes, um, including active pauses. And there's a great video that they use, and they all kind of got up and stood up in the middle of the class and started exercising just in the middle of long classes. And this was something they actually really, really loved. They said it was really, really fun. It really broke the monotony of class for them. Um, and they also did quite a lot of cooking, actually. And they had some really good competitions on how they could cook together. Really, very, very quickly. <laughs> This is people getting involved, but the, the thing about something like a makeathon is, is you're making something, whether it's a, a concept, an idea, whatever. So you really need to think about prototypes and get them fast and fail fast. So this applies to makeathons, but applies to other things generally. If you can fail fast with something like this, you can get better at iterating and making things better. Um, this is really important, being open to what teenagers are interested in, what they care about. Their lived reality is very different to yours. Be aware of that when you come and start designing something. Listen to what they have to say. And this I end with because I feel like it's something that is, is really um, symbolic. These are our teenagers. They actually, this is one of the first in and makeathons we did. They are standing in a place of power, you know? Power that they maybe never have. But I, I really wanted to remind people, and, and we thought about this a lot, remember to share your power. They're not going to feel agency if you use fancy language or if you treat them like they have no knowledge or experience. And yeah, it takes a village, but we have enormous power and potential for change if we work together. I am going to acknowledge, first of all, all of our amazing teenager scientists and stakeholders. They've been incredible. Thanks to all of the SEEDS team who've been so much fun to work with. And thank you for your attention. I hope I've been on time because it would be very bad as a chair if I wasn't. Uh, you can find me at any of these places. And something that I would like you to reflect on, just because I think it's, it's a big question for me at the moment, is how you can give people power and agency in your own projects. So yes, are there any questions? Zero minutes, oh perfect, nice. <laughs>
500, 5,000 euros. They cannot sustain them, they cannot pay for them, they cannot get the budget. And that was another thing that some of the schools actually pushed back against. They said, look, if we participate in this, will we have to pay, you know, all this money after you leave us to maintain this project? And so that actually kind of changed how we worked with the schools because then we simplified some of our ideas. You know, we kind of, in this context, we were like, okay, we're not going to use apps. We're not going to, to buy really fancy equipment. We're going to think simply like skipping ropes you know, that sort of thing, water bottles, a bit more accessible for them, you know, when we're there and when we're gone as well. But it's, it's a really important question. Yeah, my time is up, so I apologise. I'll be around. Um, I will ask also, just for a personal thing, if the speakers could hang back very quickly for a photograph at the end, I'd appreciate it. I'm only saying that because we have one speaker left and I know people will have to run for lunch. So, we have one speaker left, and Camille Labibes is going to talk to us um, about Erasmus Maris, which is citizen science for secondary schools. Would you prefer this? Or yeah, I would take this. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Maybe. I have four to, change, to move the... There you go. Yeah, thank you. My glasses. Uh, I'm Kamel Labibes. I'm a chairman of a non-profit sailing association, and I'm also the coordinator of a project called the uh, Raise CS. And uh, this project is uh, co-financed by the Erasmus Plus program. And uh, to explain it in a nutshell, we want to answer to the following question: Can secondary schools assess, so not only sample but also analyze microplastic pollution in rivers and seas? And this project is part of a larger initiative that is called Erasmus Maris. And what you see on the left-hand side, of the, uh, of, the side of the slide here are the different uh, partner projects. And this bigger, larger initiative, uh, the objective of this initiative is to establish tangible and lasting um, relationships, links between upper secondary schools, I mean pupils above 15 years plus, 15 years and scientific research institutions and um, we want to do it so our scope we want to do it in themes which are related to the preservation of the marine environment so it's many fields but to prove our concepts we are focusing now on the microplastic pollution and uh, we started in 2018 we did another Erasmus plus program called pedagogical uh, sailboat and it was to design the concepts and now we are in the proof of concepts, we are imp it's the implementing phase in the Ray CS projects, and we have uh, some results that we, are, uh, that we are developing. One of them is to develop robust methods to, as I said, not only to sample, but also to assess microplastic pollution. Uh, and these methods, we want them that they can be implemented in, in secondary schools. And what I mean here is that the scientists are taking their, their methods to assess microplastic pollution, and they're simplifying these methods so that the teachers and their pupils can uh, use the, we were speaking about the, the, the financements of a citizen science project, so that they can use the, the, um, the normal, uh, the common laboratory equipment to assess uh, microplastic pollution. And then we have to address an issue, which is the reliability of the results when we have a simplified uh, uh, methods and for that we work in collaboration with the European Commission Joint Research Centre in Gael in uh, Belgium and they are providing us what we call a reference materials and they are giving us also support to validate these methods according to international uh, standards. And uh, the reference materials, they call it the truth in a bottle and to make it simple, it's a, a bottle in which we have, a, it's a sample, and we have a known quantity of microplastics. So we have a method that we have simplified. We give these methods to the, to the schools, and we can see what is the reliability, the, um, the precision and the accuracy that we can have uh, by involving uh, schools. We made the trial at the beginning of our projects, so we had the methods. We did not make a lot of training to, uh, to uh, we had uh, four schools from, uh, no, we had, we had four schools from four different countries, and uh, we divide them in, uh, in groups. And what you see on the y-axis are the numbers of, of particles. We, it's reference materials, they are spiked. So we know exactly what is it, the, the, the horizontal line. 
and we asked them, they didn't know, how much microplastic do you find? And the results were incredibly, we didn't expect that because it was just a, a trial. We had incredibly good results. So we are, it was really encouraging and we are working on still uh, making the, uh, uh, the training so that they can, the, the, the students, so we are making training um, protocols for the students and also for the pupils and also for the teachers. And uh, that was about the first uh, results in this project. The second, we are developing guidelines on how to associate citizen science projects in general to the curricula. And you know that in each country there is a different curriculum, but we knew that the, um, so we were, we, we knew that the, all the schools are being implementing what they call the key competences for lifelong learning and associating them to the, to the, to the curricula, the key competence for lifelong learning is science competence, uh, citizenship. So our strategy is to link the citizen science projects to the key competences and we live in each country. So it, it's an intermediate step so that they can afterwards implement the citizen science projects in, in their school. I will not go to detail what you are doing that here because I uh, don't have the time in these 10 minutes. And I will go to the roadmap. We are also developing within the, this project a third, a third result, which is um, a roadmap on how to implement our concept AU-wide. And um, speaking about the concept, uh, just a remind the objective, you want to establish uh, tangible lasting links between uh, secondary schools and scientific research. How do you want to do it by concept? We are creating a framework to facilitate the co-creation of scientific campaigns, scientific studies at EU scale. And what we want to have from the beginning, a fair balance between scientific and uh, pedagogical goals. And I will go a little bit deeper in this, on this part. And there are three key elements within our concepts, within our framework. We have a transnational collaborations. So normally when there is a school, when the scientists design a, a project, gives uh, um, the samples of the sensors to uh, different schools and they give it back, it's centralized. We want that there is a, co a collaboration between the different schools. The second element is mobility and the third is social cohesion. So we, in we involve uh, pupils with the less opportunities but also with special needs. And the sailboat is used as a, a motivation factor. We saw that it was not only for the students but also for the teachers. And it's also a no formal learning environment. When you are in a sailboat, you learn uh, technical competences, but also uh, transversal competences like uh, uh, leadership, uh, team working. I want to speak a little uh, deeper about this uh, framework that we are developing. It's uh, mainly, in, in one sentence, a holistic approach within a real world environment. And I go a little bit deeper. It consists on three phases. The first one is the co-creation process, and these are the most schools and scientists are involved. They agree on a theme related to the preservation of the marine environment. For us, we have chosen microplastic now to prove our concepts. They design a citizen science projects, thinking that these projects will be implemented at EU scale. Then we have the normal citizen science projects in which we have pedagogical uh, and scientific activities, and in the first phase, I spoke about having a, a fair balance between the two objectives, pedagogical and scientific. And then the third one is what we call the cross-communication process. We want to have a collaboration between the different schools. So this, that's not the same thing, sending to each school's the sensor, again, back. We want them to, to gather them and they speak about, they share their, uh, their results between them. And this, in these uh, five days, we called Erasmus Maris Week. We uh, uh, organized field campaign about, about the sailboats on the theme so, uh, that we selected. So now it's microplastic sampling. And they have workshops with scientists and they exchange the results between each other. So this is our uh, concept. I go a little bit deeper with the first uh, phase, the co-creation process. What we do there, it's a, it's a, it's a preparation phase. So, and it's, so this phase is targeting the teachers. So the scientists there lift the teachers to their level. Uh, the science teachers have a degree in chemistry or in science uh, in general. Oops, two minutes, I go it. So it's a preparation phase and uh, we train the teachers and uh, we want them to have the necessary skills to conduct scientific campaigns, but also the good practices in testing and quality management. And in this phase uh, is, the, is realized or conducted by the European Commission Joint Research Center 
and the Ghent University. The Ghent University has 20 years in the microplastic field, so they help us to uh, get the teachers on board. And we will have a demo uh, shortly. I sp skip that one. And um, I skip also the second phase because it's a normal citizen science project. I go to the cross communication project because we th think this is the innovative part of our Erasmus uh, Maris uh, uh, concepts. Here we train the pupils. So while, while in the first phase we lift the teachers, the second, the, the third phase, we, we, um, it's dedicated to pupils. We train them to screen and monitor the environment. We have a first um, trial in uh, April with, with, uh, different, with pupils from different countries. That are the photos you saw, you see. And it was in one day. Uh, and the results that uh, I shown before were, uh, came from that uh, day, that uh, trial. And we will have a five-day uh, demo and testing with pupils in March 2023. Again, with support from the European Commission Joint Research Center, from their uh, scientists and the University of Ghent. They will learn strategies to design and conduct uh, an effective awareness campaign. The teachers will evaluate them on the acquisition of uh, key competences. And we want them also to understand how, with this work, they are really participating, contributing to the sustainable development. So I uh, finished, I think. The, we believe that this uh, concept it can be a game changer, potentially, it's for the co-creation of citizen science projects with school. Uh, and it coincides with the United Nations decade of science, ocean science for sustainable development. We have actually the same, uh, the, our objectives fit with that mission. And we are also, uh, our objective is to call the European institutions to uh, investigate the possibility of creating a new type of Erasmus in Europe or to extend the scope of the existing Erasmus Plus to uh, the preservation of the oceans and its seas. And um, we need a critical mass of stakeholders. And uh, if you are interested in helping us, so uh, please, I made the... Uh, Yes, I have a slide and even uh, puts the first phrase, so it makes it easy to contact me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any questions for Camille? Yes, please. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Um, I wanted to know if also in the river you consider to collect uh, microplastic and also if you are connected in some way with the, the other network that is just, uh, well, uh, rising in this period, that these plastic pirates? Yes. Okay, yes. That, that they are doing this kind of thing. Yes, so, so uh, the first question, is uh, are we uh, collecting uh, microplastics in the rivers? Yes. So uh, uh, in our three phases, such so as the co-creation, the second phase, the schools work in their nearby environments and all, all the schools are close to the sea, so we ask them to collect microplastics in, the, in, the, in their nearby environments. We have methods and they also assess. They do not only collect, but also say what kind of microplastic. This is about the first one. And then we bring them to the sea and we show them about how it works with the, with, um, uh, within the sea. About the second question, yes, we saw that uh, there is another initiative. It was more about plastic waste and not about microplastics. So they collect uh, uh, plastic items. And again, here, they, if I understood well, they collect uh, uh, items and then they have a methodology and then send it back to the, to, the, to the scientists. I contacted them in July. They were interested, so just before the holidays. I know that they will present also uh, something in the afternoon, so I'll go back to them because I think that we are complementary. Thank you very much. Yes. I have one time for one more question. Does anyone have any other questions? Yes, sorry, over here, please. Hi, hi, uh, thank you so much for, for your presentation. I'm Claudia Carvalho, I'm from the Center of Social Studies in Portugal. Um, I was wondering if you have considered in this project about the impacts on learning in schools for the students in learning in other disciplines or in learning as a whole in other disciplines from the school curriculum? And what is the impact of this type of activities in the curriculum of schools? You, you, you mean involving the other subjects, not only the science? That's what you mean, is it? Yeah? 
So, well, uh, evolving and trying to understand what type of impacts does a science project like this has in learning in schools? Yes. Um, not the, we, we are, we, I have to say, we are not really uh, focusing on what the impact in learning, but there is an impact, of course, in learning, when we, because we have outdoor activities, it's uh, students', students uh, learning, um, student-centered uh, learning, so it's another way also of, uh, of doing the work, so there is an impact of the learning. We work in a cross-disciplinary manner when I was speaking about the key competences. So now, for instance, we have 10 teachers that will go with us to Spain uh, on the sailboat, they will um, assess them on different subjects, so not on the geography, they see the impacts uh, of microplastic, how it works on geography, you know, the, the rivers are parts of the geography, the history starts with mass production, the philosophy, so they have uh, a different view on microplastic pollution on, uh, on, that, um, effect. Yeah, on that subject. Okay, so I think that's going to be our last question for today because we stand between you and lunch, which is always a dangerous place to be. Um, just two quick things. One is, could all of the speakers, if they wouldn't mind, just stay back for a very quick photograph. Um, and if also I could ask the tech people to just change the screen. Ah, yes, exactly that. And I would like to finally thank you for your attention, your great questions and your time. Enjoy the rest of the conference, folks.
So, good afternoon. I hope you had all a very nice uh, lunch break, grabbed some food, some drinks, and you are now energized for the afternoon session. I welcome you very much to the session on monitoring the environment together from practitioners to policy makers. My name is Sabrina Kirschke. I'm with the museum, the Natural History Museum here in Berlin, and I'm very happy to guide you through the session. <clears throat> Originally, we had five speakers, or even six speakers, right? <laughs> and unfortunately, un unfortunately, two couldn't make it. But this also means that we have uh, more time for four excellent presentations. And I gave the speakers a little bit more time. So we have up to 15 minutes presentation, so we can really learn something about the work. And then we have about five minutes um, discussion. And now we can already start with the first uh, speaker. We have here two people in the program. First of all, Gitte, and second, Michael. But I learned that Michael will present. So, Michael, uh, over to you. You can take the other one. Or you can also take this one. So. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Um, Gitte Krau is sitting here, the other. That is, yeah. So I'm go going to talking about mobilizing local communities and, and expedition cruises in the Arctic. And just a few words of how, how I got to that. Um, we were working in Greenland for a long time with local fishers and hunters and uh, having them uh, observing and uh, noting down uh, and trying to communicate uh, the, way, the way they see uh, the trends for natural resources in the places they live. Then uh, we had a case study in Svalbard. There was no, no such thing as local hunters and fishers in communities like that. But there's a lot of tourists coming on expedition cruises. And uh, we had no f prior experience with working with expedition cruises or anything, but we, we tried to find out who potentially might know something about it and, and called for a workshop. So. Um, yeah, that's a general thing there. The, in the Arctic, you have huge remote areas with very few people, and uh, um, especially few researchers that can go and, and, and follow the trends of the natural resources and the, the living resources there. Um, and of course, it's very challenging. Uh, the, the no, no researchers in the, the winter time, and uh, they, they can get nowhere. But it's too totally expensive and impossible. But uh, they are the ones that are providing the data that we take decisions based on. So, but the expedition cruises can play a role because they are getting, at least uh, in, the, in the summer period, everywhere. And um, so that was with what we, our starting point. So it's back in, in March 2019 that we in, invited these people to come to Svalbard and yeah, presenting what they already had done and uh, talking about what we could do to, to use these uh, expedition cruises for, for more uh, getting yeah, uh, citizen science that could inform decisions on, on the, uh, environmental management. So it was already in 2019, but uh, we decided to take that as a, the pilot year and look at what happened in 2019 from, from these expedition cruises to understand um, the, the interest of, of the guests and guides, what they already were providing of data and what, where their interest was and is. And uh, so what we found is there are already some players that are like uh, working along the same lines here, that uh, the Polar Citizen Science Collective, that is uh, especially present in, in the Antarctic region, but also working in the Arctic, that uh, focused on, on some few uh, citizen science projects. And um, one of them is Happy Whale, and there's, uh, yeah, some of the people working in one are also working in the other. And uh, then there's uh, especially Horty Roden, one of, of the cruise operators that from now on, uh, 
placing cities in time labs in all the new ships and like that and, and looking for doing more in that direction. Um, so we narrowed down to, to looking in 2019 on a few of these projects. Uh, you might know them all because they're uh, quite large international projects. Uh, eBird, Happy Whale, Sega Disk, and Cloud Observations. And uh, can you see anything there? Yeah, that's, that's just eBird, some of my own records from, from Svalbard recently. So uh, you, 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 uh, when you are out, you have your phone and you start your trip and you enter your observations of birds. And uh, when you have finished your trip, you press and stop. So uh, it has recorded the birds you have seen and the route you have been walking. And uh, what you get back is uh, a nice website where you can go and see your own records and following how many uh, trips you have made and what birds you have seen. And you can also go and, and get information on all the, the single species. and. Uh, so if you are interested in birds, you will really get value for, 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 for the effort you have done. So I, I took this one to show you just what, what citizen science can do. Um, if you take the, the bottom right, it is a um, distribution map of uh, the King Ida. I found it on Wikipedia and then I looked up and it, it's many places it looks like that. And there's no record from Svalbard. And I imagine that scientists making distribution maps years ago, they had to go to so, so many sources to try to understand where the bird was distributed, and they, they had to yeah, make mistakes like that. But um, if you take eBird and you ask for the distribution map there, you will get lots of records of King Eider from Svalbard. Two other Examples quick, uh, birds that are important in Svalbard uh, or, or have some like, more global importance. Uh, and again, lots of, lots of, of citizen science records. So this is a happy whale. The happy whale, it's again, you take photographs of the tail fins of, of it's not only that, but mostly of, of humpback whale. And they have markings on the tail and the, uh, Artificial intelligence can quickly tell you if the tail have been photographed before, where the whale have been and all this, and uh, what, what uh, the observer get back is a lot of information about the whales he have photographed himself. And uh, it's all docu documented by photographs, so no reason to doubt the observations. And uh, yeah, here are 21 encounters in 2019 from, from the Svalbard region, and that's this is about like doing much else than just following what was happening, not push, pushing for people to, to do something. The cloud observations here, there are not so much observations from the Arctic. It's, it's about uh, when the satellite goes over and you know when it's there, you can take photographs of the clouds and you can note things about the clouds. And that is like a ground truthing, so people in NASA, they know when the, the satellite took those photographs and people, they uh, noted down this and took these photographs from down, then they better understand the, the information they get from remote sensing. The sec second disk here, very few observations from uh, the Arctic here. And um, that is, uh, you have a disk of 30 centimeters in di diameter that you, enter down lower into the water and until you cannot see it anymore. And that gives an idea about how much phytoplankton it is. So it's about like global issues and things that uh, not really can be used for much by, by those people participating here. But uh, of course, it's interesting to, to be part of a big program like, like that. It's not really used much by these uh, expedition cruises, even it's one of those that they are recommended to use. So some figures here, it's just to show you that, that these uh, youth uh, citizen science programs like iNaturalist, eBird, and, and uh, the Norwegian one on, on arts observation, it's really large, large, huge numbers of data. And of course, if you go to the global biodiversity information facility and see where the records come from, uh, 
by far the most uh, of their records are from citizen science, and it's especially many, many birds. And uh, still, when you go to, to large live forms, there will be a lot of uh, citizen science records. And then the more obscure things, you will see that uh, there are not so many from citizen science. So just, uh, yeah, the, the summary of what happened in 2019 in, in Svalbard. We worked, in, in fact, in both Disco Bay and Svalbard, but we have focused much on Svalbard because in Disco Bay we have also the local people uh, engaged in all this, and it's, it's much easier to say this is Svalbard and this is what happened. Um, yeah, a lot of checklists with, from in, on eBird, so the, the small one of a quarter of bird on each ch checklist, so it might be, be 7,000 records, more than the 700 there, but also 121 whale observations here. I don't know what happened with the figure before. It might have been two times we've been able to look at it, but this was lower on the other slide. Uh, I have not had the time to check up what have happened there. Uh, Cloud observation only 11 and second disk only one. So um, if you want to build on what uh, the, the visitors already find is interesting and what they're doing already, it is like eBird, Happy Whale, and what I can see from elsewhere, I naturalist. Yep. Um, so this is what we talk about today also. It's how, how, how how do these uh, things that data that are collected, how do they end at uh, policy makers and decision makers? And uh, this is just a, a quick one to show how things are happening today. A lot of cruises have passengers and very much often the guides also that contribute to different projects. Uh, and um, it's like one way they send their contributions. Of, uh, um, to, to these different. Now I have Eunice and I have the, the, the Susselman that is like the governor of, of, of Svalbard also on there. They should be, maybe be a little more to the right. That's like not the citizen science programs. It's, it's more, more like the, yeah, the, the university. Eunice could be like in the same level, but the Susselman is actually there. Uh, the people that are uh, in charge of the environmental management in Svalbard and the people that should be able to do better, take better decisions when they have all the information that comes through citizen science. But today they don't do that. And uh, the culture is that uh, you have to be a hardcore scientist before you can provide good data and citizen science probably more or less uh, play uh, a lie or something that you cannot trust. And that's, that's changing very fast and hopefully in a few years I cannot say this anymore. But the thing is that uh, we have people that like to record animals and uh, other things. It could be ice, it could be the clouds, it could be anything. Uh, that, that want to contribute with their data, and uh, you have uh, citizen science programs that take the data up, but you, you don't get to the policymakers, and the, something is missing, some, some, something in between, and that can translate and tell, tell the, uh, the, the decision makers what it is that all these records tell about. Uh, environmental management and decisions that have to be taken. Um, I imagine that there's a need for funding because there are some people there that have to, to do a serious work to, to do the translation and communication there. And also all communication should of course also going the other way. So a colleague of me asked, asked me to put this uh, complicated one also. It's more or less taking, talking about the cells. Of course, it's bottom-up, not bottom-up. Um, I took it to please her, but uh, I think it's a little hard for you just to sit and try to understand it in, in this short time we have now. So that was my talk for today. Thank you for listening. Oh, yeah, questions.
I also have one. Yes. So th thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Um, are there questions for Michael or Gitta? Yes, we have one here. Please turn on your mic. Thank you for your very interesting lecture. I found it really very interesting. I have two small questions. One that I may not have understood uh, exactly the process. At the beginning, I tended to understand that you have, imagine, people who want to go to expeditions, like tourists, say, go to the region, yeah. and then you have the good idea of mixing this with CS projects, say, to use the opportunity that, that they are there. Is this the right order of things that I understood, say, or there are projects first and people who are then either volunteering or inviting or something like this? This is one question. And the other is that one or two slides before the end, you mentioned policy makers. What would you expect from them? What kind, what's an example of policy yeah. in, in this case? Thank you. Yeah, the f first thing, uh, we did here, like we always do, uh, we, we start to understand what is already existing and looking at the motivation of people. So this was already existing. All what I have talked about is not something I have pushed for. It's like where we are today. Now we know that the, the visitors and their guides going on these ex expeditions, we have looked further into that. They're very high educated. The other tourists with lower education, they go on uh, conventional cruise ships where they have uh, entertainment in the evening and uh, don't go ashore. These are smaller uh, boats with four to 500 people an average of 250 people that goes to shore and, and look for cultural remains and, and, and biodiversity. They look especially for mammals or birds. And uh, they, they pay a lot of money and often they are quite up in the age. Uh, they have uh, retired and have uh, money and want to have some good years in the end. And they go to Svalbard to see whales, mammals, this, uh, looking at uh, cultural remains, like where did the balloon start when it wanted to find the North Pole and all these things. So, so um, now we know that that's what we are start, the starting point, and we know that there's a lot of data. So when they are taking decisions on, on, on uh, environmental management, they're getting a lot of similar data through the, the researchers. But the researchers are few, and they are not coming so often, and uh, so it's, it's like an, an extra contribution. It's just having more, a broader basis for taking decisions than you have today that this makes possible. And your second question was, uh, remind me. Yeah, yeah, so I, that covered both of them, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it, could be, even, it could be against uh, the tourists. To, today, the tourists, they are a threat to, to some of these uh, wildlife and uh, because the, the tourism all over the world but also in the Arctic is, is exploding now and, and of course the tourists they also are conscious that they are doing some harm so they, they would like to cooperate say we are providing information basic information on what is happening and uh, then there can be uh, reasonable rules we all have a dialogue about how the rules and regulations should be not mainly ships coming at the same places all the time or, or, or when uh, cultural remains are, uh, are breaking down because of something has to be done. So it, it's like a self-monitoring of the tourists providing information for the, for the governor to take decisions on how to regulate the tourism. It's, it's one part of it. Of course, it's, it's broader than that. You get a lot of information about the, the status and distribution of, of, of wildlife. Yeah. Okay, I see we have a second question, a very quick question and quick answer, please. Hello, I'm Hi. Michael Pocock from UKCH. Um, so I wondered, um, when thinking about environmental monitoring up in the Arctic, I suspect that um, remote sensing is probably really important. So did you take the existing remote sense data into account when considering what data you would be collecting? And how do you communicate um, if I'm allowed the cheeky second question, um, how do you communicate that spatial bias? Because I imagine many of your maps are, are maps of where the cruise ships go, not where the birds are, for instance. 
Yeah, the remote sensing, uh, the, if you look at the, this cloud observations, the, there are no real interest among Q, cruise ships passengers to do that. So I imagine that uh, it can still be done, but with another approach, it could be that you make school programs of school children in, in the, the Arctic, they are involved in, in this kind of, of monitoring. And um, like the other one with the second disc, I'm sure that sailboats, where people that are going for longer periods, this we find this was interesting to, to be part of that project. But uh, the tourists that comes for one or two weeks to Svalbard, I think they don't really, yeah, it, it, it does not really appeal to them. It appeals to them to record animals, plants, more or less what, what they really do in a large scale. So, so the, the, it's not using expedition cruises if, if you want to cover the other things. And the other question you had? Maybe, maybe there may can... not be time. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have to move the second yeah. question to Thanks the a lot. Um, Thank break. You. Thank you so much again for your presentation and also for asking uh, questions and for responding. Mm -hmm. So our second speaker is Maria Salgado. Please join us. Um, and she will speak about citizen science... Oh, no, sorry. Implementing citizen science in the flat early warning. Um, hello, my name is Maria Nao. I'm a PG, PhD student at the National University of Colombia in civil engineering. And I'm here today to talk about my research project that is implementing citizen science in the flood early warning system of urban maintenance catchment. Um, I'm, I'm really passionate about one science that is called hydrology, but my interest is not hydrology uh, alone, it's hydrology with impact, or also called social hydrology. And uh, for instance, how human societies cope with floating. So here is the outline, I divided in three main blocks, the background, the research project, and the progress. So let's jump in, into it. So the part one is the background. Uh, I'm gonna explain some key concepts and the case study. So some key concepts. What is a flood early warning system, right? So flood is a type of hazard of hydrometeorological nature uh, due to rains or the increase of the level of the water of the water bodies. Uh, early means that the system gives enough time in advance to decide to activate or not a protocol. A warning, by the way, is uh, the system generates alerts when a particular event is about to take place or is occurring. And finally, the system is, is the whole set of capabilities to produce and disseminate warning information. So there are three main types of uh, early warning systems based on the operation mechanism. So first is a community-based early warning system, which the main actor are uh, main actor is, sorry, um, the community. Uh, second, uh, an institutional early warning system which usually operates under the leadership of public or a private institution and they have a little bit more technology involved. And an integrated early warning system is the combination of the community-based early warning system and the institutional-based, uh, sorry, institutional early warning system. So based on the community practices and the knowledge and the organization with the institutional instruments and procedures. So it's a combination. Well, now the case study, the Manizales Stream Basin. Well, uh, the Manizales Stream Basin is located in Colombia, in the Department of Caldas, and in the municipality of Manizales, my hometown. <laughs> Uh, here at the bottom uh, right corner, we can see the Manizales Stream Basin and its hydrometeorological and warning stations. Also, the urban area that is located in the basin. Uh, it has very particular condition. It's a mountain stream uh, basin because upstream has a steep slopes, a steep slopes and bedrock. It has an area of 27 square kilometers 
uh, an elevation, a wide range of elevation from 3,000 to almost 2,000 meters above sea level. The land on the strand is almost 13 kilometers. It, is, it has a nice climate uh, because it's a tropical mountain climate that is located in the Andean region. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it is typical of torrential rains, yeah? And it has a really strong influence of the intertropical confluence zone and the cold face of the Anson. The population is approximately 24,000 people in there. And there are two vulnerable urban sediments that are, is it work? Oh, sorry, here. Here. So, Verdum and Malteria. They are very vulnerable and poor communities. Um, upstream of the river, there is a mining zone. Okay, why this basin? Well, the Manizales Stream Basin, there is, in, in this basin, there is a high probability of flash flood, torrential floods, and landslides due to the characteristics of a mountain stream and the local rainfall conditions. So, the, for instance, high intensity and short duration, duration rainfall. Talking about the social aspect, a community based Aliwana system based on the upstream observations of rainfall and a stream level is in place. So the warnings, flood warnings, are given from the mining zone upstream. Economically speaking, this, this uh, basin is very important in the Department of Caldas because it's producing 80% of the GDP. So the flood events can really affect the infrastructure and the water intakes of the water treatment plants of the companies. Additionally, flood events can affect the traffic circulation of the main highways. And finally, institutionally speaking, well, historical floods have even have affected these communities and companies in the past. And the city hall of Manizales decided to design and install an automated flood early warning system. In this case, automated is the same that institutional early warning system. So there is a need for integrate this community-based early warning system and the automated flood early warning system, which is crucial because they are working separately, and including the improvement of both systems. Well, now my research project. So it is divided in three main objects. That's how I thought about it. First, identify and analyze which are the improvement opportunities based on participatory procedures of both early warning system. Second, integrate the community-based early warning system and the automated flood early warning system through a methodology based on citizen science concepts and assess the performance of this integrated early warning system. And finally, climate change it is important, so we introduced it there. Understand the influence of the climate change on the integrated flood early warning, integrated early warning system, including knowledge uh, dialogues with all actors on mitigation and adaptation to climate change for the integrated early warning system. Here is uh, how we thought the methodology. So based on the main goal, which is citizen participation in the early warning system in mountainous regions, because due to the flash floods, we have to, do, to act quickly. And these are the main um, three components. So we want to introduce workshops, interviews, and socialization to build a SWOT matrix and the improvements opportunities. Uh, second, we, we want to do participatory and proactive strategies to integrate the community-based early warning system and the automated floor early warning systems based on citizen science. So, for instance, a participatory monitoring or participatory validation of very technical aspects of the automated floor early warning system. So there's a lot of room for uh, improvement in this aspect. And lastly, the socialization to actors of the influence of climate change of, on the integrated early warning system for floods, including this knowledge, discussions, and dialogues with all the actors uh, about, about mitigation and adaptation of this integrated early, early warning system for floods. Well, the progress so far. <laughs> uh, here I have uh, three key updates for the progress. First, uh, we have 
yeah, we have performed an analysis of the flood prediction system of the institutional or the automated flood early warning system and possible improvements. So here the flood prediction systems is based on rainfall thresholds. And it was done by modeling and all the experts work on that uh, rainfall threshold, but now we need to validate them on the field. And that's a really good opportunity to introduce citizen science there. Uh, the key update too is that we have conducted 36 interviews with the main actors of the automated flood early warning system and the community-based early warning system in the case study area. And last key update, we have uh, designed one strategy of community workshops established and supported by the government, which is uh, very good thing for so far that they want to support us uh, by the municipal unit for this disaster risk management and also the local communities. Here, uh, well, the key findings here we're showing uh, some of the interviewed actors, uh, so, sorry, actors from the both early warning systems. As we can see, private companies are the main <laughs> actors in the area. Also, we have these vulnerable communities, but we wanted to have like a, a whole look or a scope of what is happening there. So how, this is how it is, is working so far there. So the warnings, as I said, are given from the mining zone upstream based on the stream water level and the rainfall duration intensity. These flood alerts on the community-based early warning systems are based on the observations of the person located upstream of the basin. So it depends on the person, how they see how much rain is falling, but it's just observation. Two main WhatsApp groups are established by companies and communities that issue warnings based on the upstream information but just 39% of the interviewers are in these WhatsApp groups. So they are missing, there are actors that are missing in these WhatsApp groups, so they don't get it, the information. The companies that are based on the, in the, this basin rely on the community base of a uh, community based early warning system instead of the automated flood early warning system. So they have more, conf um, they believe more in the, in the community and not in the institutional early warning system. Uh, there, is, there is a need for new data sources to validate in the field the estimated rainfall thresholds of the automated flood early warning system. So there is a very good room there for introduce citizen science. And the main challenge is improve the data uh, availability and quality. Uh, here, um, this is the last slide, so I'm, I'm showing you here the strategy of the community workshops we have designed. It's made of four main uh, workshops uh, that we wanted to uh, work with these communities to understand the experiences of the flash, uh, flush, fl sorry, <laughs> flood and flash floods events in, the, in this basin. We want to also do this workshop with the, about social cartography on floods, so understand uh, where the water level uh, it is, it was in place at the moment of the flood, or also where are the good sites for a community monitoring, etc. And the, uh, the, the second, sorry, the third uh, workshop is about the construction of the SWOT matrix. So to understand how we can improve this, the community-based early warning system. And finally, we want to socialize the results with the people and the, with the different authors, actors <laughs> of the both early warning systems and understand if we're going in a good direction uh, and get the feedback, of course, because that's very important. And well, Basically, the main goal of this strategy is to collect information about experiences and the dynamics of the community-based early warning system and to understand how we can improve it and how we can do better. Um, all of this and also create these improvement opportunities that are proposed through a participatory process. Thank you very much for your time.
Thank you very much uh, for the excellent presentation. Are there any questions, immediate questions? If not, I would start. Um, I found your example pretty interesting because you did not only mention citizen science, but you also mentioned a lot of community work. Um, you talked about participatory approaches. This reminded me a little bit of this concept of transdisciplinarity. So my question is a bit uh, conceptual. Where does citizen science in your case start and where does it end? So the idea is to implement citizen science like a participatory monitoring, mostly in the second objective. So the idea is to, in, to include, like, to make the flood warnings more effective, right? So let's say, for instance, um, the automated flood and warning system work with the hydrometeorological stations, and then they say, for example, the rainfall threshold is about to get uh, passed, so you need to activate the, the warning, um, or you need to send a warning of floods, but maybe, the, the institutional early warning system is not working well, or the power is off, or, yeah, and then you need to rely on what community needs to say to you. It is, is happening, the stream level, the water is, 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 is growing or is going down, what is happening in the field. So if there, is, there needs to be a way to understand that both uh, need to work together and integrate in order to make more efficient the warning um, issues. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have another question? Yes. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I am just really curious to know why the people who set up these automated early warning systems trust the community systems better. <laughs> yeah, it's because in the past, like in 2011, they had a flood event that it was really, really hard on these vulnerable communities. Communities They lost like 50 houses and there were like 124 people affected. So they organized it as a community. They say, we need to do something because something is happening here. And the government was like knowing they're still like. And they decided to arrange like as a community to build a WhatsApp group and then to buy um, a warning station, and they operated. So they, they've been there for 15 years, and the automated floor early warning systems is just in place since 2018. So that's why they are more, uh, they rely more in the community world, uh, community-based early warning system than the one that is automated because it's, they don't know the system yet, how it's working. It is, it's, it is missing the socialization from also from the automated early warning system to be more there. So the government, what it wants to do now and the idea of supporting me is because they want to get close to the community and show what they do doing and how we can construct like this integration or build this integration between these both systems. I think we already uh, collect a lot of uh, aspects or factors that may trigger the politicians to actually pick up the data. Yeah. We had some already in the first talk and now we have some more. Are there more questions to our speaker? Then I would say we close here and continue with the third one. Applause again. <laughs> Thank you. And then we have our third speaker today, uh, Linda Mederake is already joining us and she will, or she asks, evaluating environmental policies with citizen science data. So we will get an answer now. <laughs> Yeah, hello everyone, also from my side. Um, I will be presenting on the question of how and um, whether we can evaluate environmental policies with citizen science data. And I've brought with me an example from the Plastic Pirates Go Europe project. And the co-authors that you see listed here come from Kieler Forschungswerkstatt, Kiel Science Factory and Ecologic Institute. And together we form the consortium from, for the German campaign 
of the citizen science project that looks at the river, pollu river plastic pollution of rivers in Europe. I give you a bit more of a background on the project in a minute, but first let me set the scene in terms of plastic pollution. Um, today, little pieces of plastics are found to be everywhere on our planet, in the far deserts, in the most remote mountains and in the ocean. And we have heard about the concept of planetary boundaries this morning in the keynote speech. And actually, this year, plastic leakage or plastic littering in the environment has been judged to have exceeded the safe operating space of humanity as part of the planetary boundary of so-called novel entities. So this highlights that global plastic pollution endangers our planetary health. And therefore, more and more legislative actions have been taken in the past years on the international level, also on national and regional levels. And one of the policies that has been adopted quite recently is the EU Single-Use Plastics Directive that you might have heard of. And this is a policy that we try to evaluate based on citizen science data. And we have several data sources for this um, endeavor. And one of the data sources is the Plastic Pirates Project. Who are the Plastic Pirates? The Plastic Pirates Go Europe um, project is a project for school children and youth. And the children um, go together on an excursion at a river nearby and they collect plastic samples from the river banks, but also microplastic sample from the river. They document their findings and then they upload the findings on our website. Um, they follow a methodology that we set out in these materials that we provide free of charge to all schools that are interested. And I've brought some of the copies, so if you're interested, you can come after the presentation and I can hand over some of the materials. Um, the data that we take a look at in the study that I'm presenting here is based on data included or that was collected in five sampling campaigns from spring 2019 to spring 2021. And in this time period, more than 8,000 participants have contributed with their data um, yeah, to the study. In addition to the Plastic Pirates data, um, we look at three other um, data sets from other sampling protocols, and these focus on coastlines. So the plastic pirates focus on rivers, and here we focus on coastlines with um, Marine Litter Watch and the International Coastal Cleanup that are also citizen science data sets, and then we have the data from OSPA Commission um, in addition to the citizen science data sets. And I don't know if you know these um, different sampling protocols, but they have dozens and dozens of categories of litter items. And for the study that we are conducting here, we had to condense these um, categories to a manageable number. Um, in the end, we came up with 21 categories that focus on the one hand on single-use plastics and on other commonly occurring litter items made from other materials, such as, for instance, uh, glass or metal or paper. On the basis of the litter data, we then um, came up with three different scenarios that we take a look at, and these scenarios evolve around the policy measures that, um, that were introduced by the EU Single-Use Plastics Directive. This directive, on the one hand, bans certain single-use plastic items. I'm sure you have came, come across this. Um, the bans include, for instance, plastics cutlery or also plastics cotton buds. And there are other um, items, such as, for instance, plastic bottles or wet wipes, that are addressed by other measures such as extended producer responsibility or awareness raising campaigns or um, also um, product redesign requirements for these um, different products. And um, the different scenarios are to be sort more of a thought experiment um, because there's very little data on the general effectiveness of policy measures on single-use plastics. Um, so just um, to keep that in mind, 
here you see the three scenarios that we took a look at, which we named best case scenario, moderate improvement scenario, and then the scenario where only the bands are effective. Um, here on the side, let me see if it works. Uh, you see all the different categories of single-use plastics that are to be in, that are included in the single-use plastics directive. And then, as an example for the best-case scenario, here we assume that um, all policy measures are 100% effective. That would mean that all the litter from these items that are listed here would vanish completely in the environment. Obviously, we know that this is quite unrealistic uh, to be happening, but it's, um, we think it's still interesting to look at this because it's the maximum positive impact that the um, directive could have. So here we start with the first results regarding the litter data. And you see that plastics are, uh, cover a large share of the plastic, uh, of the whole litter items to be found on the river sites in Germany um, and also the coastlines in Germany and then the coastlines in the European Union. Plastics is covered by the uh, pink, violet, light yellow and dark yellow bars. So it's from about 50% in the plastic pirate sampling that is here the first. Um, the first one um, up to 97% um, in the case where, we where most plastic items were found. And um, overall we see that single-use plastics are quite a large part of the plastics that were found. So here we, we would include the cigarette butts also as single-use plastics. So. Um, but there's quite a variety of variation between the different protocols. In terms of the citizen science sampling, so the International Coastal Cleanup, the uh, Marine Litter Watch and the Plastic Pirates, we see that the composition is a bit different, but in general the picture looks quite similar, whereas for OSPA the picture looks really different. And we believe that could be because for the OSPA protocol, um, coastlines are chosen that um, have access to the open sea. and there are no buildings at these sites. And uh, for, the, um, for the citizen science uh, spots that are um, where, where it is sampled, obviously we have different, different places. It's the places where, where people can access easily a beach or easily the riverside. Um, last point, if we only look at Germany, um, and compare the difference between the river sites of so the plastic pirates data and the coastlines, then we see that at the river sites, much more metal, glass, and paper was found in contrast to the coastlines. And here you see the results of our scenario analysis. Um, the first, the, the graph number A, here shows a hypothetical best case scenario, and we see that in this case, riparian and coastal environments could be um, could be much cleaner, let's say, if if the measures of the directive would be 100% effective. In terms of the total litter, that would be 40% or more of the litter that could be avoided. And with regards to plastics waste, it would be 50 to about 80%. And still in the moderate improvement scenario, um, we still see substantial reductions in total litter quantities and also in terms of plastic litter quantities. For total litter, it would be about 11 to 20%. So here, and then about 15 to 25 uh, for the plastics litter. If you look at the uh, only band scenario, so here the graph number C, we see that in this case we really see only a marginal reduction of litter and plastics litter quantities. So 3 to 6 percent at the coastlines in Europe and only 1 to 2 percent for the sampling sites in Germany. What do we conclude from this scenario analysis? First of all, that 
if we only have bans to be effective in the SUP directive, that will be not enough to signif significantly reduce litter quantities. Um, that was shown by the only ban scenario. Um, therefore, we need other measures to be effective as well. Then, as a second uh, point, we see some items, such as the cigarette butts, um, that occur in very large quantities. And here, it's crucial that we have instruments at all to address these items, even if they are only partially effective. So even if we only have an effectiveness of, for instance, 25%, that would only have a huge impact on overall litter quantities. And at the third point, it, um, it's really gonna change the picture, let's say, how EU member states implement measures, for instance, with regards to clean-up activities, um, because as this is a, is a directive of the EU, the member states have leeway of how they introduce this in their states, and this will um, have a strong impact on whether the measures are effective or not so effective. In addition, I would like to emphasize with regard to citizen science that citizen science for our study plays a crucial role to evaluate the large-scale policy instrument SUP directive or single-use plastics directive. So only with the help of the citizen scientists we could cover such a large scale in terms of both time, um, time period but also geographical area. And as an outlook, um, when we look at the policy, we see that the current provisions alone are not sufficient to solve the litter problem. This is because the scope of the directive is quite narrow. It only focuses on certain single-use plastic items. And there's also still the risk that single-use plastic items are substituted by other single-use items made from materials such as paper or glass. And therefore, we, we recommend um, that the EU should align its policies more effectively with the so-called waste hierarchy that you see here on the right-hand side. And it should truly prioritize waste reduction and reuse options in new legislative measures. And this is the end of my presentation. And I thank you and wait for your questions. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Um, we just had a, a plastics presentation this morning. I looked to uh, the presenter over there, I spotted him already. Um, we talked in this last presentation about microplastics. You focused on macroplastics. Uh, do you have a specific reason for that? Actually, the Plastic Pirates not only focus on uh, macroplastics, but um, the school children also have a net and take a microplastic sampling. However, this sampling covers only so-called larger microplastics until one millimeter. And this is because it's just getting a bit too complicated for the school children, because we have children from grammar schools participating in the project. And therefore, we decided not to use these, like take a look at the smaller items that are covered in the project that we heard about this morning. So I think there are good synergies between the two projects. So it depends also a bit on the age, I understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think I didn't mention it, but uh, we, we cover more or less 10 to 16 years old. Thank you. Are there other questions? No, I think we need coffee. Oh, my God. <laughs> then I have another one. Have ah, okay, there's one. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. So my question is, since uh, these are children who are engaged um, in this project, um, in your experience, have they said something about how the grown-ups are sort of making a mess and they are sort of caring about the environment and doing something for it? How is their attitude towards this? Yeah. Um, we, as the consortium for the project, we usually don't go on the excursions ourselves, but we provide all the materials and the teachers go with their classes themselves. So we don't always have this direct you know, reaction of what the um, students think. Actually, what we hear quite a bit is if they don't find a lot of plastics, they are sometimes upset <laughs> because they want to find something, they want to you know, uh, participate, and then we need to somehow communicate 
indicate, well, that is actually the best case scenario. If you don't find any plastics at your river, that's what we you know, would want to see more often. Um, but in general, yes, there is quite an awareness among the students and we see this because um, after the project we have quite often actually students coming individually to us and they want to do a research project themselves um, on the topic. So they continue researching the topic after their class has participated in the project. So I think this is quite a good example of how they, you know, they relate to the topic and they want to change something. And in the materials for the teachers, um, we also have a whole section that kind of continues to work on the uh, topic after the excursion, which, uh, which is called, like, now it's your turn. So what the students, what the school children could do with the, with the knowledge that, that they have gained to, to become active and not stay in this passive, oh my God, this is also a horrible uh, feeling. Yeah. I would have another question. Uh, we all know that plastic waste and freshwater, marine waters is, is also a big problem in the global south uh, specifically. Um, do you think that you could transfer your approach to, to other regions? Yeah, actually, um, there is a project in Chile that has a very similar approach, and that was one of the mother projects, or father projects, uh, of the plastic pirates. So there are already similar approaches in global south countries, and I think the general idea is, is quite easily adjustable for other geographical contexts. I mean, then in the details have to be adjusted, obviously, but it's definitely possible. Perfect. We have another question here. Uh, the question is, do you work also with other youth uh, associations which are not really, uh, which are not schools, for instance, uh, you know, scouts or, that's my question actually, because you could um, uh, extend your scope. Yes. So we have no like official cooperation with youth organizations, but um, apart from school classes, we have youth groups from, for instance, environmental organizations, from scouts, um, from yeah, broader civil society, I would say, that participate in, in the project. But yeah, this is, this is not, yeah, not official cooperation, as I said. Yes, please. <laughs> Once more. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Naya Grilla from the University of Athens. And what about teachers? You said you don't implement the project yourself. How do you approach teachers? Is there a training program before uh, they start implementing against students? So we approach teachers um, mainly via mailing to pretty much every single school in Germany. Um, and we have also an email list of interested teachers that is growing and growing. So that is how we approach teachers. And the materials are, well, presented in a way that teachers can pretty much take them and use them directly with their school classes. But there's also an online webinar format every half year where interested teachers can learn a bit more in detail how to implement the Plastic Pirates. But I think we have maybe a hundred teachers participating in the webinar, but much more teachers that um, get the materials from, from us, like around 400 maybe uh, over six months, and more teachers using the material than that have participated in the webinars. So I think, I haven't developed the materials, but I think uh, my colleagues have done quite a good job to make it very easy for the teachers. And we also have a hotline for teachers. So if they have questions regarding the materials and how to conduct the sampling, they can just call us or send us an email. And um, that's also crucial that we, uh, it's very easy for them to reach us and that we respond to any questions that they have. I think uh, we would have to close slowly, but I would like to ask one last question since we are here in this uh, session on from 
practitioners to policy makers. Uh, you mentioned the different scenarios. My question would be, would, because we heard before from uh, Maria, uh, involving uh, the municipalities could make sense to also pick up the results. Would it make sense in your case also to involve more practitioner, uh, policy makers or decision makers into the policy uh, in the project design to actually also implement or achieve a best case scenario or moderate mm. the scenario? I think it would be great to now take the results and actually, yeah, take the results and go to policy makers. Um, and I think this step hasn't been done so yet. But I mean, this is based on a manuscript that also hasn't been published yet. So I think when the step of publication of this data is done, then we can take maybe the next step and discuss this, for instance, with the European Commission, because the plastic pilots are now also partially funded by the EU Commission, so they are also interested in receiving data from the project. So I hope they are also interested in, you know, then taking up the data and translating it into political decisions. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, and a big applause again. <laughs> And now we come to our last presentation. We have Matrona Papa, she's here, and she will talk about citizen observatories as educational tools in school environmental education. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Matrona Papa, and I'm here on behalf of the Environmental Education Lab, a research unit based at the Department of Educational Studies of the National Capodistrian University of Athens in Greece, the NKUA. We are here to present part of the work we are conducting uh, under the Cosford Cloud project. Very briefly, uh, it's a three-year Horizon 2020 project uh, coordinated by the Spanish Research Council. Uh, with 15 partners and designed to promote citizen science uh, by developing 12 te technological services to improve citizen observatories. Uh, nine uh, well-known European citizen observatories participate. Uh, four of them are about uh, focusing on biodiversity and uh, the rest on environmental quality issues and topics. Uh, the NKUA participates with Environmental Education Lab and a team of five uh, senior and junior researchers. Uh, what is our role? Our role is to promote, set up, implement, uh, and evaluate uh, citizen science activities that make use of those observatories and through integration into school-based environmental uh, education for sustainability practices. The COs we used in our project are PlantNet for plant species identification and recording and odor collect for the monitoring of uh, odor pollution and the olfactory identity of place. Well, our case study. Um, today I will uh, present, I will share with you two uh, educational uh, activities uh, that uh, were uh, part of a school-based environmental education project. Uh, they were aimed to engage primary school students uh, from uh, the Greek island of Chios in the northeastern Aegean Sea. Um, and uh, they were part of an educational scenario focusing on the um, ecological value of a local wetland and uh, the nurturing of the student's sense of place and belonging to the place, to that place. So, 64 primary school students from grade B to grade uh, E, aged 8 to 11 years old, participated, um, forming four groups uh, um, from children, uh, from students from several classes and participated as both learners and co-researchers. Uh, four field trips um, were organized and carried out in the wetland during April and May 2022. Well, uh, a few words about the main pedagogical approach that lead uh, that leads uh, our efforts. Uh, well, it's a long uh, post-humanist and new materialist line of thought 
uh, highlighting in that way the agency of the more than human world and the emergence of complex relationships between human and more than human actants. And within this frame, children are thought of as integral parts of uh, interdependent socio-ecological networks or else assemblances. Uh, one fundamental principle um, in this approach is that we learn in, with, and through the assemblances of bodies of different types, of all types, material bodies, discursive, technological bodies. And um, by realizing that we are in and we are part of these assemblages, that we, that we belong to the assemblances, we appreciate the role and the value of each other and the importance of our coexistence and coevolution with the rest of the world around us. And we emphasize on the embodied dimension of learning by paying attention to our interactions and sensory experience with the world. Aligned with those lines of thought, all types of technologies are considered, uh, become a, an important non-human actor in collaborative work with agency, in collaborative work with the children in the assemblances. The two activities that I'm going to present to you focused on creating pedagogical encounters based on child wetland technologies assemblages that emerge in the field and helping children to identify the affective power and the agency of the more than human world and the ways in which place and technology together uh, in pedagogical terms, are necessary and valuable agents in the creation of emerging learning possibilities and opportunities for the children. So, in our first activity, my own private one square meter, we ask children to select their own private one square meter. It can be two or three square meters, and to, to take their time to delve into how they connect into the assemblance, to attune with the elements around them, to observe biodiversity, to take pictures of plants and flowers, and to use the plant and tap. And then to share thoughts, ideas, and feelings about that embodied experience they had. Here is an example of a child flora technology assemblance in April. Here are some plants and flowers of our wetland that we want to share with you. And here is another child flora technology assemblance in May, when children realize uh, that there are different kinds of flowers and uh, plants in each month. They're not the same. And moving on now to our second activity, sending around the walk, the environmental odors trail. Uh, here, children are invited to get into sensory walks along the shoreline of the wetland. The walks are conducted in pairs, are conducted in pairs. One child is blindfolded and the other seeing and leading the way. The blindfolded uh, child um, identifies and, record, and uh, describes odors, the odors they encounter, while the other child, based on the characteristics requested by the odor collect platform, uh, records the data in real time. Then together they try to identify uh, the origin, the cause of the odors, and they take photos of the spots, and uh, then they switch roles. So enabling uh, geolocation, we, they record their observations as they experience them in real time. And thus they contribute to the creation of a collaborative map on the International Order Observatory platform, sharing their experience and their case uh, with the rest of the world. So what is our goal? by the design of this, by this pedagogical design. First is to explore possible synergies between environmental education for sustainability and citizen science, synergies that can be innovative, inspiring, and with a learning potential. And to introduce 
French, fresh and challenging theoretical and methodological perspe perspectives. In our case, through the lens of posthumanism and new materialism. For viewing what is being taken place, what has produced, what is being going on within the people, place, technologies, assemblances in order to make room for different agents in building ch children's experiences. Well, through this perspective, uh, we see learning environments as uh, relational encounters. And based on the, um, based on the evaluation uh, study we conducted, uh, children expressed a sense of belonging to a place uh, by learning through embodied experience of immersing to place with their senses, smelling, touching, uh, hugging, feeling, seeing, and, of course, through the technologies they used. It's nice to share the smells and beauties of your place. We are all our own place, aren't we? I admire it, I love it, and I share its beauty with the rest of the world. These are some of the words of the children that I would like to share with you. Uh, from a pedagogical perspective, we, design, we devised a design that um, um, where a, a, a range of more than human actants became catalysts for teaching and learning. Um, our design allowed children to function in unison with the different elements they encountered, to pay attention to the materiality of the world with all their senses, with all their senses, not only with seeing, and uh, uh, in that way they help them realize and feel that they, they become together with the wetlands. I was struck by how many wonderful flowers and plants were there are in such a small piece of land. We're not alone. And um, my place taught me to appreciate life itself. Look at me, I'm becoming rock, so as not to disturb the herons. So soon I'll become heron and fly high with them. And I will close uh, my presentation with a personal insight as a teacher and an educational researcher that uh, the, those synergies between environmental education for sustainability and citizen science offer genuinely valuable and diverse learning experiences. Children not only experience active citizenship by becoming researchers, uh, but they also enhance and expand their senses with technology citizen science offers, and by experiencing place through more than one way, through the senses, through technologies, their desire to get to know and learn more in strengthened. Uh, I learned to explore in a different way. I felt good as a researcher and explorer and sharing things with the rest of the world. The rest of the world gets to know my place, learns to love it, and so, and so we learn to love and appreciate their own place too. Some references. Danke schön, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, this also reminds me um, a presentation we had this morning in the motivation, learning, evaluation, no, motivation, <laughs> sorry, evaluation impact session, where we also discussed different types of learning. So I think this would also fit. We may discuss also um, later on. But before, do you have questions? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Very, very interesting. And especially to see Michael Jorgensen from Denmark, especially to see your, let's say, STS approach where you include the interaction between the surroundings, the children, and maybe also the technologies. Could you say something about the equipment and will that equipment help them sensing something different from others? Okay, the, the equipment that we used were smart devices, uh, smartphones, and tablets. If I, if I understand well the question, I'm exactly. Not sure if I... This is how I understood. Okay. Yes. Further questions. 
And uh, mm -hmm. yes. we, collected, we collected the data, but it wasn't easy to uh, process all the data in the field. So we continued at school. We took picture, uh, pictures, and then we identified them uh, in the, in the plant net, on the PlantNet uh, platform. Uh, but with the order collect, uh, we did that in real time. We used uh, data, the data we had on our smartphones, because there, there wasn't any network. Yes, one more press. No, that's all. Uh, just to ask you, are you going to be able to repeat the exercise with the children? Will they be able to continue to do it again in the coming school year? Yes, of course. This is our aim. Our aim uh, from the beginning was to introduce and integrate citizen science and citizen observatories into school-based practices and uh, not only in environmental uh, education uh, projects. I hope... Uh, uh, in, uh, in other projects too, in biology, in uh, physics, and in every other. I'm, uh, uh, I did that from my part, uh, from my role in school, and I hope uh, uh, my colleagues will embrace the, the idea that I had, and uh, I'm open to collaborations with, with all of them, and I hope that uh, the children want that very much. They ask again and again, uh, Mrs., uh, are we going to do that next year? Oh, of course, I say, of course. Do you want it? Of course we do. But why do they want it? Yes. But why? Why are they so interested in the project? Um, it was something uh, new for them because they realized that they could use a smartphone or a tablet in a different way. The, they told me that, but we didn't have the time to, uh, for me to present all the findings that I had. Oh, uh, they, they realized that uh, ta the tablet is not just for playing games, but they do something. They felt good <laughs> as researchers because they, they really liked it. They really enjoyed their new role, let's say. Yes, they contribute. Mm -hmm. to the, their local community. And yes, please. Thank you for the presentation. I was just very curious, since the project is about also the place sense of belonging, and being Hios, the island it is, and located where it is, I was just wondering how diverse was the cultural background of the children. As far as I saw, all the names were Greek or Greek sounding, and I was yeah, the cultural background, were there refugee children involved, and how did that differ in how they related to the place? I'm not sure that I understand the question about the children. Yes, all the children were from the island of Hios. Yes, and so were they all ethnically Greek, or was it a variety, have been refugee children involved, and how is their sense of place, because of living less time on the island, different from children who have maybe been born there or has this not been explored oh, at all? All the children were born there. Yes, we, we didn't have children from other cultures. That would be very interesting. If we had children from other countries, if, uh, or if uh, the children we had in our team uh, were just one or two years in, in Hios, that would be very interesting, but we didn't have children from... So we have already a follow-up project idea. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> but that's um, a great idea. That's a great <laughs> idea to, to expand <laughs> our plans. Yes. Um, I would have another small question. I don't know if I missed it, but um, this morning we also discussed a lot the issues uh, we face when we want to work with children. We need an okay very often from, from the parents, um, also from, from the teachers in general. Did you have any issues in that regard? Ah, uh, no, because um, this was a part of a school-based environmental education project. We do environmental, environmental education projects in Greek schools every year. We don't have any problem with that, with mm -hmm. the organi organization of a... And, mm -hmm. of course, we have uh, the consent of the, of the parents for... Uh, you but you, yeah, yes, exactly. So you yes, don't have to yes. ask beforehand again yes. if you can do it because you are the, the teacher, basically, so you can do what you want. <laughs> yes. No, every year at the beginning of the school year, uh, we ask the parents uh, to give us a letter of consent mm -hmm. 
in order to, uh, for us to be free or to allow their children to take part in school-based uh, activities. We don't have, thankfully, we don't have that problem in Greece. Perfect. One last question. Hey, uh, Gaston Remmers uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, I was wondering, you introduced the uh, pedagogical, pedagogical background of your project as post-humanism informed. Now, I understand that you talk about this in this audience, but uh, when you talk about with the children or with the parents to have their consent to, to do this, uh, how would you motivate the fact that you take this approach? What language would you use? How would you phrase post-humanism in simple words? Words, words. Uh, in the recent years, there is a growing interest in uh, research about uh, posthumanism and, um, and new materialism. Um, the, main, the, the main principle, let's say, uh, the fundamental principle of this approach, of these lines of thought, is that they try to challenge a lot of um, ontological, uh, epistemological, and ethical dimensions of the, um, of the dominant anthropocentric uh, paradigm. Uh, they challenge the supremacy, the superiority of uh, the human being that we are above all. And uh, they try to highlight, the addre to address, and uh, to put for forth the, um, the agency of all other entities, not only the human entities and materialities of the world. And um, we embrace uh, a posthuman ethics to, um, let's say, to give value to, to everyone here. We are not the, the lords of the world, we humans. There are so many other entities and materialities around us, and we are just one part of that assemblance. This exactly is an assemblance. It's well a set of, uh, of, of bodies of all types affect and be affected by each other constantly. I think these are very nice closing words for the session. <laughs> Thank you very much again. We are just a yeah, part yeah. of our world. Hmm? Yes, we are just one part of our world. We are not our world. Thank you so much again um, for your presentation. <laughs> Before we all leave for the coffee break, I just uh, wanted to summarize a bit um, what we heard. Um, I think we all have our own summaries <laughs> and our own takeaways, but just to remind us, uh, we had four, I think, quite different presentations because we had different resources that we focus on. We heard about marine waters, fresh waters, uh, terrestrial systems, biodiversity. We also heard about different parameters we take a look at. When it's about flood, it's more about water levels. When it's about uh, plastics, then it's more about like water quality. Um, we also heard about others. Um, we wanted also to hear about chemical parameters. That would have been interesting, but I think at the next conference <laughs> we will pick this up again. What we also learned, we had very different tools. Uh, we had many different ways how we approach uh, these um, monitoring activities, but what I felt in the session, the new technologies are pretty yeah, on vogue, uh, specifically in the projects that we have here. Um, but when it comes uh, to the questions that we have, uh, again, we have many, many different questions, but one overarching question may be how we come from the practitioners' activities to actually uh, to political change, policy change. And uh, just to remind us that we have a couple of ideas here in the session. Uh, we heard about good communication in the very first presentation. We heard about a very early involvement of politicians, of policy makers in the project design. We heard about problem pressure. So when there's a strong pressure to address a certain problem, then maybe policy makers would also pick up the results. We heard about uh, very good research. So maybe sometimes you want to wait first and, and see what type of research comes out of it, have a good high impact publication, and then policymaker will rather listen to us. And uh, at the, in the very last presentation, we did not talk about policymakers, but at least we talked about active citizenship, public engagement that may come up, uh, come up out of these citizen science projects. And I think this is also a nice um, yeah, causal <laughs> effect that we may have between the project itself and the policy change. 
Um, with this, I really like to close and thank you again for listening with one small remark. I learned, I see Sophie nodding. Um, first of all, I have to thank Sophie. <laughs> I almost forgot. Um, she's sitting here in front and uh, really takes care that we all uh, take uh, not enough time, including myself. Also, thank you to all the technicians in the back and here next to us who really take care that you also uh, hear the presenters. And um, yeah, last point, uh, many of us, including myself, have brought some drinks into this room. I <laughs> didn't bring food, but we were reminded that we shouldn't drink or eat inside because this building here is very old and we, really, we should really take care that nothing happens to the building. So take a coffee now outside and then you're uh, happy again and can come back. Thank you.
Hello and welcome everybody to this session. We will uh, try to get started on time. I'm sure more people are going to join us as they finish their coffee. My name is Gita Krak. I'm from Aarhus University and Nordeco in Denmark, and I will be chairing this session. And it is on healthy cities, resolving human nature conflicts through citizen science. We have five presentations lined up. It's going to be very interesting, a lot of different aspects. We all know that cities are super important for us as humans. Most humans do live in cities, uh, but they can also be really important for a lot of other things, including nature and biodiversity in a lot of different ways. And this is some of the things that we will hear about today. So going uh, straight into, you guys have probably been in other sessions uh, today, but the way it goes, speakers have 10 minutes, 12 minutes, then we will shut them down. And there will be a little bit of time for questions and answers. So please think about questions that you would like to pose to our presenters as they speak. And first up, if we have another slide, maybe, is Mohamed Garesifat uh, talking about city measure. Uh, citizen Science for Smart and Healthy European Cities. Please welcome Marvin. Thank you so much. Uh, let me see. Uh, I think here is good, right? Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, let's see if I get the slides to start with. So, uh, a pleasure to be here today, seeing many of you after quite some, some time. Uh, my name is Mohamed Garasifat, I'm from Eurocities, based in Brussels. And today I would like to introduce you to uh, a project that we have actually working with uh, a number of European cities uh, on the topic of citizen science, and the project is called City Measure. Uh, and uh, a little bit of information, background information uh, about the project. Uh, we have this overarching objective of uh, basically supporting the application of citizen science. Uh, sometimes also cities refer to it as citizen measurement, but that's only one aspect of citizen science, as we know, uh, to create smart, sustainable, and inclusive uh, European cities. Uh, the project is funded by the uh, European Commission through the DG reform. And uh, we started last year, around June, uh, with this project. It's a two-year project. And uh, basically the concept is uh, co-creation with uh, a number of cities, organizations, uh, and individuals active in the field of citizen science. So we have brought together 40 plus cities, organizations, and individuals, around 70 of those, uh, around three main challenges for citizen science that I will uh, introduce in the next slide. And we have produced uh, some results already that I would like to share with you uh, briefly. So, uh, started uh, last year, around June, uh, we kicked off the project and uh, of course the initial step was to, was to bring together the actors that we wanted to basically discuss these challenges or problems with. So on the slide you see a network, kind of a tangled network of uh, uh, cities, government organizations, research organizations and other types of organizations. So these are color-coded blue, uh, green, uh, darker blue, and uh, red. And uh, the topics that we have covered uh, are the topics of digital inclusion. So imagine uh, with increased digitization, uh, how to make sure that basically we don't uh, leave people behind, we don't create new forms of exclusion. Uh, topics of behavior and policy, of course, two different topics, but there was an interest to uh, have them in one working group or uh, one community to discuss. So behavior change and policy change aspects of citizen science, we have them in one working group. And then we have the issue of comparability of data results, outputs from citizen science initiatives in one working group. Uh, to bring together basically the efforts of the different working groups, we also have a strategy and oversight, uh, which kind of acts as a glue to bring together uh, the, the exchanges of these working groups. 
Uh, we have a set of visions uh, for each working group uh, on the digital link, and these are basically co-created by the members of the working group. So they uh, had discussions on, on what to focus on because these topics are very diverse and basically it's impossible to cover every aspect of digital inclusion. So what to focus on, uh, we, uh, here we focus on the issue of competencies for digital inclusion. Uh, think about the skills, knowledge, attitude needed by different actors, uh, and by different actors, I mean policy makers, decision makers, municipal employees, but also citizens who want to get engaged in citizen science projects. Uh, on the behavior and uh, policy change, uh, basically uh, here the scope is a little bit more broad. Uh, we're focusing on uh, issues like trust, uh, new cultures of collaboration, sharing responsibilities, and how basically different actors can work together to bring out these nice outcomes of citizen science projects, behavior change, policy change. Uh, for the working group comparability, again, a huge topic. It's difficult to cover. Uh, um, you can go in the direction of interoperability of data, results, etc. But we wanted to keep focus, so we uh, chose a thematic focus, which is air quality. And here we try to create an inventory of citizen science projects on the topic of air quality uh, to basically enable that learning from each other, what types of methods are used, what type of devices are used, how you engage citizens, and uh, what uh, perhaps platforms or uh, types of interfaces do you use for presenting the results, etc. So cities and organizations that are involved in this can learn from each other. Uh, so far we have produced uh, a preliminary version of these uh, three uh, results or outputs. Uh, yeah, by the funding call we call them instruments, but these are not really devices or technical instruments. Uh, the one on the top, it's called City Air, so this is the inventory of air quality monitoring initiatives that I mentioned. Uh, we are now in the process of collecting, adding initiatives on the topic of air quality, so if you have one or if you're engaged in one, uh, please get in touch. We can present the, uh, the initiative there and it gives, of course, the exposure for your project, but also people can learn from you and that exchange can happen. Uh, we also have two sets of guidelines uh, on the two topics of behavior change and policy change. These build on a number of resources that we uh, reviewed together as, uh, this, uh, in these uh, two groups. Uh, 59 resources uh, inform the behavior and policy guidelines and 39 inform the digital inclusion one. And by resources I mean, of course, scientific publications, but also project reports, deliverables, uh, other types of documents. Uh, and we dive into challenges applications on the two area. Uh, for the uh, behavior and policy, we came up with a set of recommendations that are directed either to cities or citizen science initiatives. Uh, for the uh, issue of competencies, uh, we had an, a step in between, so we broke open the clusters of skills, knowledge, and attitude based on the literature, based on the knowledge of the crowd that we had. Uh, to uh, basically enable uh, projects to also look into this more systematically. And we have 32 specific recommendations as well there. The idea is uh, towards the end of this year, we uh, work towards a more digital and uh, less text-based version of these guidelines that is easily accessible for everybody. So at the moment they are in PDF versions, a bit boring, but then uh, we are going to make them more attractive, searchable, etc. towards the end of the year. Uh, so all of these uh, are captured in, the, uh, in a place that we call it the Knowledge Center of, of City Measure. So there you can access the uh, public deliverables, but also these instruments, guidelines, and we're going to add also trainings on perhaps how to add, for example, your initiative to the city air. Uh, tool that we've developed. And uh, now, of course, uh, having this produced and not tested was not the idea, so we have also some pilots, so these are uh, cities or initiatives who wanted to work with these guidelines, who wanted to work with these tools. Uh, we have the city of Bobigny in France, and they're running an air quality monitoring campaign and they wanted to use basically the recommendations from our guidelines to inform how to design those campaigns, how to uh, basically communicate about those campaigns, how to evaluate them. 
we have another one on air quality. It's a famous topic across cities. And that's the case of Sensor2 School in Prague. So uh, they are working with uh, students on a DIY type of uh, citizen science project. Students, they uh, build these sensors of air quality monitoring uh, with the help of the teacher. And then they use them, uh, basically, we are uh, testing the digital inclusion guidelines here to look into the skills of knowledge that the students gain through the process of uh, basically building these sensors, using them, and, and so on. Uh, with the city of Rosalara, they have a project uh, focused on uh, urban uh, flooding, smart water land, and uh, we are helping them develop their communication strategy and the monitoring and evaluation plan using the help of the guidelines. And with Barcelona, a little bit of a different approach. There we have the citizen science office of the uh, city, the city of Barcelona engaged. And they want to basically uh, show different projects uh, what these guidelines are, what these tools are, how they can use it. So we are organizing some sort of training on these guidelines with the city of Barcelona. The training is planned for November this year. And, of course, if you want to know more, there is the uh, project website, citymeasure.eu, and uh, there's a QR code here that you can scan, and it takes you directly to the three products that, or the three outcomes that I just explained. Uh, and if you have any questions, just approach me. Do we have any questions? Yes, I have a question. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Anne Land from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Um, listening today to many talks, there seems like there are several projects, like EU big projects, that do similar things, like guidelines, tools, overarching reviews. How does this project add to that, or is different, or how does it fit the, the whole ecosystem? Thanks a lot. Uh, I think it's a very interesting question. It also mm, was a lot of aha moment for me throughout the day to see, okay, we're doing something which is very similar. It's overlapping with something that someone else does. If I want to differentiate a little bit here, I would say, uh, firstly, the actors are a little bit different. So we normally don't have cities or city administration and stuff as a uh, core actor who thinks about the, uh, let's say, the backstage, about uh, the, the theories behind, about how to look at the issue of competences, etc. So in that way, I would say city measure is different. And uh, in another aspect, of course, it's a, it's a big, uh, rather big group of people uh, exchanging and discussing. And uh, some of them with a lot of experience, others with less others with enthusiasm, or bringing different perspectives, I would say in that aspect we were a bit lucky to, to have this diverse group discussing together. Yeah. Any other questions? Otherwise, I have a follow-up while you guys are thinking up more questions. Um, so, I was thinking the same thing, how does this tie in with everything else? But also being only a two-year project, what happens when the project ends? Where are these materials? Where can they be found? How are you communicating and disseminating uh, everything? Thank you so much. Uh, you're touching on a very big challenge, of course, for us and, and uh, many other projects. Uh, what uh, we have thought about, of course, to, to continue maintaining this uh, knowledge center, but also thinking about integrating it into existing uh, more long-term planning of, of resources, for example, EU.citizen science or other yeah, parallel efforts that can host this for a longer time so the community can use it uh, beyond the lifetime of city measure. And of course, I have to ask, uh, are you a member of the EXA working group on air quality in this project? Unfortunately not, no. Ooh, that would be a very good thing to... Uh, Thank you so much. <laughs> Any other questions? So, I will keep asking questions then. Please go ahead. <laughs> 
So these guidelines, are they specifically created for governments? You're saying you do work with governments, but is it also for organizations, for educational institutions? Who are they mainly aimed at? Uh, we have specified this in, in the guidelines, so who is it relevant for? But as two major clusters, I would say it's relevant for cities and for citizen science initiatives. So those who want to either start a citizen science initiative, regardless of whether it's a, uh, mm, let's say, a group of volunteers who want to set up or start a project, or is it from, let's say, the scientists uh, in academia starting that? Uh, and cities, of course, it's, it's a core focus there because uh, we thought this is something that is lacking a little bit and we also understood it a little bit more working with these working groups and cities, that that gap of knowledge is there, the enthusiasm, of course, is also there, so the art is to bring the two together. Yeah. And just a quick final one for me. Uh, language. So you're working with a lot of different people and so the guidelines are available in how many languages? Uh, at the moment only in English, so there is uh, plans for translation uh, of the, uh, let's say, interactive version. So the interactive version, but it comes out, we have uh, plans for uh, different languages, but at the moment it's only available, the document, in, in English. Excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Very okay. interesting. Thank you. And I am missing a speaker, I think. Emmanuel. Yeah. Ah, she is? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. We've had a change of, um, well, slight change in the program. Another speaker was not able to uh, make it to the session. He is unfortunately off uh, sick. So Valentin couldn't make it, but luckily we have Emmanuel Gonzalez, who will be uh, presenting a little bit. And then we do have a recorded uh, presentation from Valentin on the a citizen science experiment on public lighting policies, a helpful step toward a dark infrastructure at a local level. Please. A big program. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I am Emmanuel, and I'm uh, introduced uh, the presentation of uh, Valentin. Valentin uh, Bomstark uh, is the twin researcher, and he works on the, this experimentation. Uh. Okay. Um, I'm going to present you uh, Mosaic. Mosaic uh, is a service uh, unit created in uh, 2000 by uh, the Muséum National d'Histoire Naturelle and the Sorbonne University. We develop a project and platform of citizen science in various fields, biodiversity, medical, human science. And uh, we will group a team of 20 people, developers, web designers, project managers, we rely on the museum expertise because uh, the museum um, uh, have a very strong expertise uh, on citizen science, uh, 50 years of experience, 2,000 uh, projects of citizen science, 20,000 uh, participants each year, and 160 publications, 37 um, theses. Alors, this is the project. The, pro the name of the project is uh, SPOT. It's the first experimentation of participatory democracy based on citizen science in France. We are three partners, uh, the consortium, inclusive science and European democracies. Uh, this is a H2020 project of research and uh, they funded uh, this, uh, this project. They develop um, a project uh, with uh, them based on citizen science. And uh, we work with two uh, researchers who are involved in the evaluation of the process. Mosaic, we developed the citizen, uh, the citizen social uh, science platform. And we work with uh, two municipalities, 
which we experimented a new form of citizen participation. One topic uh, was uh, chosen, it's reducing public lighting at the commune level. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, the platform, uh, SPOT. Uh, this platform uh, has been developed uh, for the experiment. Uh, she uh, was launched from April to June, and uh, Libon and Meles residents were invited to participate online. This is the protocol, a scientific protocol uh, to discover obscurity and its psychological impact based on observation and emotion. Uh, there are uh, five steps. The first step, participants choose the condition in which they want to experiment darkness and have the possibility to share a childhood memory linked with darkness. After that, they go out at night in this condition and they remain three or five minutes at the same place. And they explain their feeling and their observations. After th um, they can also, sorry, they can also uh, take um, pictures, videos, or record sound. After that, they fill in the form online and share their observation with the community. They ask questions to the collectivity and comment on the other participant questions. For example, is it possible to switch off one out of two street lights? Uh, yes, uh, it's enough to see your way. It could benefit biodiversity. It's cheaper. Participants express their recommendation on lights out. This is a focus uh, on uh, observation. Uh, you can explain, uh, the participant explain what was observed, what I saw, what I heard, what I felt, um, what was uh, the emotion, joy, peacefulness, amusement, worry, boredom, loneliness, and they can record media. Here you have Sorry, the media recorded. And you have uh, the uh, comments of the participants. And uh, here, it's the experience and the feeling of the participant. Um, municipalities can use this result to uh, define their uh, public policy. They uh, express, uh, participants they, uh, express their recommendation on lights out for every kind of places defined by each municipality. Uh, for example, they can select uh, the kind of place, park, town square, street, church, and their recommendations were based on their observation and emotion, uh, as I told uh, you. Uh, this is uh, a graph here, and this graph um, explains that participants were in favor of turning the light off 10 a.m., uh, 5 p.m. in autumn and winter, and um, 11 a.m. to uh, 4 p.m. and uh, in spring and summer. Valentin is going to present you the impact of uh, this methodology on citizen science and democracy for policymakers. Um, can you launch the video, please? Thank you, Emmanuel, for the presentation of our methodology. And sorry that I cannot be here with all of you. Uh, obviously, the COVID is stronger than my will. Now I will more focus on the result of our research. And what is important to keep in mind now is that our research is about the impact of, the, of our methodology, the citizen science methodology on the democracy, and not about what people said on public lighting that is important for um, policy makers. Here you can see the number of participants compared uh, compare with the number of inhabitants of each municipality. And what is important to see here is that the number of participants we have is less important than we expected on the beginning of our research. So our research was finally to understand what, why people 
didn't participate as much as other participant project uh, that was with democracy and why they, they participate less than in other citizen science projects. So to identify the reasons of this number of participants, we did 30 interview, around 30 interview in each municipality and we identify around six main reasons that can explain this number of, participa of participants. Sorry. Um, the first reasons are, I will be very quick because uh, they are common to all the citizen science projects. The first one is lack of numeric skills. Uh, people cannot just participate because they don't know how to participate. Um, the second one is the lack of workshops because even if we uh, create one or two workshops in each municipality, it was obviously not enough to have the number of participants we expected. And uh, to create this, uh, this workshops, it was even harder because it was linked to policies and policymakers and these policymakers wanted to check everything is right with their policies in uh, these uh, workshops. Uh, the third reason is the lack of link with searcher. Indeed, uh, we didn't create link between searchers and uh, participants because these two municipalities were very far from each other and um, they are also very far from Paris, so it was harder to, uh, to, to move some searcher uh, in each place. Uh, all the reasons that are more interesting because they are specific uh, to spot and specific uh, to the link between citizen science methodology and uh, demo participant democracy. Uh, the first uh, reasons here is about the scale we had on the spot project. Indeed, uh, all the mosaic projects, all the citizen science projects led by mosaic were on R on a uh, on a national scale, so it means that there is a, mm, a huge number of potential participants. But proportionally, when we compare the number of potential participants to the number of participants we had on a national territory, on the national territory, and on our municipality during the sports project, uh, we have uh, uh, more participants in spot proportionally. The second reason is that in our interview, people just don't trust in policy makers. Here, people think that um, even if they participate to this kind of online platform, they, um, this participation won't change the mind of policy makers. Finally, they think that their point of view uh, will just uh, justify policies that people already choose before they participate. It doesn't mean that this is true, it's just what people think and why people uh, doesn't uh, participate. Finally, the last reason, not the least, it's the subjectivity of our study. Indeed, in all the citizen science projects, again, people have to say objectively what they say, that what they can um, uh, measure uh, and everything. And here people have to speak about their own point of view, but their own point of view doesn't have any scientific value for them. And it means that because it doesn't have scientific value, uh, it's not worth it to participate to this kind of project because it's not scientific, finally it's just politic. Now the question is how to face this number of participants in the school of municipality? How to have participants and to uh, make this participation import, uh, valuable uh, when, you, when we want to create a link between citizen science methodology and democracy. We can follow three different tracks. The first one is to empower population, to make them trust in their own point of view, to make them trust uh, that our subjectivity has a scientific value. The second point is to make each, participa each participation sorry, uh, valuable. So it means make them feel that their participation is not, their participation is not one uh, in thousands of participation. And it means that do less uh, quantitative data and more qualitative ones. 
And finally, the last track we can follow is to constrict uh, the issue with participants. Indeed, if people constrict the issue and participate to uh, the methodology, um, people uh, will obviously uh, more tr uh, trust more uh, on this methodology and uh, will more interest on the topic. Thank you for your listening. I will now uh, let Emmanuel do the conclusion of this presentation. If you have any question about the result of our research, uh, you can ask me on the, you can mail me on the address on the screen. And uh, if you have question of, uh, on the methodology, you can just ask it to Emmanuel. Thank you for your attention and sorry to kind of be here with you. Uh, if you want to uh, ask some question to Valentin, um, I can uh, give you his email. And uh, to conclude, uh, it, um, it was a very uh, interesting um, experience. And um, we are free lessons about uh, this uh, experiment for the next uh, time. Uh, it's important to have a large number of participants it's important um, to have uh, the trust between elected official municipality and participant. And it's important too to uh, have a controversial subject. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So this time around, as you heard, uh, there's no one to answer your questions right now, but you can email any questions, and I will send an email as well, um, for this presentation. But I think there were some really important lessons learned that we have heard in other presentations and other workshops today, inclusion, look at who is actually supposed to be uh, participating in your projects, it's always a really good thing to uh, consider those and how to actually involve those people. So very good lessons uh, learned. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so now moving from air and light in cities and the locals to other things that also has an influence, one of them being tourists, just like many of us here. So wherever we go, we do actually have an impact. So that's also worth considering. And some people have looked more into that. And one of them is Elisa Lopez da Silva. And we might get another, maybe press the, there we go. Um, who will talk to us from Lisbon to the planet. Environmental Scales in Tourism Practices Shaping the City. Please welcome Elisa. Oh. Thank you. Um, so I'm presenting this paper uh, with Frederic Vidal. I'm Elisa Lopes de Silva, so Frederic Vidal and Susana Fonseca. Um, what are the scientific challenges of studying the relationship between tourism and environment? How to combine social sciences requirements and activist concerns in a citizen science project? So these are the two main questions that I'll try to answer, that I'll begin to answer in the next uh, few minutes and are addressed in our pilot project. So since the 1990s, Lisbon has become one of the fastest growing tourist destinations in Europe, especially after Euro 2004 European Cup and the introduction of low cost air travel, the drastic increase in tourism has deeply transformed the city. It is therefore relevant to understand how social, economic and environmental impacts on, of tourism are understood by the local community so of residents, retailers, and other users of the city. In this chart, you can see, um, you can see the, the, the trends uh, upwards from 2006 to uh, 2019, just before COVID. 
So, and, and you can see, you can see not only the relation to the occupation rate bedroom, but also the rather dramatically relation to the revenue per available room in Lisbon. So, a very strong economic impact. So, the boundary between tourist and non-tourist practices in cities have, however, never been, uh, have always been fluctuating. We defend that diversity of tourist practices and situations could be seen as a strategic observation point of urban life, but also of the urban environmental issues. We consider also that tourism is fundamentally political. At micro level, a neighborhood, a street, a building, we can observe and capture conflicts, mediations, agreement processes that all together shape urban life. So this paper explores citizen science methods to study the ways of dwelling, mobility and consuming that grew in the Lisbon Touristic Centre and its relation to environmental issues at micro and micro level. We have conducted research that aims to reflect on the effects of tourism in the recent transformations in Santo Antonio, a city parish in, in central Lisbon. <clears throat> so this paper and this research is was conducted under COISO, a citizen science project which involved 10 small scale pilot projects with high intensity collaboration in, each, in which every research step was jointly discussed and taken in a co-creation process to define research objectives, scope and methods. So this investigation is a citizen science pilot project which aims to create, reflect and, in, and improve methodologies of modes of participation. In our case, the pilot project resulted from the collaboration of historians from, from CRIA, a research centre network on anthropology based in Lisbon, and members of ZERO, Sustainable Earth System Association, a Portuguese environmentalist NGO, and finally, a visual anthropologist also working within the Cueso project with the mission to observe and document the collaborative processes. <clears throat> so this project began with the desire to understand forms of collaboration between social science researchers and environmental activists while studying tourism. Gradually, as the research progressed, we discovered different ways of doing we approach tourism differently, depending on scientific background, job, political commitments, and place of residence. In connection with the NGO's environmental commitments, Zero holded a critical standpoint of the so-called mass tourism, developed in recent years in Lisbon, regarding it as a resource-demanding industry, which includes travel and tours, accommodation, food and beverage, amusement, and souvenirs with a high carbon foot footprint and impact on local and planetary sustainability. However, historians like Frederic Vidal and myself approach tourism in its entanglement with a more extensive, extensive history of the urban practices, refusing what has been called in urban studies as the th impact theory. This theory considers tourism as a phenomenon that disrupts the economic, social and cultural life of urban societies, particularly from the point of view of the living conditions of the residents in terms of housing, traffic, noise pollution. In our stereographic and anthropological research, tourism is seen and studied not as something coming outside of the city, but has one more element in the making of the city, and the study of diversity of tourism practices is considered as the strategic observation point of urban life. So, to overcome different standpoints of research, we engage in a panoply of research methods. And far from being exclusive, these different ways of doing nourish the citizen science project. So, I'll explore how these approaches challenged and complemented each other, considering scales of research and scales of political intervention. 
taking Lisbon as a case study, considering different scales help to elaborate a more complex knowledge on tourism past practices and future effects and possible ways of intervention. A distinctive, distinctive factor of the environmentalist view on tourism is to think not only the local level impacts, but also its impact at national and planetary levels, namely in relation to the resources it demands, which depends on the underlying tourism model. From zero point of view, in the Lisbon case, the predominant tourism model is the mass tourism, which implies a strong pressure on the resources and life of the city, threatening to reach its limit. At the local level, the infrastructure needed to accommodate tourists and their conception, products and services, as well as the waste production, the pollution and congestion, namely local mobility, heating, sewage, more people, more waste, associated with day stay, are important issues to take care of. In contrast, still from the zero point of view, a sustainable tourism is based on a small scale, focus on local products versus the standardization needed to respond to mass tourism associated with the concept of checklist tourism. I, had, I have been there, I've done that. But with a cap with the so-called true place and the local people, sustainable tourism is also a healthy relationship between travellers and residents and the promotion, dissemination or awareness of local culture in a more personal and close way. Through participatory ethnography, like in the fieldwork as we have done in St. Antonio Parish, in small-scale techniques presented opportunities for self-expression, encourage participant engagement and thus recognise multiple experiences, interests and discourses and possibilities in urban practices, and namely the ones related with tourist practices. In our project, the interviews we conducted allowed us to highlight much more flexible uses of the terms tourists, foreigners, visitors, residents, depending on individual experiences and situations. It allowed us to map multiple entanglements between different city dwellers, long-time residents, local traders, recent foreigners, foreigner residents, small-time tourists, students, and so on. As you can see, one good example is the views of Elizabeth Lima, uh, who works at the grocery store Sabor do Lima, at the uh, street of San Jose. Uh, the views of Isabel Lima on how tourists are included in her daily life. Views that contrast with observations by, made by our colleague and environmentalist Susana Fonseca on, rest, on recent mass tourism. So the environmentalist views on tourism considers, and first and foremost, its impact on sustainability consider its local consequences, but also its planetary effects, like I was saying. And while most of zero lobbyist activity is directed to national government and European institutions, its members express their concerns, first and foremost, with the acute transformations regarding housing prices and the unique, so-called unique identity of the neighbourhood brought by visitors, coming from the outside of the, of the neighbourhood. What small-scale ethnographic research allowed was to recognise a continuous changing neighbourhood throughout time, considering its spatial entanglements in local, national, international scales. Archival historical research and ethnographic methods revealed how, to, how tourism is in Lisbon is a long-time phenomenon. Looking at touristic practices in the long term in St. Antonio local parish, we could see how tensions, conflicts and opportunities have been for long negotiated and entangled by different dwellers making the city centre. These present and past interests, sensitivities and experiences as gathered by historians were step by step discussed and confronted with zero activism. As a future-oriented activity, 
environmentalists lobbied by zero members consider the impacts of tourism, especially so-called mass tourism, on sustainability of present and future generations, but increasingly acknowledge the long history of different dwellers which helped to make the city. And thus, zero is now, we hope, better, better equipped to, to prescribe sustainable tourism for the future including a diversity of past experiences and interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting, as I'm sure we are all or have all been tourists at some point and probably live in a place where tourists do go as well. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my question is: So why would you say that sustainable tourism is important? Like why? Like because how would you say? Is there a way for like to have like a lot? Because you get a lot of economical growth, and you know it's really good for economy and stuff like that. Is it? possible to have like sustainability and econom economical growth uh, for tourism together or do you have to limit one either way do you understand the question yes uh, i think i have okay. well it's not <laughs> um i would answer from the zero point of view so uh um, because i think what you're aiming at is, if, if I understood it well, is um, what is the concept of sustainable tourism? So to combine sustainability and economy together in a way. Um, what they would say is to limit tourism. How to limit is the question, I would say. So um, uh, in the zero case in Lisbon or in Portugal, for example, uh, when they say mass tourism, what are they thinking about? They are thinking about the, uh, the flights that are coming to Lisbon and the new airport. They think about cruises and are the two main um, issues about uh, where they're lobbying. So you're saying, um, so my question was more, is there a way for mass tourism to be, like, to have a sustainable um, way of, you know, having tourism, but not to limit it. So it will still grow the economy. Is there a way to get the people or to design a system in such a way that, um, that you wouldn't have to limit economic growth from, you know, tourism? You wouldn't have to limit new tourists coming in the country and you would still have the growth of the tourism that it provides. Is there such a way or? So a, a follow-up uh, answer <laughs> um, will probably uh, be about the conception of growth. What is growth? What is economic growth for an environmentalist? For example, uh, economic growth from the point of view of sustainability will have to include future generations will have to include the impacts of planetary le level on future generations. So um, it's not growth, it's what kind of growth it is. Uh, so it can be for all and not just in the, in, in the, in the um, so it has to be a long time uh, um, growth. Uh, so I think, um, Probably the answer is that, yes, to re redefine growth in relation to sustainability and not just with the present conception of economic growth. Okay. Following, following up on that, we can see uh, tourism is being limited in really uh, sensitive natural areas like the Galapagos Islands and, and in other places already. Also in culturally uh, important places like Venice, um, tourism is being limited. So we can see it more and more. So 
the whole, uh, the more growth, the better is probably not ideal for a lot of different reasons. That's a different discussion, sorry. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. I think I do understand, say, the, the sustainability problem there and the f different feelings that may be in seeing your city invaded, say, by, by tourists that, that change their life totally. On the other hand, there are people who make their living of this. So I tend to guess that there is a kind of equilibrium that may or may not be close to where you are now, but, but there, this is a problem. What I didn't understand quite well is the side of citizen science in the, in the idea. So maybe you can elaborate just a bit to understand how this uh, in some way contributes. I guess that it comes from gathering information, but, but uh, I didn't understand well what you said in this regard. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, well, part of the answer is the fact that this is, this is a pilot project, this citizen science, uh, like the other nine projects of Quizu. And uh, we're what we're trying to do in this pilot project, but also in other ones, is to construct methodologies and new methodologies of collaboration inside citizen uh, social sciences and humanities. Because uh, somehow there, there are... Um, more invis invisible to uh, the citizen science community. So uh, what we're trying to do was to construct a small scale and high intensity uh, collaborations, which means in this case that if it, uh, each research step was jointly taken, the first, the, for example, the um, hypothesis of the uh, project was uh, jointly uh, elaborated. The methodologies were jointly defined by uh, historians and by environmentalists. The focus group, the interviews, and all the different you know, um, methodologies that, that were um, that we followed. So it's not a question of uh, disseminating new knowledge for other uh, for other purposes or just communicating the results. It is transforming the science, the, the, the science part of citizen science, but also the, the, the way this um, activism was, con was conducted. So it is uh, inside the project that the, the main, uh, um, the, the high intensity collaborations was uh, made. Thank you very much, and thank you again for your talk. This was really interesting, and uh, please help me thank Elisa. So, right, so now moving from kind of the environmental factors in cities, like air and lighting and so on, uh, to the more biodiversity uh, aspects of cities, because people living in cities, at least some people living in cities, are lucky enough to have gardens. And there are also some green spaces. I'm just looking for my next presenter. She is here. Okay, good. So I was like, where is she? Okay, you are here. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. So yes, moving into biodiversity. So hopefully you're all interested in this because now we're gonna hear something about how good gardens actually are for wildlife and analysis of the quality of wildlife friendly interventions in UK gardens. Please welcome Claire. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm Claire and I'm from a charity called Earthwatch Europe that's based in the UK. I'm going to talk to you about how good gardens are um, for wildlife. And so I'm going to first talk about why gardens are important for wildlife at all. And then I'm going to introduce you to Naturehood, which is a citizen science project that we run at Earthwatch Europe. And then we're going to look at 
one aspect of um, gardens' impact on wildlife and how good they are for bees. So why are gardens important for wildlife? Well, you're probably all aware that we're in the middle of a biodiversity crisis. Um, in the UK, since 1970, 41% of our species are in decline. And we're also seeing a huge increase in urbanisation. So at the moment in Western Europe, 80% of people live in um, urban areas, and that number is increasing. Um, at the moment in the UK, 7% of UK land is urban. And since between 2006 and 2018, that grew with 1,600 miles of new road built. Gardens make up approximately a quarter of urban land. That is 30% of urban green space. And it is the only type of growing green habitat in the United Kingdom. And if you look at this uh, map that I've got here from Birmingham, you can see the gardens there and how they can connect the different aspects of green space from the churchyard just there to the park over in the corner. And connection of this green habitat is incredibly important for wildlife, allowing them to reach different resources. We also know that gardens are great at supporting biodiversity and can support really high numbers. So there was a study, it's only one garden admittedly, but a 30-year study by a woman called Jennifer Owen, an ecologist, and she identified in that 30 years 2,673 species in her tiny urban garden. And we know that they can support this high biodiversity because of we, well, one of the hypotheses is because of the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. So in areas where you have very high disturbance, organisms move out, they don't stay around, it's, it's too disturbed, or most organisms can't sustain in that level of disturbance. But also when you completely leave an area um, to its own, um, so certain species take over and push out other organisms. So this intermediate level of disturbance, it's constantly creating new niches, it's not allowing one species to take, or a few species to take over. So that's one of the reasons that we think that um, gardens support incredibly high um, biodiversity. However, there are problems with this. There's an idea of like the tyranny of small decisions. Every gardener is managing their own land, and um, if they make sort of small mistakes and everyone makes similar small mistakes, you could actually lead to negative consequences that you're not expecting. So one example of this might be if people don't clean out their bird feeders on a regular, on a regular occasion, you get the spread of bird diseases like avian flu or bumblefoot that you see in a lot of chaffinches. There's also another barrier to people wanting to participate in these wildlife projects, and that's a skills or confidence barrier. But we know in the UK that people are incredibly um, supportive of biodiversity with, over, with um, the value of citizen scientists to conservation in the UK being approximately £20.5 million pounds per annum. Um, and there's 18,700 people participating in structured monitoring schemes. So we know there's an interest in conservation in the UK. And to tackle this skills and confidence barrier, we've seen a proliferation of wildlife gardening um, support and advice, all um, presenting ways that you can use your garden to benefit wildlife. And it's not just in the UK that we see these, we also see these in um, other countries in Europe, and the Gardenize app is actually from um, Germany. So in Earthwatch, we started our own version of this called Naturehood. And the aim of Naturehood was to encourage people and engage people in putting science-backed um, wildlife interventions into their garden, and then to monitor the benefits of those interventions for wildlife. And in the summer of 2020, we um, did a big campaign on Facebook, and we had over 1,500 responses to um, a survey asking people what they have in their garden and, looking at, and asking some questions on the quality of those actions. And we have 21 different wildlife-friendly features that we examined. 
And this is um, stock images, representation of my average participant. 80% um, of our respondents are female. 95% of our survey respondents are white with an average age of 51 years, plus or minus 15 um, standard deviation. Um, but these survey respondents represent actually way more people. So at the end of the survey, I asked, like, who are you doing naturehood with in your... And they said that actually the total number of people that are doing naturehood and participating in this game would be 3,000 adults and 2,500 children getting involved. And so what fe features do we see that gardens have that support wildlife? Well, I'm sure it's not surprising that we've got lots of pot plants, shrubs, lawns, all the things that you're used to seeing in gardens, flower borders, trees, make up the majority of gardens. Uh, for particular species, bird feeding is the most popular activity that people are doing. Um, and we actually know that there's 12.6 million households in the UK providing food for birds, um, which is an incredible number. So it's not surprising that bird feeding came out as the most popular kind of infrastructure put in for wildlife. Um, if you go down, you can see, though, that there's a, a lot of people are introducing bird, uh, bee hotels into their garden. Um, they've got almost 50% of people with bee hotels. Hedgehog houses are also quite popular, with 30% of people having hedgehog houses in their gardens. Um, and what's really nice to see is the effectiveness of campaigns against things like fungicides, insecticides, beluscicides, and herbicides, with those almost not existing at all, in, being used at all in urban gardens. And so how good are these actions for bees? Well, what I did is um, the, I asked a series of questions that um, the literature tells me that certain answers would have been would promote wildlife um, success and health, and um, that the opposite action, the opposite way of managing those features wouldn't wouldn't work. So, if I take, for example, uh, the bee hotel up here, I asked about the materials that were used to build the bee hotel, that were the tubes that are used. I asked about the size of those tubes, the duration that they've had the um, bee hotel in their garden for, and their direction of the, the B Hotel faces in. And then I ranked the questions, I ranked those answers to the questions, and I've used that to create these heat maps. So one is the highest rank, one is the best that you can do for wildlife, and um, then those questions, uh, as you go down the rankings, it gets worse for the wildlife. And so what you can see from this is that for bees, um, Things like the bee hotels are being done actually pretty well. The major problem here is that people don't um, know much about sort of the size of the holes that they should be, the size of the tubes that they should be using for bees. And this really affects the survival of larva. So bees don't use holes that are more than about 10 millimeters to, and they need to be 10 centimeters long. So here it's really the length that people either don't know about or, the, um, or that they're too short. We, but otherwise, they're doing pretty well. We're seeing that lawns are really poorly managed for pollinators. People in the UK really like their short-cut grass lawns with very few flowers um, in them. But when people are trying to manage for meadows, they're doing a really good job, not mowing too frequently. They're starting to have meadows for a really long time. And they're really creating and having a nice diversity of flora in their meadows. And so, with, and so this gives us an idea of where we could start shaping the, um, how we could start changing some of this wildlife advice and adding to this wildlife advice to really impact what biodiversity um, put more positively and really shape those. So what are our next steps? Well, we, want to, we need to expand um, the analysis that we're doing, and we want to look at it not just for bees, but for hedgehogs, for birds, and really nail down, drill more into um, the quality of those actions. We want to look, and then for building out what changes in information to gardeners would lead to the biggest benefits for wildlife. 
We want to look at our people, generalists or specialists in their wildlife gardening. Do they really only focus on hedgehogs or birds? Or actually, are they really providing resources for everyone, for all of the organisms in their garden? And if they are, does, um, does whether or not a gardener is a generalist or a specialist affect the quality of the resources that they provide to wildlife? So if you're a specialist, you know that much more that your, all of your actions are top-notch for wildlife and a generalist less so. And how does that so how does that affect it? Um, and I'd like to say thanks to all of my colleagues at Earthwatch, um, particularly uh, Tristan Pett, hey, Daniel Hayhow, and Victor Bumer for th their help in shaping the surveys, um, and our funders, the National Lottery Heritage Fund and NERC. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. How much in how many people in here have gardens? Yeah, how many people in here are doing some of these bird hotels and something good for biodiversity? Okay, the rest of you come have a chat to Claire and work <laughs> out what you need to be doing, okay? Check out the Naturehood uh, website. So, any questions for Claire? That through. Hey, um, that was Ace Claire. It was really interesting to see, like, it from a scientific level, like that. Because we often work with kind of those lists that you had there, and it's quite great to see, like, there actually being analysis to do with that stuff. Um, when it came to the audience, how did you actually pick which gardens? Was it like a general social media campaign, or was it how did you um, get the audience that took part? So it was a social media campaign uh, run on Facebook, and. Um, I believe our comms team focused on people who had some sort of interest in, like they targeted it towards people, yeah, who had some sort of green interest. And the pictures were really cute organisms. So people who really liked cute organisms clicked on them and then followed through. And then a subset of those completed the surveys. We actually had 30,000 people like the campaign originally, yeah. And then a subset of those made accounts and a subset of those filled in the surveys. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Just one, one question, uh, maybe you mentioned it, but what kind of return do you give to the people that participate? I mean, how do they have the, 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 the return of your studies and how do they react to it? Uh, so we um, put results out back onto social media and through Facebook. We used to run, we ran um, quizzes and things like that. We have also given out prizes. We run a photography competition. There's a lot of engagement um, around Nature Head. More questions? I saw more hands. Yes. Yeah, I know there might be. Uh, so very, very, thank you very much for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I, I know there, there's a privacy issue in that, but do you know uh, about how many of those uh, gardeners have gardens that are right in the neighborhood, so really this connecting band of ecosystems, or you don't have any information? Because I know that privacy is an issue here. But yeah, so I have location information to postcode level, which in the UK is a maximum of about 100 houses in one postcode. So I have, yeah, I have quite um, close um, postcode inf uh, location information. I just haven't analyzed it yet, but that is one of the steps. And that will also help us look at other aspects of our population about sort of um, where they fall on the index of multiple deprivation and things like that, which I still haven't yet explored, but will do. Hi, yes, um, Jess Wardlaw here from the Natural History Museum. Amazing data. I mean, I could just ask so many questions about it. But I'm wondering if you have an impression of how experienced your gardeners might be because I noticed I mean it's just intriguing when you carried it out it's obviously during lockdown so people were very they were at home quite focused on maybe their outdoor space mm -hmm. um, more than more so than other times yeah so I didn't ask about experience of wildlife friendly gardening in the surveys but we have asked questions on what activities you normally perform in your garden with wildlife watching being one of those activities so there'll be some information in there again still to be analyzed it's a huge data set like so yeah 
got to pull it out. But I, I think bearing in mind who it targeted and that people had an interest in wildlife, probably we're more on that green side and more on that experience side than, than the average population. Sorry, can I ask a follow-up question on that? Do you have any plans to like, look at people who aren't so interested in gardening? So uh, we've just got funded to, do, to um, put it more into a community, into a sort of focus on local communities that are underserved um, in the Oxford area uh, by sort of the yeah, more deprived communities. And so there, because we're focusing in communities, um, we'll have more people, we'll be able to reach more people who haven't necessarily had as much experience. So it's a much smaller study, yeah. but it would give us that opportunity. Great. All right, final question for me, I think, because you mentioned uh, you were looking at specialized and generalized species, possibly. What about native species and invasive species? Is that something you're considering? So it wasn't about the species, generalist versus specialized species. It's about whether the gardeners were generalists around all species or specialists on one species, like a hedgehog. Like, people are obsessed with hedgehogs in the UK. <laughs> Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. So you, some, there's definitely um, some of our participants will have been just so focused on hedgehogs that that will be like what they plan all of their garden activities around. Whereas others, or, and we have the same with birders in the UK, whereas there's other people who will be like, oh, I like a bit of birds, I like a bit of bees, I like a bit of hedgehogs, and we'll do it all. So that's, the quest that's what question I was focusing on there. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. So from uh, a bit of general biodiversity and the more the better, we come to a more specific focus uh, on weeds, probably something that most gardeners really don't like, but they can still be very interesting. So please welcome our next speaker, Ninke Bits, who will talk about what's that weed on the street. Yes. Thank you for that introduction. So I'm Nienke Bates uh, and I work at the Botanical Garden in Leiden and the Science Communication and Society Group of Leiden University. And I run a citizen science project called uh, Stoepplantjes, which translates to uh, pavement plants. But what's that weed on the street makes a nice title. And uh, well, kind of connecting with the last talk, I want to uh, yeah, activate you with some engagement. Uh, on the, your left, yes, you see a dove's foot geranium, and on your right you see a red squirrel. I used to have a hedgehog here, but my colleagues convinced me that a red squirrel would be better. And now I want to ask you, uh, which one of these would you like to encounter uh, in your uh, environment more? Please raise your hands for the dove's foot geranium. That's... Uh, ah. As a fair bit of people. And please raise your hands who would prefer the red squirrel. So that's a, a bit more for the red squirrel. Usually when I give this talk for a public audience, the majority is also for the red squirrel. And for me, this really um, gives you a picture of a concept that's important to me called plant blindness. So uh, that's the uh, concept that we have uh, not enough attention, knowledge and uh, appreciation of the plants in our environment. And my project really focuses on appreciation of plants. So with the Pavement Plant Project, we started last October in uh, collaboration with uh, uh, an event called Weekend of Science, which has a national scale, so it projected my project um, across the Netherlands and uh, we've already got 5, 000, more than 5,000 observations of pavement plants, so plants growing on the street, uh, of more than 510 species. And just to give you a picture, uh, in the Dutch towns and cities there grow about uh, 1,300 uh, different species of plants, and that's about 66% of all plant biodiversity in the Netherlands. So our cities are really very diverse, and I think with this project, 
uh, we're looking at that in a nice way. We have 425 uh, registered participants, but you could also join anonymously. So I think there are a lot more people that joined because we have over three and a half thousand followers on our social media. And uh, yeah, to get people activated all through the Netherlands, I also did lots of workshops and uh, um, events all through uh, the city. For my PhD project, uh, I have three main focuses, which are citizen science, plant blindness and pavement plants. And the research I'm presenting today mainly uh, links to my question, how can an accessible citizen science project on plants result in real research outcomes? So, oh, my animation is not right, but that's okay. Uh, on the left, you see the logo of Floron, which is the organization in the Netherlands who inventories all wild plants in one kilometer square uh, areas, and they use expert volunteers. I wouldn't uh, say your, na your, your random neighbor has an, the amount of plant knowledge that these volunteers have. And uh, my project uh, aims to be very accessible, so even with just knowledge of about two plant species, you can join. And with my research, I want to build stepping stones between these beginner uh, volunteers and these expert volunteers at Florum. So in my research for today, I focus on the motivation and attitude versus these experts and beginners within the Stooplandjes project. So I did a survey uh, of motivation, 17 statements on a five-point Likert scale, attitude. I researched with eight statements on a zero to 100 sliding scale using Qualtrics, and my target group was uh, 16 plus years uh, old. I had a total group of respondents of 245. Uh, but not all of them really input data for the project. So today I'm only going to talk about the people who really input data, so the citizen scientists. Uh, as uh, with the other project uh, before me, most of the people who um, participated are above 45 years old, but I'm very happy that we also reached a younger audience. And the same goes for their highest finished education. So tertiary education is people who finished a third degree, uh, like a university degree. And secondary education is only uh, finishing high school. So I think we also reached a different audience than we usually reach from uh, a very academic city, uh, Leiden. And of course, all over the Netherlands, as you can also see on the map. So with the group of 190 citizen scientists, we, have, uh, we asked them the question, have you ever performed nature volunteer work? And that is our uh, dividing question for beginners and experts. If they hadn't done volunteer work, then they were a beginner. And if they did, then we categorize them as experts. So onto the results on motivation. For the top five, we found uh, they, are, they joined the pavement plant project because they were interested in urban nature. They wanted to contribute to knowledge about wild urban plants. They feel a strong connection to nature and they want to protect the environment and they want to help wildlife as the top five. And if we look at those a little bit closer, we can see there are two intrinsic motivations, but also uh, the top one is focused on urban nature. Two uh, motivations focused on research and contributing knowledge. And all the three nature-related motivations are also found in the top five. So I think this leads to uh, main motivation is nature, or uh, if I'm speculating here, even activistic uh, motivation. Uh, if we look at beginner versus expert, we can see that beginners have a top motivation of wanting to learn something, uh, which wasn't uh, significant, and the differences are very small. The significant result is that uh, the experts are more motivated by their interest in urban nature and more motivated by their really strong connection to nature. 
Then for attitude, we can see all the participants are very positive about pavement plants. Pavement plants are natural, important for nature, strong, valuable, interesting, useful, beautiful and unique, all scored above 70. But the top two is natural and important for nature. So again, this nature um, aspect comes through very the strongest. Um, I don't know what this blue square is. Um, and if you look past the blue square, <laughs> you can see in the beginner versus exp ex expert um, figure that all the scores are really close together. So the differences really are minimal and there were no significant uh, differences between the two groups. So for my conclusions, <laughs> I got the yellow card. Um, I think we reached a pretty diverse group of participants. Of course, there always can be better and uh, I will try my best. Um, I think the motivation is mostly focused on nature and I also get uh, emails about uh, people that see um, municipal workers weeding on the street and they want to do something about it. So. Uh, and my colleague works, for instance, on a plastic project, which is also activistic in nature. Uh, so I'm fascinated by that aspect. Beginners are really focused on, or their first motivation is learning. So I think I can mold the project uh, towards that to um, facilita facilitate that. And for as experts, they really have an interest in urban nature and their strong connection to nature. So I think for the future, it would be good to foster these uh, things in beginners uh, so they can become the experts. And for experts to really um, be able to show their interest and show their connection to the whole group of participants to also inspire them to become experts. Overall, the attitude is very positive, so that just makes me very happy. Uh, com comparable project uh, measuring attitude about bees still showed that bees are pretty scary and dangerous, uh, according to the participants. So it's nice that pavement plants are not scary or dangerous <laughs> or seen as negative. Uh, so I really would like to hear more about other citizen science projects about plants. And for my future, yes, future research, I'd like to do a qualitative study with focus groups more in specific places in the Netherlands where there's a lot of interest, do co-creation uh, sessions with public, municipality and researchers. So really this public uh, pavement plant research can inform policy in the future. And then uh, I'm also interested to see what the effect of citizen science can be on plant blindness with a pre and post survey. And uh, tomorrow there's an interactive session about citizen science in botanical gardens. So I uh, want to invite everybody to join us there. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Do we have any questions? Yes. Hi. Um, can I ask where... Sorry, I'm here. Uh, I'm just wondering where, where the, the observations were being recorded. Like, how did the participants have a sense that what they were doing was actually for a purpose? Yes, yeah, so with the organization I mentioned before, Florum, uh, we built a website where the uh, citizens input data, so uh, if they want their name and their email, but uh, their location and the plant species they find, they have to put in. And they can see a map uh, which shows immediately the data they put in, and they can click their data and see the list they uh, input in the database. But I would really may like to make the whole database open so they can also play around with the data and uh, everyone else's data. Yeah, that's what I was sort of wondering, who was actually using the data once they'd inputted it? Yeah, for now it's uh, just me and maybe uh, one or two researchers I'm sharing it with. Um, but I would really like to maybe host also workshops to be able to uh, yeah, really talk to the people using the citizens, using the data, and see what their questions are.
Thanks a lot for the nice presentation. It was very uh, interesting to see uh, how much interest is in the plants. Uh, uh, my question is about the motivations and the design of the project. So to what extent do you think the motivations that you have identified this list uh, is actually mm, linked to the, to the design of the project? So you have a website, you have a speci uh, specific activities as compared to uh, the topic itself, so observing plants on the street. So if you had a different project design, uh, do you think you would have identified different motivations? Uh, certainly. Um, my project is not gamified in any way, so the, the last motivation on the list uh, in the lowest scored is uh, I like to compete, uh, which is, I think, yeah, correlates with the setup of the project. Um, the motivation survey I did is based on uh, a paper that is about uh, measuring motivation for citizen science in general. And some of the questions are more modified to the subject, but that's also instructed in the paper. So um, yes, uh, I think we, we can make these lists even better. <laughs> Let's keep it at that. Thank you very much for a really nice talk. Um, now, in the UK at least, um, writing with chalk on pavements technically is illegal. Um, in the grand scheme of things, I think there are worse crimes. Um, but I just wondered what you thought, if you had any reflections on the ethics of that, um, and also whether there was any positive aspect of plant, blindly, plant blindness um, and whether there were any risks of people coming along going, oh, if we get rid of these pesky plants in the pavement, then we'll also stop people drawing and writing all over the pavements as well. Um, I think your, your last question, the negative aspects, uh, I haven't heard anybody complain about the botanical chalking we also do as an activity for this project. Um, I do get questions like, uh, how do I get this weed out of my garden? And then uh, I try to answer as nicely as possible. Um, yes, I really don't remember why, but chalking is illegal in England. But uh, in the Netherlands, it's seen as very charming. Uh, if people pass botanical chalking on the street, I see them being interested and, and smiling. So for our country, it's not uh, the same. I think it's seen as charming in the UK as well, but it's just that I've seen it promoted and people have pointed out, technically, that's illegal. Maybe they should change the law. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. And that kind of concludes our session here. So we started out hearing about air quality, which of course affects everyone, not just humans, but everything else we've heard about in this session as well, plants included, uh, whether weeds or not. Then going into light, of course, that affects everything as well, including biodiversity. So thinking about light and whether it's really needed is very good. Other aspects, um, tourists, we all affect whatever happens wherever we go. So maybe have a think about it. And then going into gardens, we heard about biodiversity uh, in gardens and how that can be enhanced with whatever we do. And finally now the weeds, that some people don't like might actually be a really huge part of the biodiversity in an area in a city. So cities are really important in so many ways and so many aspects. So let's keep that in mind. And if we do go traveling and are tourists, you know, you can still participate in citizen science projects where you go. So being a little bit of a maybe positive influence on this. And uh, that will uh, conclude our sessions. I would like to thank Sophie very much for your strict timekeeping. And of course, everyone who was here and all your great questions, and especially, of course, our speakers. Please help me. Thank you.
So now there is uh, basically a five minute break and I can see Silke is already here, uh, ready to take over for the closing 10 minute uh, chat. But that starts 10 to, so you do have two minutes. Would you like to say anything else? No, okay. Please, please stay, sit. <laughs> Thank you. So, I just wanted to share some closing words with all of you. So thanks again to our brilliant chairs and all the session helpers uh, that supported the moderation and also the timekeeping at the sessions. Uh, so well done and thanks so much for your time and um, personal investment. Um, I just wanted to say some few reminders to you. I wrote an email about this, but uh, you know, twice is better sometimes. Um, so we were reminded by the Langbeck Virchow House that there's no food allowed here in the Audi Max and no food allowed anywhere else uh, on the premise, just in the designated catering areas. So please keep that in mind so that we don't get the feedback from the Langbeck Virchow House. And they are really strict about this because apparently this is like some historical lecture hall that they are really you know, they really care about this room. Um, second one, um, we would like to kindly remind you to bring all your presentations until 9.15 tomorrow morning to the registration desk. 
all presentations that are not at the presentation desk, uh, registration desk until 9.15, please take them with you to your rooms and contact the room support to get your presentation onto the computer. Then, tomorrow, we are also going to have our poster sessions. If you're not sure in which poster session your poster is to be found, first of all, and secondly, in which poster session your poster pitch could take place, if you would like to do a poster pitch, please come to the registration and ask us. But I'm also trying to explain it. It's rather easy, actually. We sent around lists. There, is, there are A sessions and B sessions. All A sessions are in the morning, all B sessions are in the afternoon. So every poster has an, with an A, please put it up until, wait, I don't have the times, until nine tomorrow morning um, in um, the designated poster room. And then after your A, you have either an one or a two, and depending whether it's a one or a two, you're either in session A1 or session A2. And it's exactly the same for the B sessions. So your posters get to hang either all morning or all afternoon, and you get to do a poster pitch in either a A1 or A2, respective a B1 and B2 session. Okay. <laughs> there is an email again. Read it, uh, take your time, and I hope you get it. And if you have any questions, come to the registration. Um, tonight, there is our pub quiz that was kindly organized by Daniel Dörler and Julia Lorenz, who put a lot of time into tackling out the questions. Uh, so we really hope that people are going to come. There are still places left on the list. Um, you might just show up. We are going to meet at 7 at the Tipperay. It's a Berlin Irish pub. You can Google it. Um, so we are hoping to see many of you there at 7. And I think that was all that, oh no, wait, one last point. Um, there are many, many, many people on um, the waiting list for the excursions. So whoever knows that he or she does not want to take part in one of the excursions that he or she signed up for, please cross out your name so that other people can fill in your place. That would be really kind. And with this, I really hope you had a wonderful, wonderful and really exciting day today here in Berlin at the langbeck Virchow House and hope uh, the same will hold true tomorrow. And we will see you here at 8.45 for our welcoming words. We will have some a bit more exciting announcement, not only logistics, but really cool announcements. So please be there on time to hear about those. And uh, then we are going to have a really super interesting talk by Peter Elias, uh, who will give us... Um, some insights onto citizen science in the global south and i hope to see many of you there and um, now have a lovely evening thank you